This is Audible. Hachette Audio presents Surprise, Kill, Vanish The Secret History of CIA Paramilitary Armies, Operators, and Assassins Written by Annie Jacobson Read by the author For Kevin I am tired and sick of war. Its glory is all moonshine. It is only those who have never fired a shot nor heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded who cry aloud for blood, for vengeance, for desolation. War is hell. General William Tecumseh Sherman, attributed 1863. Author's Note on Sources this is a non-fiction book about complex individuals working in treacherous environments populated with killers, connivers, and saboteurs. In reporting this book, I sat for hundreds of hours with sources who recounted to me situations of sheer pandemonium and chaos entwined with the human will to survive and the intellectual challenge of not giving up hope. Some interviews took place in sources' homes, others in the anonymity of roadside diners. One interview took place on horseback up in the mountains, an off-the-grid location where that particular source felt comfortable speaking. Halfway into our outing, as we were riding along in the otherwise quiet forest, we heard screaming, unmistakably a woman's voice. A figure on horseback rounded the bend, the terrified rider hanging on for dear life as her horse galloped out of control, reins dangerously askew. My source, a Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, paramilitary operator, leapt off his horse, positioned himself in the wide path, and deftly grabbed the reins of the thousand-pound animal as it charged by. I knew he had a background with horses, but it was extraordinary to witness how quickly and intuitively he brought a dramatic and potentially dangerous situation under control. There you go, ma'am, my source said to the breathless rider, handing the reins back to her. He asked if she needed further assistance, which she declined. In the chaos of the action, his shirt came untucked, and I noticed he carried a Sig Sauer P320 semi-automatic pistol at his back, near his buttocks. He checked it for safety and climbed back on his horse, and we rode on. Reporting a book about the shadow world of CIA covert action operations requires determining first who can be trusted and then how to fact-check their stories. Covert action is, by its very nature, designed and orchestrated to remain hidden from public scrutiny. The majority of the covert action operations around the world that I describe were orchestrated to be plausibly denied. And yet, 42 men and women with first-hand knowledge of these events allowed me to interview them for this book. Dozens of other individuals who played ancillary roles in the action were also interviewed. Every primary source came to me by referral, which is how I've reported and written four previous nonfiction books. To verify facts, I reviewed sources' military service records, exceptional performance awards, medals, passports, real and pseudonymous, identification cards, journals, diaries, and more. How to fact-check sources' stories. The CIA and its intelligence community partners guard their secrets through a complex array of code words, cover stories, and operational names. Through Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, requests, and pre-existing declassification efforts, I accessed thousands of pages of documents from the CIA, the Departments of Defense and State, and other government entities, housed in the National Archives and elsewhere, cited in the notes and bibliography. And this book would not exist without the work of other journalists, scholars, and historians, whose books, 
monographs, papers, and news articles I have duly cited. Those interviewed for this book served 13 presidents, seven Democrats, six Republicans, from Franklin Roosevelt to Barack Obama. They include two surviving members of the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, eight individuals who served the CIA at the Senior Intelligence Service, SIS, level, equivalent to an ambassador at the State Department or a general at the Defense Department, 11 chiefs of station from countries on five continents, numerous chiefs of base who served in some of the world's most dangerous outposts, including in Sudan, Yemen, Iraq, and Afghanistan, 19 operators from the Special Activities Division Ground Branch, an attorney at the CIA who wrote scores of classified presidential findings, starting with those on the Iran hostage crisis, and was uniquely helpful in clarifying executive office-level decision-making. Every operation reported in this book, however shocking, was legal. Other sources shared information with me on background to assist in my understanding of the subject matter, but without direct attribution to them. Prologue Some might say this is a book about assassination, but really it is a book about covert action, tertia optio, the president's third option, when the first option, diplomacy, is inadequate and the second, war, is a terrible idea. All covert action is classified, designed to be plausibly denied, and because of this, it is sometimes called the president's hidden hand. The most extreme of all hidden hand operations involves killing a leader or prominent person, and this book focuses on that act. The president's third option was born in the wake of World War II, and those who created it did so to avert World War III. With its ethos in unconventional warfare, the Central Intelligence Agency officers and operators who conduct covert action were originally called the president's guerrilla warfare corps. The same legal construct that allowed national security advisors for Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy to plot to kill foreign leaders like Fidel Castro also allowed Presidents Bush and Obama to create a system in which prominent people can be placed on a kill or capture list to be targeted and killed. This authority remains in effect today. Targeted killing is not limited to high-technology drone strikes. The President's guerrilla warfare corps kills enemies mano a mano in close-quarters combat when necessary. The group that has the authority to conduct these lethal operations outside a war zone on the ground is the CIA's Special Activities Division. One of its most lethal components is called Ground Branch. The origins of the Special Activities Division, including its Ground Branch, lie in the CIA's precursor agency, the Office of Strategic Services, and specifically its Special Operations, SO, branch, a guerrilla warfare corps whose goal was to kill Nazis to sabotage and subvert the Third Reich. The motto of one unit, the OSS Jedbergs, was Surprise, Kill, Vanish. The OSS was modeled after a wartime British organization, also classified, called Special Operations Executive, SOE. The idea that most people find hand-to-hand -hand killing repugnant but mechanized killing somehow more palatable is central to this book. From the early days of the OSS Special Operations Branch to the present-day activities of the CIA's ground branch, the most ruthless and risky lethal operations have evolved and transformed. 
Over the decades, killing a leader or prominent person under the rubric of covert action has been called many things by those who plan and oversee operations, but never assassination, because assassination is illegal. Killing a leader or prominent person at the behest of the president is legal under Title 50 of the U.S. Code. President Dwight Eisenhower's advisors discussed eliminating foreign leaders, and they set up a health alteration committee to neutralize or disable certain people. They spoke in riddles to uphold the construct of plausible deniability, Congress later found. President John F. Kennedy's advisors formalized killing and called it executive action. To President Ronald Reagan, the construct became preemptive neutralization, eliminating terrorists before they had a chance to strike again. Under President George W. Bush, the term lethal direct action was used. Under President Barack Obama, Killing terrorists became known publicly as targeted killing. The question arises, how does killing any one person advance U.S. foreign policy objectives? This book aims to shine some light on how and why certain leaders and prominent people are targeted and killed. In the early days of covert action, there was no oversight. In the mid-1970s, after the Church Committee hearings produced a report called Alleged Assassination Plots Involving Foreign Leaders, oversight was given to Congress, where it remains today. Covert action orders are formalized by CIA lawyers in a Presidential Finding, or Memorandum of Notification, M-O-N, to be signed by the President. John A. Rizzo, former chief legal officer for the CIA, who served seven presidents and wrote scores of these covert action findings, including the memorandum of notification that authorized lethal direct action against terrorists as of September 17, 2001, which remains in effect today, goes on record in this book. William D. Waugh, one of the oldest, longest-serving covert action operators in the United States and a highly decorated U.S. Army Green Beret, makes up the core of this book. His is an extraordinary life spent dedicated to perfecting the art of covert action. Covert action is assigned to the CIA in peacetime, but run jointly by the Defense Department during war. Because foreign governments, non-state actors, and lone wolf assassins regularly try to kill America's commander-in-chief, it is important to also understand how deterrence against assassination is the other side of the covert action coin. This part of the narrative is told through the lens of Louis C. Merletti, the 19th director of the U.S. Secret Service and a former member of the counter-assault team, CAT, the paramilitary force of the U.S. Secret Service. Like Waugh, Merletti's unconventional warfare expertise comes from his combat experiences in Vietnam as a Green Beret. I first started thinking about assassination in 2009, when I was working as a reporter for the Los Angeles Times magazine. A source visited my home on the way back from the Middle East. He worked in counterterrorism. That was the extent of what he could say about his employment situation. I knew him to be an expert weapons handler. He almost always traveled with gun cases. And yet the commemorative medallion he showed me from his most recent travels read... American Embassy, Kabul, Afghanistan. Nothing in his area of expertise was related to diplomacy as far as I knew, but we both understood it was best to leave it at that. 
My two sons were young at the time, and dozens of G.I. Joes, from the Revolutionary War era to the 21st century, filled our California house and yard. At the boy's request, the source painstakingly identified G.I. Joe's unique weapons, Confederate rifles with bayonets, M1 Garands, AK-47s, M16 rifles. Later, the source asked if it was okay to show my boys two real firearms for educational purposes. He was a licensed weapons safety instructor and had twice taken me shooting. I said yes. Watching carefully as he showed my children a sidearm and a compacted sniper rifle, I noticed that there was one case he never opened. Later that evening, I asked him privately what was inside. He opened it, revealing a large, serrated knife. What's that for, I asked, almost immediately realizing my mistake. Sometimes a job requires quiet, he said. He closed the case. Neither of us said another word. That was the moment I realized the obvious. The United States kills its enemies, not only in high-technology drone strikes, but at close range. I later learned from another source that my house guests worked for the CIA's Special Activities Division, Ground Branch. This encounter stayed with me, as did the idea of close-quarters killing and my reaction to it. I could imagine my house guest killing an al-Qaeda fighter using a sniper rifle, but the idea of him cutting someone's throat or thrusting it in a man's ribs gave me pause. Why? And why is all covert action secret, classified, designed for the president to deny and the public to never know? My source never spoke of his work in the Middle East, not before he showed me the knife and not after. It was understood that his work was classified. Hidden programs are notorious places to cover up failure, to conceal egregious mistakes. I wondered if dispatching paramilitary operators around the world to conduct lethal, covert action operations was all too often a recipe for disaster, or, instead, mostly a weaponized strength. Is killing a person decreed by the president to be a threat to U.S. national security right or wrong, moral or immoral, honorable or dishonorable? I found answers in writing this book. I hope readers find theirs. Part 1, 1941 Chapter 1 An Office for Ungentlemanly Warfare It was the first Sunday in December 1941, and the boy selling popcorn behind the concession stand at the Strand Theater in Bastrop, Texas, had just turned 12. His name was William Dawson Waugh, but everyone called him Billy. Shortly after 2 p.m., Sheriff Ed Cartwright walked into the theater with a terrible look on his face. He told Billy Waugh to run upstairs, have the projectionist shut off the film, and turn on the lights. Taking the stairs two at a time, Waugh did as instructed. From high above in the projectionist booth, he watched as the room full of moviegoers squinted and complained about the movie being interrupted. Then Sheriff Cartwright walked onto the stage and everyone fell silent. Listen up, the sheriff said. The Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. The U.S. Pacific Fleet was destroyed and thousands of Americans were dead. What would happen next was anyone's guess, the sheriff said, but it would be foolhardy to rule out the possibility of another attack. Sheriff Cartwright told everyone to go home and cover their windows with blackout material, listen to the radio, and stay informed. Billy Waugh stayed behind, watching the moviegoers file out. After he finished cleaning up, he went home to the house where he lived with his mother, Lillian, a part-time schoolteacher, and his older sister, Nancy. 
The next day, Congress declared war on Japan. Three days after that, Adolf Hitler declared war on the United States, and Congress then declared war on Germany and Italy. With America at war around the world, Billy Waugh made a vow to himself: "One day I'll go to war too." The day Pearl Harbor bombed the United States in a surprise attack remained imprinted on his mind. By that time, 1941, Billy Waugh knew more about war than most 12-year-old boys. He'd been absorbing information from the newsreels that played before Strand Theater films. Hitler's campaign, Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War, astounded him. The idea of total war, of all-out victory at any human cost, was mind-boggling and frightening. It is not right that matters, but victory. Hitler told his generals, "Act brutally, be harsh and remorseless. The success of the best is by means of force." Of all the tactics and techniques being used by the Nazis in the invasion of Western Europe, it was the boldness of the paratrooper unit, Fallschirmjäger, that left Billy Waugh thunderstruck. Newsreel films showed Nazi commandos leaping out of airplanes and parachuting into the war theater to launch deadly surprise attacks. Then there was the paraglider attack at the Belgian fortress Aben Amiel, once considered the most impenetrable fortress in the world. Seventy-eight Nazi paratroopers, piloting gliders and armed with flamethrowers, landed on the rooftop of the fortress and overtook 650 Belgian defenders. A victory from which the Belgian army never recovered. One month after the Nazis captured Aben Amiel, the U.S. Army created its own paratrooper division in Fort Benning, Georgia, the first in American history. Every spare moment Billy Waugh had in between school and the three part-time jobs he worked as a paperboy, stockboy, and popcorn popper, he gathered information about these U.S. paratroopers. The most important items for a successful parachute jump, he learned, were the boots. They were tall to mid-shin, with rawhide laces and stitching across the toe. Billy Waugh became focused on owning a pair of his own. His alcoholic father had died of cirrhosis of the liver when Billy was ten. The money he earned from his after-school jobs went to his mother to help pay for the family's living expenses. Now, with a clear goal in mind, he began skimming nickels and dimes off his earnings. When he finally saved up seven dollars, he hitchhiked. Thirty miles to Austin, and bought himself a pair of paratrooper boots. Elated, he felt a step closer to one day becoming a U.S. paratrooper. The world was all right. Across the Atlantic, war raged in Europe. It was May twenty seventh, nineteen forty two, and in the Czech town of Holshevitsa. The Nazi general riding in an armor-plated Mercedes Benz had been targeted for assassination. SS Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich was a Janus-like creature, blonde, blue-eyed, and beautiful. His skin smooth and pale like that of a porcelain doll, but he was also a monster, cruel and sadistic beyond measure. His own boss, Adolf Hitler. Described Heydrich as a man with an iron heart. A secret unit inside British intelligence sought to kill him. The assassination plot was called Operation Anthropoid. Concealed on a hillside not far from where Heydrich was driving his Mercedes, two British-trained assassins lay in wait. Jan Kubisch and Josef Gobchek. Both Czech nationals in their mid twenties were members of a classified British commando unit that existed inside the British Secret Intelligence Services, Section Six, MI Six. 
only an elite few were aware that these commando units were part of an underground paramilitary army working under the bland-sounding cover name Special Operations Executive. Kubish and Gobchek had been assigned to SOE's Division D for destruction, and their work was based on unconventional warfare tactics, also called guerrilla warfare. The existence of SOE was a source of great controversy within the British military establishment. Most British generals believed war was first and foremost about chivalry and honor, that it must be fought in adherence to the laws of war. While no single document can be identified as the ancient source from which the laws of war have evolved, modern-day codes of conduct stem from the Lieber Code, a set of 157 rules written by lawyer and university professor Francis Lieber during the American Civil War. Issued on April 24, 1863, by President Abraham Lincoln as General Order No. 100. These rules were to serve as a uniform code of conduct governing the behavior of the Union Army, the Confederate Army, and the armies of Europe. They were later expanded upon in Hague Convention Resolutions of 1899 and 1907. Rule 148 of the Lieber Code explicitly prohibited assassination. Civilized nations look with horror upon offers of rewards for the assassination of enemies as relapses into barbarism, Lieber wrote. Guerrilla fighters were labeled insidious enemies and therefore not entitled to the protections of the laws of war. War, like sport, was to be a gentleman's game. Guerrilla warfare was most ungentlemanly, based as it was on treacherous principles like sabotage and subversion. Sabotage during World War II meant blowing up trains, bridges, and production plants behind enemy lines, situations in which civilians would likely be killed. Subversion, or undermining the authority of an occupying force, required a host of dirty tricks and deceptive acts, including assassination. But Prime Minister Winston Churchill believed that SOE Division D was necessary, and he personally approved of every mission it undertook. Because guerrilla warfare in general, and SOE operations in particular, were considered ungentlemanly, the SOE became known as Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Commandos like Kubish and Gobchak were trained to infiltrate enemy-occupied territory, perform hit-and-run operations, and then disappear. The short-term goal of their efforts was to create paranoia among Nazi officials and embolden underground resistance movements. The long-term goal of the SOE was to prepare the battlefield for an upcoming Allied invasion. In Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich was in charge. He was also one of the most influential and powerful generals in the vast Nazi war machine. Heydrich reported directly to Heinrich Himmler the ambitious, sadistic Reichsführer whose evil knew no bounds. Heydrich created and supervised the Einsatzgruppen, extermination squads, whose 3,000 members shot and killed more than one million men, women, and children during the war. He served as one of the main architects of the Final Solution, and personally initiated the deportation and mass murder of European Jews. In 1942, he was at the top of SOE's kill list. At SOE, the Heydrich assassination operation was handled jointly by two men, Major General Sir Colin McVean Gubbins, a decorated World War I hero and SOE's director of operations, and Frantisek Morovec, 
the former chief of Czech military intelligence, then living in England in exile. As with most SOE commandos, Jan Kubisch and Josef Gobchak had been handpicked for bravery, cunning, and a willingness to ruthlessly kill. The whole art of guerrilla warfare lies in striking the enemy where he least expects it, and yet where he is most vulnerable, Gubbins instructed his men. Inflict the maximum amount of damage in a short time and get away. The SOE considered assassination a necessary dark art, a way to weaken the Nazis' impenetrable hold on power. A successful operation required months of planning by Govins and Moravchek, followed by months of intense training and rehearsing by Kubish and Gobchek. Much of the work took place in a classified SOE facility in Scotland, codenamed Training Center STS-25. Here, the assassins trained in guerrilla warfare tactics, including hand-to-hand -hand combat, sharpshooting, cover and concealment, and the manufacture of homemade bombs. They learned map reading and code deciphering, how to slit the throat of a sentry or guard without making a sound. Finally given the green light, Kubish and Gobshek were flown in under cover of darkness by a British pilot and a crew of five. They jumped out of the aircraft over a village just east of Prague and parachuted in behind enemy lines. Safely on the ground, the two commandos met up with resistance fighters who hid them from discovery until they were ready to strike. On May 27, 1942, the moment arrived. There, in Nazi-occupied Holshevitsa, Kubish and Gobshek lay camouflaged in the grass. They'd arrived to the target area on bicycles, now stashed in a nearby grove of trees. Each man had a pistol in his pocket. Gobshek carried a Sten submachine gun. Kubish held the assassination weapon, an anti-tank grenade that had been specially modified by British explosives expert Cecil Clark. The small bomb needed to be powerful enough to shatter the armored plating on Heydrich's Mercedes so as to kill him, but light enough to be accurately thrown by Jan Kubisch. High on the hill above the assassins, a signal mirror flashed. Heydrich's Mercedes had been spotted by a local Czech accomplice, Josef Valchik. Soon the car would round the corner and approach where Kubish and Gobchek were concealed. The planning had been meticulously mapped out. The geography of the land was such that at mid-hill the road twisted into a hairpin turn, meaning Heydrich's chauffeur would be forced to brake and slow down. Kubish and Gobchek would have a five-second window to kill Reinhard Heydrich and flee. As the car made its way down the hill, the assassins could see that the top of Heydrich's Mercedes 320 Convertible B was open wide. Opportunity at hand, Gobchek stood up, released the catch on his Sten submachine gun, and rushed toward the sharpest point in the road's curve. As the Mercedes braked and decelerated, Gobchek took aim and fired, bracing himself for a powerful explosion of gunfire. Instead, a catastrophic misfire. Nothing but the impotent click of the weapon as it failed to fire. Gobshek, now standing there in the road, was mortally exposed. Heydrich's driver screeched to a full stop. SS Oberscharführer Johannes Klein was an imposing Nazi chauffeur and bodyguard. Six foot three, he was trained in the art of tactical military driving. Had he followed Third Reich protocol, Klein would have accelerated and sped away. But Heydrich apparently ordered Klein to stop the car. With Gobchek still standing next to the Mercedes, Heydrich pulled his Luger from its holster, stood up in the convertible, and began shooting at Gobchek. 
What Reinhard Heydrich failed to realize was that a second SOE-trained assassin was nearby. Jan Kubisch moved into action, following protocols learned over months of SOE commando training. He stepped forward and hurled the incendiary device into Heydrich's Mercedes. In the chaos of the moment, he missed. Instead, the bomb exploded against the car's right rear fender, sending glass and metal shards flying through the air. Reinhard Heydrich was hit by debris. Not realizing he'd been wounded, Heydrich got out of the car and continued firing. Ditching his faulty submachine gun, Gobshek returned fire with his pistol. Enraged, Heydrich lumbered toward his assassin as Gobshek sought cover behind a telephone pole. As the smoke from the car bomb cleared, Kubish emerged bleeding from a head wound. One witness described blood pouring down his forehead into his eyes. Klein exited the car and began firing at Kubish. Improbably, the bodyguard's gun also jammed, affording Kubish time to flee. Gobchek remained pinned down behind the telephone pole, engaged in a lethal exchange of gunfire with Heydrich. But as Heydrich charged, still firing at Gobchek, he suddenly and dramatically collapsed in the road. The debris from the bomb had penetrated his skin and lodged in his organs. Adolf Hitler's powerful deputy lay stricken on the pavement, unable to move. Get that bastard, Heydrich shouted at Klein, pointing in the direction of Gobchek as he fled. The chauffeur chased the assassins across a field, leaving Heydrich writhing in pain on the road. Kubish and Gobchek escaped. Heydrich was rushed to nearby Bolovka Hospital, where three of the Nazis' most senior doctors came to his aid. Theodore Morel, Hitler's personal physician, Karl Brandt, Nazi health commissioner, and Karl Gebhardt, chief surgeon of the Waffen-SS, concluded that Heydrich's diaphragm was torn and that the grenade fragments were embedded in his spine not necessarily life-threatening injuries. But the three physicians overlooked the fact that tiny bits of horsehair from the upholstered seats of the Mercedes had lodged into Heydrich's spleen. Just a few days later, on June 4, 1942, the man with the iron heart died from septicemia or blood poisoning. When Hitler learned of Heydrich's assassination, he became enraged. Privately, he blamed Reinhard Heydrich for his own careless death. Since it is opportunity which makes not only the thief but also the assassin, such heroic gestures as driving in an open, unarmored vehicle or walking about the streets unguarded are just damn stupidity, which serves the fatherland not one whit, Hitler said on the day Heydrich died. That a man as irreplaceable as Heydrich should expose himself to unnecessary danger, I can only condemn as stupid and idiotic. Publicly, Hitler demanded revenge. That the assassins had been able to escape and go into hiding was an outrageous insult to the Third Reich. At Heydrich's funeral in Berlin, Hitler ordered his ministers in Prague to find the assassins or else. The reprisals were brutal, indiscriminate, and far-reaching. The barbaric idea was to terrify the Czech people by completely destroying a village at random, said Frontishek Morovec, former chief of Czech military intelligence and the man who'd trained the assassins. Northeast of Prague, the Gestapo cordoned off Lidice, rounded up all 173 male inhabitants, and executed them in the village square. 300 women and children were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp for extermination. The houses in the village were set on fire, then bulldozed over so no trace remained. The operation was executed with such thoroughness 
that even the persons who happened to be absent from the village on the night of the destruction were gradually located and executed, said Morovich. A reward of one million Reichsmarks was offered for information on the assassins' whereabouts. A local Nazi collaborator named Alwa Kral revealed that Jan Kubisch and Josef Gobchak were hiding in the basement of a Russian Orthodox church in Prague. Nazi commandos stormed the church, and when they determined that Kubisch and Gobchak were located in the tunnels below, they flooded the basement with water. Kubisch tried to fight his way out but was mortally wounded. Gobchak, knowing he would soon be killed or captured, swallowed a cyanide pill given to him by the SOE. Both men's bodies were recovered and buried in a mass grave. The reprisals did not end in Lediza. Five days later, Nazis raised Lejaki after a shortwave radio transmission was found to have been sent from the village to the British. All 33 residents and their children were killed. The following week, 115 people accused of being members of the Czech resistance were executed. Heydrich's successor, SS General Kurt Dalug, boasted that in retaliation for killing Reinhard Heydrich, 1,331 Czech citizens were executed and another 3,000 Jews exterminated. Was it worth it? 5,000 Czechs paid with their lives for the death of a single Nazi maniac, Moravich lamented after the war. In 1945, after the Germans surrendered, Moravich returned to Prague to speak with Alwa Kral, imprisoned and awaiting trial for Nazi collaboration. Greetings, brother, Kral said sarcastically to Moravich when the two men met. Brother? asked Moravich, astonished. I killed two Czechs. You killed five thousand. Which of us hangs? Kral asked. It was Kral who was hanged. General Moravich watched the execution. By then, Czechoslovakia had become part of the communist Soviet bloc. After the execution, as Moravich walked away, he stopped to ask a question of a communist functionary, a Czech national, a man familiar with the Heydrich case. Will you please tell me where Kubish and Gobchak are buried? Moravich asked. Nowhere, came the abrupt answer. There are no graves. You foot-kissers of the British are not going to have that excuse to build a statue and hang wreaths. Czech heroes are communists now. And so it goes. Wars are fought. One side wins. The other side loses. Some go home. Others become casualties. Freed from Nazi rule, the Czechs lived under a communist-led government that answered to another tyrant. Joseph Stalin. For the second time in a decade, František Morevich fled his country, this time for America. There, the former head of Czech military intelligence took a job as an advisor to the U.S. Department of Defense, where he worked until suffering a heart attack in 1966. He died in the parking lot of the Pentagon, seated in the front seat of his car. To the SOE, the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich was necessary and justified. The spectacle killing of a top Nazi general poked holes in the armor of the Nazi war machine. To the general Czech population, it made the strong appear weak. Inside the Third Reich, the meticulously planned and executed assassination operation gave rise to fear and paranoia among other Nazi officials. When Winston Churchill was briefed on Operation Anthropoid, he expressed approval. When U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt asked whether the British had a hand in Heydrich's assassination, Churchill is said to have winked. 
In Washington, D.C., a retired World War I general and recipient of the Medal of Honor named William J. Donovan had been trying for years to get President Roosevelt to authorize an unconventional warfare organization modeled after SOE. Two weeks after Reinhard Heydrich's assassination, Donovan got his wish. As per Executive Order 9182, the Office of Strategic Services was born, a closely held secret at the time, but now famously known as the wartime predecessor of the CIA. Under the authority of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, OSS would work in partnership with SOE. William J. Donovan was made director, and within days of creation, recruiting for OSS was in full swing. At Fort Polk in Louisiana, U.S. Army officer Aaron Bank, 40, was restless and bored. It had been 17 months since the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, and the same amount of time since Bank had requested troop assignment. He was burning to see combat, but in the eyes of the U.S. Army, Aaron Bank was too old. And so instead, he'd been assigned to a railroad battalion, overseeing soldiers lay tracks connecting Fort Polk to Camp Claiborne 50 miles away. My spirits were low with such unrewarding duties, he told a friend. One day in the spring of 1943, passing the adjutant's tent, Bank spotted a notice on a bulletin board. The Army was looking for volunteers. The notice read, Likelihood of a dangerous mission guaranteed. Knowledge of French or another European language was the only requirement, but volunteers would need to qualify as paratroopers. My pulse quickened, Bank later recalled. A ray of hope appeared. Fluent in French and eager to jump out of airplanes, Bank signed up. A few days later, he received orders. He was to report to the Q building in Washington, D.C., wearing civilian clothes. Aaron Bank did not yet know it, but he'd been assigned to the OSS, to its Special Operations Branch, the American equivalent of SOE's Division D. The mandate of the Special Operations Branch was to effect physical subversion of the enemy in three distinct phases, infiltrate, prepare the battlefield, and conduct sabotage and subversion. Bank was assigned to the French Operational Group for Operation Jedburgh. Initial training took place at a secret facility in Prince William Forest Park in Virginia that went by the code name Area B. Volunteers learned right away the kinds of commando operations they were being prepared for. Either you kill or capture, or you will be killed or captured, the Jedbergs were told, an instruction that was emphasized by the Fairborn Sykes OSS stiletto knife issued to members. The double-edged weapon, designed exclusively for surprise attack and killing, resembled a dagger. Its foil grip and slender blade made for easy penetration into a man's ribcage. How best to use the now legendary Fairburn Sykes stiletto in hand-to-hand -hand combat was taught to the Jedbergs by Lieutenant Colonel William E. Fairburn, one of the knife's designers. In close quarters fighting, there is no more deadly weapon than the knife. An entirely unarmed man has no certain defense against it, Fairburn explained. Of Fairburn's training, a young recruit named Richard Helms had this to say. Within 15 seconds, I came to realize that my private parts were in constant jeopardy. Helms would one day serve as the 8th Director of Central Intelligence. In addition to the art of knife fighting, Jedbergs learned pistol shooting and grenade throwing, how to kill a man with a pencil to the throat, how to garrote an enemy with piano wire. In evade and escape training, they practiced rope climbing and map reading, how to cross a raging river and scale a cliff. 
To master the art of sabotage, the Jedbergs learned to construct bombs powerful enough to blow up bridges, canal locks, and industrial plants. To infiltrate territory laced with landmines, they practiced on an obstacle course laced with small explosive charges and called demolition trail. Trainees were told to keep their heads down and stay low. The only injury recorded was sustained by a young officer who broke his jaw and lost several teeth in a small explosion. The injured commando, William J. Casey, would one day serve as the 16th Director of Central Intelligence under President Ronald Reagan. The OSS trained its agents to work from a mindset that was diametrically opposed to U.S. Army doctrine at the time. Conventional warfare was based upon frontal assault against an enemy's main line of resistance, on colossal tank battles combined with air power and army ground force assault. Guerrilla warfare, also called unconventional warfare and irregular warfare, was the opposite. Close quarters combat and throat slitting were par for the course. Whereas infantry soldiers followed strict orders within a chain of command, Jedbergs were trained in the art of self-reliance. They were volunteering for mysterious, often solo assignments involving improvisation on the ground. OSS Chief William Donovan believed in the necessity of guerrilla warfare, a sentiment he conveyed to President Roosevelt in a letter housed at the National Archives. My observation is that the more the battle machines are perfected, the greater the need in modern warfare of men, calculatingly reckless with disciplined daring, who are trained for aggressive action, Donovan said. It will mean a return to our old tradition of the scouts, the raiders, and the rangers, he insisted, in a reference to the unconventional warfare tactics used during the American Revolution. To understand and embrace OSS-style guerrilla warfare was to reject preconceived notions of honor, chivalry, and fair play as the gentleman's way of war. What I want you to do is get the dirtiest, bloodiest ideas in your head that you can think of for destroying a human being, SOE's founder, General Gubbins, educated the Jedbergs. The fighting I'm going to show you is not a sport. It's every time and always fight to the death. After six weeks, Aaron Bank and 55 American Jedbergs were sent to England for more advanced training, this time with their British, French, and Belgian counterparts. On the Scottish shores of Loch Nan Call, at the Victorian Lodge called Ersich House, the Jedbergs learned how to operate under extreme duress, how to stay awake for days on end, hike 100 miles, raid a building, seize a small town. Finally, in a last phase of training, the multinational Jedberg teams were sent to a manor house in Cambridgeshire called Milton Hall. One of the largest Private homes in England, the manor had been donated to the cause by Lord and Lady Fitzwilliam. Oil portraits of Fitzwilliam family ancestors dating back to 1594 hung on the walls. In the massive sunken gardens, the Jedbergs practiced martial arts. In the converted dairy barns, they learned to decode cipher, feign deafness, use sign language, and transmit Morse code. In the manor's grand library, they watched Nazi propaganda films, a way to become familiar with how the enemy moved, spoke, and dressed. Milton Hall served as a kind of finishing school for commandos, one of the last stops before embarking on dangerous missions that many would not survive. Jan Kubisch and Josef Gabczak trained at Milton Hall shortly before leaving on their mission to kill Heydrich. The final phase of Jedberg training involved parachuting infiltration techniques taught at Ultranum, Manchester, at a facility codenamed STS-51. 
This three-day educational course included three live parachute jumps. The first, in daylight, was out of a balloon, flying 700 feet off the ground. The second was out of an airplane, flying at an altitude of roughly 500 feet. The third served as a dry run for insertion behind enemy lines. In the dead of night, commandos jumped out of a plane, flying at roughly 1,500 feet. On June 5, 1944, the eve of the Normandy invasion, the first Jedburgh team, codenamed Team Hugh, parachuted into Nazi-occupied France with instructions from Prime Minister Winston Churchill to set Europe ablaze. Ninety-two Jedburgh teams would follow, including one led by Aaron Bank, now advanced to chief of guerrilla operations in France. The mission of these Jedberg teams was to blow up infrastructure, kill Nazis, and disappear without a trace. In this way, the official motto of the Jedbergs became Surprise, Kill, Vanish. In Texas, Billy Waugh learned about the Normandy invasion from the radio at his grandmother's house. Winnie Waugh lived directly across the street, and whenever Billy had the chance, he listened to programs like G.I. Live and This Is Our Enemy. On the afternoon of June 6, 1944, NBC Radio announced the D-Day invasion of Nazi-occupied France. Then came the newsreels of the Normandy invasion. The most amazing footage was of 1,500 airplanes dropping thousands of American paratroopers into France, their silk canopies filling the skies like balloons. To Billy, these operations were mythic, and when he heard that recruiting stations in Los Angeles, California, allowed boys of 15 to pass for older and join the war, he decided to run away and become a combat soldier. Billy Waugh packed a bag and hit the road, hitchhiking west out of Bastrop. He made it 650 miles to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where he was stopped along Highway 80 by a police officer. When he failed to produce identification, he was arrested for truancy and put in jail. The police said they'd release him only if he could produce enough money to buy a bus ticket back home. With no choice but to call his mother, Billy Waugh picked up the phone. His mother agreed to wire him bus fare if he promised to finish high school. Billy kept his word. This war would end without him, but he was now determined to become a U.S. Army paratrooper first thing after high school. In Europe, as part of a plan called Operation Foxley, the British Special Operations Executive conceived of ways to assassinate Adolf Hitler. One plot called for a sniper to shoot Hitler during his morning walk around the Berghof, his residence in the Bavarian Alps, using a Mauser Car 98K with a telescopic sight. Another plan involved sending a single commando into Nazi Germany to poison Hitler's food with an unidentified toxin codenamed I. In the third plot, commandos would attach a suitcase full of explosives under the Fuhrer's train car. But the laws of war forbade assassination, and many British generals worried that such a high-profile assassination could open the door to a war crimes trial. Not everyone agreed. On the pro-assassination side, was Air Vice Marshal A.P. Ritchie, who told colleagues that the German people viewed Hitler as something more than human. To Ritchie, it was this mythical hold which Hitler exercises over the German people that is largely responsible for keeping the country together at the present time. In a bid for assassination, he argued, remove Hitler and there is nothing left. But Vice Marshal Ritchie was a minority voice. Decades earlier, in 1907, 44 nations had met at The Hague to formalize the laws of war as had been originally written in the Lieber Code. 
in Laws and Customs of War on Land, Hague 4, assassination was further defined to include any form of treacherous killing. Wartime killing had sharp distinctions, the authors wrote, citing by example two contradictory ways to kill a general or king, one considered a treacherous war crime, the other a lawful killing. A soldier is forbidden to sneak into the tent of a general or king, disguised as, say, a peddler. But if that soldier is in uniform and is part of a small attacking force, then he is allowed and encouraged to kill the general or the king. One soldier is a vile assassin, the other a brave and devoted soldier, according to the Hague Convention. The reason for the distinction, the authors wrote, was to diminish the evils of war. And so, despite how arbitrary this and other prohibitions seemed to some, the British SOE plans to assassinate Hitler were scrapped. There was no way an SOE commando could operate inside Nazi Germany, wearing a uniform of the British Army, it was argued. But over at the Office of Strategic Services, the boldness of Operation Foxley inspired the OSS Chief of Secret Intelligence for Operations in Europe to devise a Hitler assassination plot of his own. The chief was a young American lawyer turned commando named William J. Casey, the same young man who'd broken his jaw and lost several teeth on the demolition trail while training for OSS Special Operations at Area B. To Casey's eye, if OSS was going to defy the laws and customs of war on land in order to assassinate Hitler, why stumble over a rule regarding uniforms? His audaciously deceptive plan, called Operation Iron Cross, was to insert an OSS commando team disguised as enemy soldiers wearing Nazi uniforms. To lead this five-man OSS team, which would be populated out of a battalion of turncoat Nazis, Bill Casey chose Aaron Bank. The two men had trained together, back at Prince William Park in Virginia at Area B. After the war, Aaron Bank recalled Bill Casey describing Operation Iron Cross to him as the most important assassination operation of the war. The OSS had recently captured, turned, and trained 175 German POWs. These men, formerly avowed Nazis, were now willing to work for the OSS. In the winter of 1945, the plan was to have Aaron Bank, a four-man OSS team, and the captured Nazis parachute in behind enemy lines posing as Wehrmacht soldiers. The team, called the OSS Iron Cross Mountain Infantry, would hike through the mountainous terrain locate Hitler's eagle's nest hideaway, ambush the Nazi leader, and kill him. But to command such a unit deep in enemy territory involved extreme risk. The drop zone chosen would be deep within the Inn Valley in Austria. There would be no backup air support, no infantry army to call. All it would take was one double-crosser, one Nazi POW still secretly loyal to Hitler, and the mission would unravel. In all likelihood, the OSS team, led by Aaron Bank, would be executed on the spot. Setting aside worry over the Hague resolution against treacherous killing, Bill Casey was concerned about a certain rule of engagement, ROE, issued by Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower, to whom he was fiercely loyal. General Eisenhower had forbidden the U.S. Army and the OSS from recruiting and hiring Nazi POWs for any kind of mission. Casey, skilled lawyer that he was, appreciated loopholes. 
by encouraging the captured Nazis to volunteer for the Iron Cross Mountain Infantry Mission, he created a legal go-around that allowed him to proceed. As chief of OSS Special Operations in Europe, Bill Casey had authorized dozens of teams airdropped into this area. But he remained cautious about inserting the Iron Cross Mountain Infantry because he knew the area around Eagle's Nest to be heavily guarded by elite Nazi commandos. Still, Casey authorized Bank to begin preparing the team and await further instructions. At an undisclosed European location, Bank led commando training, teaching Nazi turncoats new infiltration techniques, including how to extract individuals from armored cars and how to storm a mock-up of the target. The plot advanced to the point where Bank was given a large sum of cash with which to pay bribes and a small gold ring to barter for his freedom in the event he was separated and captured. Each OSS operator was given a cyanide capsule, as Jan Kubisch and Josef Gobchek had been. The prospect of killing Adolf Hitler caused Aaron Bank to lie awake at night thinking, Wild thoughts, world-shattering in scope, he later wrote. If Banks' OSS team succeeded in killing Adolf Hitler, it would be the end of the war, because the German general staff would surely surrender. With no one left to command the army, wrote Bank, this would be the only time in history that five guys would be responsible for ending a major war. Bank continued to train the Iron Cross Mountain Infantry. He and his men conducted a dangerous dry run over the drop zone, practicing reconnaissance and exfiltration techniques. Then he waited, and waited. The anticipation was excruciating. Storms hung over the Alps, first for days, then weeks. It was April 1945. Finally, Aaron Bank was flown to Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, in Paris, for a classified briefing with General Eisenhower. The U.S. Army had moved infantry soldiers into the Inn Valley. There were boots on the ground now, closing in around Eagle's Nest. Operation Iron Cross was canceled. Bank was devastated. To kill or capture Hitler was the opportunity of a lifetime. In a flash, it was gone. On May 7, 1945, the Nazis surrendered at a brief ceremony inside a schoolhouse in Reims, France. General Walter Bidel Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff, officiated the historic end of the Third Reich. Three months later, after the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Imperial Japan surrendered unconditionally to the Allies, ending World War II. Six weeks later, on October 1, 1945, President Truman signed an order abolishing the OSS. Truman disliked William Donovan and his band of ungentlemanly warriors. In a curt memorandum, the president thanked Donovan for his service and wished him well. To President Truman's eye, America was the new standard-bearer of democratic ideals. The U.S. military was the mightiest in the world. Soldiers of a democracy do not fight guerrilla wars. Gentlemen do not slit throats. In Bastrop, Texas, Billy Waugh took part in every victory parade. He'd stand on the corner when the parade began, waving his flag at the war heroes. Then he'd duck away from the crowds, race through an alleyway, and get back to the street in advance of the marching men. He'd repeat this action all morning or afternoon until the parade ended. Two local Marines wounded in the war, were especially interesting to him. One had a wound to the head, and the other wore a cast on his leg. Whenever I was near them, remembers Waugh, 
in a street or a store. I felt awed to be in their presence. I admired their strength and nobility. One month after graduating from high school, Billy Waugh joined the U.S. Army as a paratrooper. He was off to Fort Benning in Georgia to learn how to jump out of airplanes. His whole life was in front of him, and it felt great. Chapter 2. Tertia Optio Six months passed. One night, in April 1946, America's ambassador to the Soviet Union, General Walter Bedell Smith, was riding in his chauffeur-driven limousine headed to the Kremlin, where he was set to meet with Joseph Stalin. Tempered yet tenacious, the former general was a man well-versed in military operations. During the war, Bedell Smith served as Eisenhower's chief of staff. Wartime colleagues called him Ike's hatchet man. General Eisenhower called him the greatest general manager of the war. An all-round intimidating figure, Bedell Smith was rarely one to express unease, and yet here he was, feeling apprehensive about what lay ahead. He served as President Truman's top diplomat now, and the issue at hand was how not to go to war with the Soviet Union. I believed myself more or less immune to excitement, but I must confess I experienced a feeling of tension as the hour for the interview approached, Bedell Smith later recalled. I thought the meeting might be a stormy one. World War II had been over for less than a year, and already Stalin was the new nemesis of the Western world. Stalin was paranoid and power-mad. As premier of the Soviet Union, he ruled by terror. Since his rise to power in the early 1920s, he'd starved and killed millions of his own people and personally oversaw the assassination of rivals who threatened him, including Leon Trotsky, an early architect of the Soviet state, whom he had ordered to be killed in Coyoacan, Mexico, in 1940. Stalin assassinated writers and philosophers unwilling to peddle propaganda, and scientists and engineers who failed to solve his technology problems. In 1937, he had eight of his top army generals executed in the Great Purge. During World War II, he had been one of America's most powerful allies, which made it necessary to look beyond his crimes and win the war. Now, from the perspective of the State Department officials to whom Walter Bedell Smith reported, Joseph Stalin was no longer behaving as a friend. The U.S. Embassy car moved quickly down Arabat Street, through the soot-stained snow, the American flags attached to its antennae whipping in the night air. This route to the Kremlin was along one of the most heavily policed streets in the world but because the car's occupants enjoyed diplomatic privileges, it never had to stop. All the traffic lights remained green as Bedell Smith's driver hurtled along. Sitting alone in the back seat, the ambassador read and reread pages of notes prepared for him by the State Department. Possible points to be stressed in conversation with Stalin, its header read. Just a few days prior, Bedell Smith's charge d'affaires at the embassy in Moscow, a career diplomat named George Keenan, had advised President Truman on the threat posed by Stalin in what would become known as the Long Telegram. Stalin knew only the logic of force, Keenan said. The Soviets were on the move, devouring territory around the globe. The United States had only one option— Stalin had to be stopped. Bedell Smith's mission was to find out how much more land Stalin intended to grab. To look at a map made the problem self-evident. Russia's human losses in World War II had been colossal, with some 20 million dead. But more troubling for the West were its territorial gains. During the war, 
Stalin's Red Army took possession of almost half of Europe, then kept much of it after the Nazis capitulated. In 1946, power came in numbers. Military strength was still about a nation's potential army size. The U.S. population was around 140 million. Stalin ruled over 200 million Russians and another 100 million people living beyond the country's traditional borders in the land that had been grabbed. To make matters even more threatening, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, was getting bigger by the season. The question Bedell Smith needed answered was simple but uncomfortable. How much further was Stalin going to go? The embassy car deposited Bedell Smith at the Kremlin's main gate, and the ambassador was taken inside to Stalin's personal office building. Bedell Smith was escorted up to the third floor, down a long, austere corridor, and into a high-ceilinged, wood-paneled conference room. There sat Stalin, his back to the wall, facing Bedell Smith as he entered. Behind the dictator hung massive oil portraits depicting the great Russian marshals, most of them on horseback. Bedell Smith spotted Sovorov and Kutuzov, two military strategists noted for their expansionist views. Once seated, Bedell Smith spoke first through an interpreter. He discussed the most pressing issues from his State Department notes, watching Stalin as he took exaggerated draws on a long, thin cigarette. By the time Bedell Smith finished talking, Stalin had picked up a red pencil and begun writing. Points to later debate, Bedell Smith first assumed. But upon closer inspection, it was clear that Joseph Stalin was doodling. The ambassador was stunned. His drawings, repeated many times, looked to me like lopsided hearts done in red, with a small question mark in the middle. Stalin entered the conversation by making a point about oil, Iranian oil. You don't understand our situation with regards to oil and Iran, Stalin said, suggesting that he could answer the ambassador's questions with a singularly cryptic point. The Baku oil fields are our major source of supply. We are not going to risk our oil supply. The Soviet Union needed a greater share in the exploitation of the world's oil, Stalin said, and the competition for these resources was a significant point of contention between Russia and the United States. As Bedell Smith considered his response, Stalin took the opportunity to bring up a more personal matter. Lately, Great Britain and the United States had been teaming up against Russia and placing obstacles in her path, Stalin said. Bedell Smith was caught off guard. Did Stalin really believe that the United States and Great Britain are united in an alliance to thwart Russia, he asked? Da, Stalin replied in a long, slow breath, yes. I must affirm, in the strongest possible terms, that is not the case, the U.S. ambassador insisted. Except it was true. British Prime Minister Churchill had stated as much just one month before, during a speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. An iron curtain has descended across the European continent, Churchill famously declared. From Warsaw to Berlin, all these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere, and all are subject, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and, in many cases, increasing measure of control from Moscow. Churchill had compared Stalin to a puppet master, this infuriated Stalin. Like most tyrants, he resented any person who suggested that his popularity was based not on adoration, but fear. Stalin had hated Churchill for decades. In 1919, 
Churchill tried to instigate war against Russia and persuaded the United States to join him in an armed occupation against parts of our territory, Stalin reminded Ambassador Bedell Smith, adding, Lately, he's been at it again. Stalin called the Westminster speech an unfriendly act and said that it was an unwarranted attack upon the USSR. He pointed out that the United States would never stand by passively if such an insult was hurled in its direction. But Russia, as the events of the past few years have proved, is not stupid, Stalin forewarned. We can recognize our friends from our potential enemies. Ambassador Bedell Smith was in a bind. He needed an answer for President Truman. So he asked Stalin directly, how far is Russia going to go? Stalin paused, stopped doodling the red hearts and the question marks. Looking directly at Walter Bedell Smith, he replied in a monotone, we're not going to go much further. But what exactly did much further mean? That was the enigma of 1946. Stalin ended the interview, and the ambassador was shown the door. Eleven months later, the United States drew a line in the sand, declaring communism the enemy of democracy. On March 12, 1947, in a dramatic speech to a joint session of Congress, President Truman warned the American people that Moscow had to be stopped. It must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation, Truman said. Without American help, darkness and cataclysm would descend in the world, and disorder might well spread throughout the entire Middle East. In a display of near-unanimous support, the members of Congress took to their feet. For two minutes, President Truman enjoyed his first standing ovation since the end of the war. The speech marked the beginning of the Truman Doctrine, American foreign policy designed to confront and counter Soviet geopolitical expansion. Congress passed the National Security Act of 1947, restructuring the U.S. military and intelligence agencies and creating a national security apparatus for the modern era. The act officially established the Central Intelligence Agency and the White House National Security Council, NSC, and it gave way to an unconventional warfare division for the president to command on his authority and his alone. This unit was designed to be covert. George Keenan called it a guerrilla warfare corps for the commander-in-chief. Covert action would become the president's hidden hand, visible only to those in his inner circle. The National Security Council directed the CIA to take control of these hidden hand operations, officially called Covert Action Operations, under Title 50 authority of the U.S. Code. The Department of Defense would work under a separate authority called Title 10, which outlines the role of the armed forces. This distinction remains in effect today. During a National Security Council meeting in December of 1947, the President's advisors clarified that the CIA's covert action authority would include preventative direct action through paramilitary activities as a means of countering the vicious covert activities of the USSR. Direct action would become a key phrase at the CIA, one that allowed its officers and operators Title 50 authority not available to anyone else in the United States unless expressly directed by the President. The CIA's general counsel, Lawrence Houston, requested clarification. How much autonomy would the CIA have in conducting these covert action operations? Lack of such specific direction 
may be considered a weakness in the National Security Act of 1947 that deserves further consideration by the Congress, Houston wrote. The following month, National Security Council Directive 10-2, NSC 10-2, provided the clarification Houston had sought. A new office would be created inside the CIA called the Office of Special Projects, where covert actions would be planned and executed in peacetime. In times of war, the CIA was to coordinate its covert operations with the Defense Department and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Covert operations are understood to be all activities which are conducted or sponsored by this government against hostile foreign states or groups, according to the directive, but which are so planned and executed that if uncovered, the U.S. government can plausibly disclaim any responsibility for them. While the concept of willful ignorance has insulated countless commanders and kings from embarrassment and scandal, it was in this moment that the President's National Security Council made the concept of plausible deniability an official construct. Plausible deniability would hereafter allow U.S. presidents to say they didn't know. For the first time in American history, the president had at his disposal a secret paramilitary organization authorized by Congress to carry out hidden-hand operations to protect U.S. national security interests around the world. Before NSC 10-2, there were two ways in which U.S. foreign policy and national security were pursued. The first option was diplomacy, the second, war. Covert action was now the president's third option, or tertia optio, after diplomacy failed and a Title X military operation was deemed unwise. On September 1, 1948, the Office of Special Projects changed its name to the more innocuous-sounding Office of Policy Coordination, OPC, and got to work. The new organization's activities might well enhance possibilities for achieving American objectives by means short of war, said George Keenan, co-architect of NSC 10-2 along with James Forrestal, the nation's first Secretary of Defense. According to a report written by the National Security Council, kept classified for 55 years, the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination would now be responsible for covert action paramilitary operations, including guerrilla movements, underground armies, sabotage, and assassination. In its first two years of existence, the CIA's covert operations concentrated on anti-communist partisan groups in Europe and the Eastern Bloc. Then, on June 25, 1950, the unthinkable happened. The Army of North Korea, backed by Soviet tanks and Chinese intelligence, invaded South Korea, with the goal of reuniting the divided country under communist rule. The entire Western world was caught off guard. The CIA had failed to foresee an attack that the U.S. national security apparatus feared could be the opening salvo of World War III. The United Nations called upon the invading communist troops to cease fighting and withdraw to the 38th parallel. When the invaders refused, the UN Security Council looked to its members for help. I have ordered United States air and sea forces to give the Korean government troops cover and support, President Truman announced from the White House press room. After just five years of peace, the country was at war again. Behind the lines, paramilitary operations were needed to augment conventional forces. The CIA surged ahead with plans to take the lead. 
Chapter 3 Surprise Attack in Korea That the nation's new intelligence agency had failed to anticipate the invasion of an ally by communist forces put the CIA in a compromised position. President Truman blamed leadership and decided that CIA Director Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter had to go. To replace him, he called upon General Walter Bedell Smith, who was physically unwell. The stress of having served as ambassador to Moscow had left Bedell Smith with a severe ulcer, and he'd recently undergone major surgery at Walter Reed to have two-thirds of his stomach removed. President Truman had previously offered him the job as CIA director, a position he had graciously turned down. Now, with the United States at war in Korea, President Truman's request became an order, and Bedell Smith became the new director of the CIA. With a formidable figure now at the helm, the CIA's credibility and access to resources dramatically expanded. According to CIA documents kept classified for nearly 50 years, Korea became a testing ground for the support of conventional warfare with unconventional efforts or black operations behind enemy lines. Walter Bedell Smith had no experience in covert operations, so he looked to outside experts. He chose them unwisely, he later learned. With black operations now at the fore, the CIA called upon the experience and talents of the Office of Strategic Services, dismantled by Truman in October 1945. Its members had hardly disappeared from public service. At the start of the Korean War, one-third of the CIA's total personnel had previously served in the OSS. I know nothing about this business, Bedell Smith confided to Admiral Sidney Sewers, the CIA's first director. I need a deputy who does. For the job of Deputy Director of Plans, a euphemism for director of covert operations, he chose veteran OSS officer and future CIA director Alan Dulles. In turn, Dulles filled the positions below him with veterans of the OSS. Frank Wisner, formerly the OSS station chief in Romania, assumed responsibility for Office of Policy Coordination Operations and Staff. Wisner, or Wiz, as he was known among colleagues, was a complex individual obsessed with rolling back Soviet gains. A former Olympic runner, he was now overweight and out of shape from years of heavy drinking and womanizing. He was under pressure from the FBI for having had a wartime affair with a Romanian princess suspected of being a Soviet spy. His mercurial behavior was written off by colleagues and family alike as part of his personality. He seemed to be only half with us, always pondering some insoluble riddle, said his son Graham. Nevertheless, he dominated every conversation with an extraordinary mixture of wit, charm, humor, and southern power. What no one knew at the time was that Frank Wisner was in the early stages of mental illness and would eventually end his own life with a shotgun blast in the mouth. For now, he was in charge of planning and overseeing paramilitary action in Korea sending hundreds, perhaps thousands, of good men to their deaths. The black mark he left on the agency still haunts the CIA today. Walter Bedell Smith mistrusted Frank Wisner, but he was stuck with him. In Korea, Wisner and his team began planning covert action operations. One of the first was an operation to infiltrate an agent into Pyongyang, to assassinate North Korea's communist dictator, Kim Il-sung. The operation was so sensitive it was personally handled 
by Wisner's deputy chief of CIA covert operations, a former OSS officer named Hans V. Toft. The enigmatic Hans Toft was an American citizen born in Denmark. At first glance, he appeared highly qualified for the job. Fluent in Japanese, Russian, and Chinese, he had lived overseas in his twenties and been recruited by the British Secret Intelligence Services in the early years of the war. When the OSS was created, Toft was assigned to its Special Operations Division. He had trained Jedburgh candidates Bill Casey and Aaron Bank in guerrilla warfare at Area B. Inserted into the war theater by parachute, he fought the Nazis behind enemy lines in Italy and Yugoslavia with valor. The King of Denmark knighted him. But like Frank Wisner, something had happened to Hans Toft in the five years since the end of World War II. His character transformed. By 1950, Toft was a liar and a thief. Was it post-traumatic stress? Hubris? Too much booze? The danger of covert action operations and the plausible deniability construct in which they exist was that it made it possible for ignoble actions to be easily concealed. Like Frank Wisner, Toft would ultimately experience a tragic downfall. Fired from the CIA for stealing classified information, he would die impoverished, his reputation in ruins. But for now, as deputy chief of CIA covert operations in Korea, Toft was in charge of running the assassination plot to kill Korean President Kim Il-sung. To do this, he oversaw six CIA operators who worked out of a hotel room in Tokyo. There were classified reasons why the CIA feared Kim Il-sung. To the intelligence community, he was the most dangerous kind of despot, a Soviet puppet. The CIA believed Kim Il-sung to be a top-ranking traitor who isn't even who he said he is, according to a dossier entitled The Identity of Kim Il-sung. The man's real name was Kim Sung Ju, analysts concluded. Orphaned as a child, he was said to have killed a fellow student while in high school. The circumstances of the murder were chronicled in his CIA file. Needing money, he stole it from a classmate, was caught, and fearing possible disclosure, killed his classmate, the dossier read. It was around this time that the orphan Kim Song-ju was identified by communist intelligence agents as someone the party could blackmail into use. The real Kim Il-sung had been a genuine war hero, a courageous guerrilla fighter who'd battled Japanese invaders in the Pektu mountain regions of Korea during World War II. According to information in the CIA dossier, Stalin's assassins killed the war hero and disappeared him. This enabled Stalin's minions to steal the war hero's identity and give it to the orphan boy with a caveat. The imposter Kim Il-sung would now act as Moscow's puppet. In the fall of 1945, when Stalin appointed a man named Kim Il-sung to be Secretary General of the North Korea Communist Party, the identity theft was complete. Specific instructions were given to the leaders of that regime that there should be no questions raised about Kim Il-sung's identity, the CIA learned. If the story were indeed true, North Korea's leader, was an exceptionally dangerous kind of tyrant, fundamentally beholden to the Kremlin. If Kim Il-sung did not do exactly as instructed by the Politburo, his background as a murderous orphan, not a war hero, could be revealed. North Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world, and Kim Il-sung was dependent upon Russian patronage for his country's most basic needs. 
Everything he did was now in service to his communist masters, including the siege and subsequent land grab of South Korea. The CIA's Office of Policy Coordination put North Korean President Kim Il-sung at the top of one of its earliest known targeted kill lists. Hans Toft received a cable from Washington. An assassin had been chosen for the job. Toft was to receive the CIA covert action operator in Tokyo, then oversee his infiltration into Pyongyang. The man was a Cherokee Indian codenamed Buffalo, Toft told historian Joseph Goulden after the war, as had Reinhard Heydrich's assassins, Jan Kubisch and Josef Gabczak. Buffalo had volunteered for the job. He'd been asked in Washington, how would you like to kill Kim Il-sung? And he had accepted the mission with great pride, Toft recalled. Toft received instructions to meet the assassins near the wall of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo at sunset, at a designated time on a specific day. Carrying a briefcase full of cash from his office's unvouchered funding authority, Toff handed over a considerable amount of money to Buffalo, he later recalled. The mission failed, he says, and Buffalo was never heard from again. The idea that a Native American Indian, an assassin for the CIA, could simply make his way to Pyongyang in the middle of a war and blend in among the locals there was ambitious and foolhardy. It also set a precedent for what would eventually become known as lethal direct action, targeted killing, directed against a specific person either in peacetime or war. While the Hague Resolution prohibited assassination, Title 50 Covert Action Authority made targeted killing legal intended to counter the vicious covert activities of the USSR. The fabricated identity of Kim Il-sung was a case in point, a Soviet covert act of deception directed against the United States. Through North Korea's supreme commander, Stalin could entangle the United States in a war on the Korean peninsula. The Office of Policy Coordination began inserting CIA paramilitary teams deep inside Korea, behind enemy lines. The teams, led by Americans and made up of anti-communist Korean and Chinese nationals, were airdropped into hostile territory to conduct sabotage and subversion, including hit-and-run assassinations, similar to what OSS had done during World War II. The results were disastrous, as explained by the man assigned to lead the CIA's parachute infiltration efforts, a former OSS Jedberg named John Jack Singlob. In 2016, Singlob, age 96, recalled these wartime tragedies with clarity and stoicism. One of the impossible imperatives of war in Asia was that Westerners could never simply disappear behind enemy lines into the civilian populations as we had done in Nazi-occupied Europe, Singlob said. This was a tremendous challenge in Korea and an equally difficult problem in Vietnam. He was referring to the future war in which he would also play a significant role, running covert action operations for the CIA. Singlob would rise to the position of U.S. Army Major General. In 1951, Jack Singlob served as CIA Deputy Chief of Station in Seoul. He and his colleagues worked out of the newly renovated Tremor Hotel downtown. Their cover was that they were an advisory organization called the Special Operations Group, SOG, Joint Advisory Commission Korea, JAC, 8132nd Army Unit. 
The cover name paid homage to the OSS Special Operations Branch, and the unit became known simply as Jack. Jack's first commander, Singlob's boss, was the CIA's chief of station in Seoul, Ben Vandervoort, a legendary paratroop commander who'd lost one eye fighting Nazis in Holland. A month after Singlob arrived, Vandervoort was called back to Washington, much to Singlob's dismay. His replacement was a former CIA operative and army colonel named Albert R. Haney, a man whose integrity would also come under fire, as had Wisner's and Toff's. Following a blueprint created by the OSS, the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination sought to organize an anti-communist guerrilla force. It could train and equip for partisan warfare behind enemy lines in Korea. OPC officers combed through refugee camps in South Korea, looking for local fighters qualified for paramilitary service, including North Korean and Chinese nationals. Back in America, Dozens of college graduates were being recruited by the CIA to lead these covert action operations in the Far East. One of the recruits was Donald P. Gregg, who was studying cryptanalysis, the study of hidden information systems, at a liberal arts college in Massachusetts. Gregg would eventually work for the CIA for 31 years. Greg and dozens of other new officers in training were sent to a clandestine irregular warfare facility run by the CIA on the island of Saipan, a tiny dot in the Pacific Ocean 2,000 miles southeast of Seoul. There, hundreds of young male Korean and Chinese refugees recruited from war camps underwent weeks of training in guerrilla warfare tactics. We were following in the footsteps of the OSS, says Greg, who later became U.S. ambassador to South Korea. But unlike veteran covert action officer Jack Singlob, Don Gregg had no experience fighting wars, let alone using unconventional warfare tactics behind enemy lines. He'd only recently graduated from Williams College and barely knew where Korea was on the map. We didn't know what we were doing, he says of his experiences on Saipan. I asked my superiors what the mission was, but they wouldn't tell me. They didn't know. We were training Koreans and Chinese and a lot of strange people, Greg recalled. The problem facing the CIA in Korea was twofold. Who exactly were the indigenous forces the agency was training? And could it be assumed that they, too, were in pursuit of American goals? A great majority spoke no English. An equal number were illiterate. How could the CIA identify a traitor under such circumstances? How would anyone know if a recruit or volunteer was in fact a spy sent by the North Korean People's Army or the internal security forces? Jack Singlob had his own set of worries, more practical than theoretical. His OPC colleagues, Frank Wisner and Hans Toft, were anxious to begin airdropping teams of CIA operators and their local forces into North Korea behind enemy lines. As the man overseeing air insertion tactics, Singlob felt this pressure. He also worried about getting the men safely into the war zone. The Chinese were well aware of our airdrop operations and had learned to recognize the sound of low-flying transport planes that had an open door, he recalls. Singlob felt it would be safer to airdrop the operators into enemy territory from higher up. This would give them a greater chance of successful clandestine insertion, he believed. CIA covert action operations were being run out of a forward operating base, FOB, on Yongdo Island in southwestern Korea, and it was there that Singlob began testing his new idea. Parachuting was my specialty from the OSS Jedburgh days, he recalls.
He borrowed a B-26 light bomber aircraft from the Air Force, re-rigged the bomb bay as a jump platform, and went out for a test. I told the pilot to keep his airspeed close to normal for level flight, then jumped, assuming the same position I'd used to jump into Nazi-occupied France. Once he was out of the aircraft, he pulled his parachute and floated down to the ground. The test demonstrated we could use bombers for agent drops, he says. The success sparked another idea, a way to get a team in even more secretly. What if, he thought, Instead of pulling his ripcord right away, he instead allowed his body to fall through the air, reaching terminal velocity, roughly 122 miles per hour, or 54 meters per second, and then pull. This was long before the days of skydiving, back when the military had very clear protocols about how its paratroopers jumped, Singlob clarifies. What he wanted to do now was free fall, then pull his ripcord, say, 1,000 feet above the ground. While inherently more dangerous than a static line jump, free falling meant the enemy was less likely to see an agent's parachute as he floated to Earth. To test this idea, Singlob borrowed an L-19 bird dog from the Air Force. Accompanied by airborne specialist Captain John Skip Sadler, he made a series of test jumps, leaping out of the aircraft and having Sadler record the time before his parachute blossomed. After each test, Singlob waited longer on the next jump, thereby getting closer to the ground each successive time. Objects on the ground came into sharp focus within a thousand feet or so, I watched an object on the road below change from a blurred dot to what looked like a child's toy to an actual U.S. Army Jeep with a white star stenciled on its hood. I pulled the ripcord. Singlob's parachute opened and his feet hit the sand. Neither of us realized at the time that we'd invented the concept of high-altitude, low-opening, halo, parachute drops, right there over the Han River in Korea. The halo jump has since become the most effective means of inserting covert action operators into denied territory and behind enemy lines. In 2019, it is still the method of choice. In Washington, D.C., a battle over covert action operations was underway between the CIA and the U.S. Army. When war broke out on the Korean Peninsula, there was no Special Operations Forces, SOF, capability at the Defense Department. The military response was hesitant, skeptical, indifferent, and even antagonistic with regard to all aspects of unconventional or irregular warfare, says retired colonel and U.S. Army historian Alfred H. Paddock, Jr., most military leaders at the Pentagon wanted no part of these ungentlemanly black operations. Guerrilla warfare was frowned upon, says Singlob. There were two notable exceptions. Leading a small group of guerrilla warfare pioneers inside the military establishment in 1951 were General Robert A. McClure, former director of the Psychological Warfare Division during World War II, and Colonel Russell W. Volkman, a former U.S. Army captain who'd led the only non-OSS guerrilla operations during the war in the Philippines. What gave General McClure and Colonel Volkman momentum in their efforts was that both men had the ear of their former boss, General Eisenhower, now serving as the U.S. Army Chief of Staff. As per National Security Council Directive 10-2, covert action was to be the sole responsibility of the CIA during peacetime. Korea was different. This was war, McClure and Volkman agreed. To me, the military has the inherent responsibility in time of war to organize and conduct special forces operations, Volkman told his commanding general. 
I feel that it is unsound, dangerous, and unworkable to delegate these responsibilities to a civil agency, that is, the CIA. General McClure took a similar position. I believe the Army should be the executive agent for guerrilla activities, he told the Army Chief of Staff. I am not going to fight with CIA as to their responsibility in those fields. In an attempt to alleviate the conflict, the Joint Chiefs of Staff created an army organization to work with Jack called CRAC. In CRAC documents located in the National Archives, the organization's original acronym is revealed, Covert, Clandestine, and Related Activities in Korea, an on-the-nose description of the U.S. Army's secret guerrilla warfare unit in Korea. As happened at the CIA, the name was quickly changed to something more innocuous. CRAC became Combined Command Reconnaissance Activities, Korea. An operations base was set up on Pyongyang Island off the coast of South Korea near the northern limit line. The unit assigned to work with the CIA's Jack was originally called the Guerrilla Section, 8th Army Miscellaneous. But this name was also deemed too revealing. It was changed to the United Nations Partisan Infantry, Korea. That the Army was vying for power over covert operations infuriated the CIA's Frank Wisner. The CIA informed the Department of Defense of its displeasure. Mr. Wisner, as head of OPC, would like it to be clearly understood that this understanding is reached on the assumption that the Army is creating a Special Forces Training Command for its own purposes and not at the request of CIA, agency officials wrote in a now-declassified memo. Theirs was a temporary wartime gesture of cooperation. The CIA is not going to place itself in the position of giving the Army an excuse to justify the creation of its own unconventional warfare capability. Once the war was over, agency officials demanded that covert action authority be returned to the CIA. The aversion to risk was perhaps the single greatest discrepancy between the CIA and the Pentagon. The CIA was about taking chances. Its officers and operators were trained to act as the president's hidden hand. Covert action operations are meant to remain forever hidden from public scrutiny. In the event one becomes known, plausible deniability becomes the goal. At the opposite end of the spectrum is the U.S. military, an organization that follows strict procedures and protocols. Its classified and clandestine operations might be kept secret for a period of time, but eventually they are meant to be revealed. One of the biggest obstacles I faced in Korea, says Singlob, was the Pentagon's worry that these paramilitary units might be captured, broken by physical and psychological torture, and turned against us for propaganda purposes. Unlike CIA officers, the Pentagon's soldiers are not explicitly trained how to lie. Jack and CCRAC's guiding principles were, however, ultimately the same. Each organization was born of the OSS, with foundations in guerrilla warfare. A manual entitled Psy War 040 CIA was given to both sets of operators to study and learn from. Hit and run, these are guerrilla's tactics, its authors explained. Primary objective, the killing and capture of personnel sniping and demolitions. Initiative and aggressiveness tempered by calm judgment will be encouraged. Avoid trying to win the war by yourself. Colonel Douglas C. Dillard, a 26-year-old infantry officer from Georgia, was put in charge of delivery and resupply of these joint CIA Army airborne operations, codenamed Aviary. Their missions were kept classified until 2009. Although some took place early in the Korean War, the scale of operations rose dramatically starting in February of 1952. 
One of Aviary's first missions ended in disaster, Colonel Diller recalled in 2009. It was the winter of 1952, a period of time known as the Second Korean Winter, now 20 months into the war. A dismal lull had settled over the battlefield, with fighting diminished to violent, small-unit clashes and struggles over key outpost positions along the front lines of Korea's hilly landscape. Hundreds of Americans had been captured and were being kept under brutal conditions inside POW camps. The joint CIA-Army mission on the night of February 18, 1952, was designed to airdrop paramilitary operators who would gather reconnaissance on a POW camp and then exfiltrate by ground. The missions were dangerous. Territory above the 38th parallel was notoriously inhospitable. Unlike with OSS Jedberg airdrops into France, there'd be a very limited greeting party on the ground, maybe one or two anti-communist partisan agents. Radio communication did not exist in the outer reaches of this landscape, so agents were dropped in with homing pigeons strapped to their legs. This was often their only means of communicating with their CIA and U.S. Army handlers in the South, a single homing pigeon to let the handler know they'd made it safely in. The rate of return was incredibly low, recalls CIA historian John P. Finnegan. New tradecraft techniques were constantly being developed and tested. On this mission, the covert action operators wore enemy uniforms and carried Chinese-made weapons. They could impersonate enemy patrols and, if necessary, shoot their way back to UN lines, Dillard explained. But there was a much bigger problem facing the unit. One everyone knew about and few wanted to discuss, says Singlob. How do you trust that the indigenous agents you are paying will not try and kill you. A traitor in the ranks almost certainly meant death. It was the early morning hours of February 19, 1952, and Air Force Captain Lawrence E. Berger was piloting a C-47 south of Wonsan, North Korea. There were two missions on deck, both covert action operations, both parachute infiltrations of American, Korean, and Chinese national paramilitary teams behind enemy lines. Given the limits on usable aircraft, it was common to run more than one mission per flight. Master Sergeant Davis T. Harrison stood in the door with the four anti-communist Chinese agents he was running, preparing them for a static line jump. The partisans had been culled from a refugee camp down south, and trained for action by CIA paramilitary officers. They all stood in the doorway, ready to jump. Three of the Chinese guerrilla fighters were big. One was small. Each man stood the proper distance from the next, ripcords attached to the static line. It was best to have the smallest man jump first, Sergeant Harrison later told a military investigation board. But this particular man made such a fuss about jumping out last, and the situation gave Harrison pause. But Harrison didn't speak Chinese, and the partisan agent didn't speak English, an ongoing problem with covert operations inside Jack. The general rule in these kinds of intense moments was to be flexible. Think fast. Seated inside the aircraft, Sergeant Harrison observed Private First Class Dean H. Crabb, his fellow covert action operator. Crabb was seated next to the four anti-communist guerrilla fighters working under his authority. The team would be making the next jump even deeper behind enemy lines, almost 100 miles north of what was about to be the first airdrop. It was 1.45 a.m., pitch dark outside and well below zero. Sergeant Harrison scanned the ground down below for a sign. 
the way signaling worked out there was that when anti-communist partisans on the ground heard the airplane approach, they would ignite small fires inside metal buckets to briefly illuminate the drop zone. Harrison stared down into the darkness below. The snow was fierce. There were big winds, freezing temperatures, and the threat of anti-aircraft fire from enemy forces on the ground. At last, he spotted a faint cluster of signal fires. Harrison alerted the pilot, Captain Berger. The mission was now a go. Captain Berger banked the aircraft and made a wide circle, lowering his altitude as the CIA's aviary team prepared to jump. The first Chinese partisan moved to the door. Harrison gave the rebel fighter the go-ahead to jump and watched as the man leapt out into the air. The second man quickly jumped. When the third man hesitated, Harrison knew intuitively that something was terribly wrong. Instead of jumping, the man reached into his pocket and pulled out a grenade. He yanked the pin, rolled it into the seating area of the aircraft, and leapt out into the night air. Davis T. Harrison was instantly blown out of the aircraft. Assistant Jump Master Corporal George Tatarakis was also jettisoned from the burning plane. Dean Crabb and his team of four Chinese partisans were killed instantly by shrapnel and blast. Captain Berger struggled with the crippled aircraft, ordering his six-man crew to bail out while he worked to keep the aircraft steady. The men, later identified as Rodin, Lair, King, Dick, and Haley, somehow managed to bail out. Captain Berger stayed at the controls of the airplane until it crashed into a mountain range below. Master Sergeant Davis Harrison and Corporal George Tatarakis, both wearing parachutes, pulled their ripcords before hitting the ground. Both landed safely, as did five members of the crew. Everyone but Harrison was captured by the North Korean Army. Harrison evaded capture for 24 hours, sneaking into a house and asking for help. The family offered him sanctuary, but while he was sleeping, notified the North Korean Army, which came and took Harrison away. Each of the covert action operators and the air crew died or were killed in POW camps in the north. Harrison's body was repatriated after the war. The mission was but one of dozens of disastrous operations, all kept classified for decades, the great majority of which amounted to a tragic intelligence failure. Thousands of anti-communist foreign fighters and their American handlers were dropped into North Korea, never to return. These were suicide missions, concluded Peter Seichel, CIA station chief in Hong Kong. Many of the operatives recruited by the Office of Policy Coordination from refugee camps turned out to be double agents. If program organizers Frank Wisner, Hans Toft, and Albert Haney were naive to the double cross in the beginning, declassified documents make clear that as early as eight months into the war, they understood what was going on. Their intelligence was thin, spurious or feigned. But the trio continued winging it, sending volunteer operators to their graves. They reported mission success instead of abject failure. The result was the loss of what the CIA now concedes amounted to hundreds, perhaps thousands, of lives. At the Pentagon, General McClure and Colonel Volkman blew the whistle internally but the damage could, of course, not be undone. The experience transformed McClure's reservations into outright suspicions about the CIA's motives, wrote Alfred Paddock. Hans Toft was replaced in Korea by career CIA officer John L. Hart. Upon reviewing classified documents that Toft kept in his office, Hart became outraged and notified CIA Director Walter Bedell Smith. 
the results of our investigation surpassed our most pessimistic expectations, he later explained. Countless intelligence reports merely fabricated by people living in Seoul. Bedell Smith sent his deputy, Loftus Becker, to Seoul to tell the CIA's John Hart that the agency could not afford a scandal. With its reputation not yet established, Becker told Hart the CIA simply could not admit to other branches of government, least of all to the highly competitive U.S. military intelligence services, its inability to collect intelligence on North Korea. Hart's reports were classified. So were Operation Aviary's catastrophic losses. Devastated by the deception, Loftus Becker resigned. The North Korean covert action operations would remain a secret failure for decades. Haney, Toft, and Wisner moved on to a new covert action operation, this time in Guatemala. The CIA had failed in Korea because it entered the game too late and had no reliable network of agents on the ground. In Guatemala, the plan was to be preemptive, fix things before they happened. This doctrine would become known as regime change. General McClure wrote to his commander, General Charles Bolte, with his analysis of the situation. I would take the opportunity to bring you up to date on the Army-CIA relationship, McClure explained. In recent conferences at CIA, I have heard it said, since we are now a fourth service, many of the activities for which the Army was planning should be transferred to CIA, including the command of military forces designed for guerrilla warfare in time of war. Needless to say, I am very unhappy about it, both because I question the ability of CIA, and second, because I have never believed the Joint Chiefs intended to abrogate their responsibilities for the active command of military operations in time of war. At the CIA, Walter Bedell Smith was also concerned. In a letter to Ludwig Lee Montague, his advisor on the National Security Council staff, Smith expressed fear that his covert action deputies, Alan Dulles and Frank Wisner, could lead the CIA into some ill-conceived and disastrous misadventure. But the horse was already out of the barn. The CIA's covert action operation budget had expanded to become three times the size of the agency's budgets for intelligence and espionage combined. It was a catch-22. The CIA needed to train and equip partisans in order to form a guerrilla warfare corps on the ground. This underground army was a necessary component in supplying the CIA with intelligence that would keep its agents from being killed. But in reality, the amount of intelligence that could be garnered from inside a totalitarian state like North Korea was close to nil. The possibility of recruiting and running any such sources was as improbable as placing resident spies on the planet Mars, lamented former OSS officer Richard Helms, Frank Wisner's deputy and a future director of Central Intelligence. Bedell Smith considered curtailing the CIA's covert action operations. Too many paramilitary operations pose a distinct danger to CIA as an intelligence agency, he told his staff. Something had to change, or, he feared, the covert action operational tail will wag the intelligence dog. But Bedell Smith was fiercely loyal to the agency that he was in charge of, and in a letter to the National Security Council on the subject of covert action, he conveyed a far less dramatic position. At certain times in the past, we have been importuned by General McClure's people to provide them with detailed information concerning guerrilla groups of which we may have some knowledge, he wrote. 
We have consistently declined to furnish this information to General McClure because the information requested impinges directly upon secret operations in which we are currently engaged and for which, at this time, we are solely responsible. In his summary, Bedell Smith played the secrecy card. In a CIA analysis of its Korean War operations, kept classified for 50 years, the agency made it clear that it understood its paramilitary operations to be not only ineffective but probably morally reprehensible in the number of lives lost. The aviary missions were doomed from the start, it concluded. The CIA had no reliable way to discern its enemies from its friends. The amount of time and treasure expended was enormously disproportionate to that which was gained. Jack's classified missions in Korea were water under the bridge. By the end of the war, the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination had built an organization capable of executing covert action on a worldwide scale. An untold number of covert action operations would now begin. While Jack and Seacrack were running dangerous black operations behind enemy lines, a traditional war was also being fought by U.S. Army soldiers on the ground. The oft-cited example of this kind of warfare was demonstrated in the trenches of World War I. Korea had become a war of attrition, a military strategy whereby each side wears down the other side through continuous, relentless loss, grinding down the enemy's morale. Like stags fighting with their horns locked, neither side could win. The end foreseen becomes not victory, but collapse. One of the foot soldiers fighting the Korean War of Attrition was Billy Waugh now a 21-year-old platoon sergeant with the 187th Airborne Regimental Combat Team. He'd earned his wings with the 82nd Airborne, just as he said he would. With his Browning Bar rifle over his shoulder and his army boots laced up tight, Waugh remembers the demoralizing monotony he felt marching across the frozen land bored out of his mind. I wanted action, I wanted to fight, and I wanted America to win the war. But none of this was happening in his infantry platoon. The war in Korea was not the kind Billy Waugh envisioned for himself. He wanted to win a glorious victory like the one earned against Germany and Japan. In Korea, the first casualty of war Waugh remembers seeing was a half-frozen civilian lying face up, dead, along the side of the road. We'd march up over one hill with great expectations of meeting the enemy and finally engaging in fierce combat, he remembers. Instead, from the top of one hill, we'd look down across a treeless landscape and all we'd see was the next hill. It was trench warfare, the worst, most baseless form of combat. War by grinding down. I wanted to see combat, to be brave under fire. Soon, Waugh would have his wish. During a chance encounter on a train, he'd learn about secret wars being conducted by the U.S. government as covert operations behind enemy lines in what would become known as denied areas. Billy Waugh would spend the next seven decades until at least 2011, engaged in or training for direct action, kill or be killed, covert action operations against America's enemies around the globe. He would train and equip guerrilla fighters, lead hit-and-run ambushes, conduct sabotage against enemy infrastructure, and assassinate. Trudging across Korea's stripped and frozen earth, he foresaw none of this. All he knew was that General Sherman seemed about right. The glory of war was moonshine. War, at least this wretched war of attrition in Korea, was hell. 
Chapter 4 Special Forces In 1953, Billy Waugh was transferred to a U.S. military base in Augsburg, Germany. Before he left, he saved up his army money and bought himself a car, a sharp-looking 1949 Chevrolet four-door sedan. It was his first car, and he adored it. When he received orders to travel to Germany, he arranged to have it shipped across the Atlantic so he could drive it around on the Autobahn. A few weeks after he arrived in country, his Chevy arrived. The army notified him to say that his automobile was in the port city of Bremerhaven, 475 miles away. On the train ride there, he noticed two U.S. Army sergeants wearing unusual patches with a parachute and aircraft on their shoulders. Why are you wearing that patch? Waugh asked. The men said that they were part of a new outfit in Bad Tolts. Where the hell is Bad Tolts? he asked. They said that it was about 80 miles southeast of the U.S. military base in Augsburg. What do you do there? Waugh asked. They couldn't tell him, they said. Now they really had Waugh's attention. Do you have any vacancies? Waugh asked. We need MOS triple ones, one of the men said. Platoon sergeants. Waugh pointed to his own shoulder, to a combat infantry badge indicating that he was MOS 111 eligible. The mysterious men gave him contact information. I got my car, hightailed it back to Augsburg, and asked for a 1049 request for transfer. Within a week, I was transferred, badge and baggage, to Bod Tolts. I signed in at headquarters, went straight to the snack bar, and introduced myself to the six guys who were there, remembers Waugh. Welcome to the 10th Special Forces, one of them said. The group was a classified U.S. Army program that trained soldiers for unconventional warfare. The first of its kind. Just four months old, it had been named the 10th Special Forces so as to deceive the Soviets into thinking there were nine other Special Forces units ready to engage in sabotage, subversion, and other forms of guerrilla warfare. Waugh remembers feeling awestruck. I'd found my true home. If the U.S. Army went into the Korean War with no formal special operations capabilities, it came out with a plan for an unconventional warfare unit for use in future wars. Outraged over its stalemate with the CIA regarding who controlled covert operations in Korea, General McClure went directly to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, determined to create for the Army a special forces capability like no other in the world. But to achieve success, said McClure, the organization should start modest and austere. McClure knew that unconventional warfare was frowned upon by most generals in the Defense Department. He didn't want to jeopardize the potential for success. In its simplest terms, the Army's vision for unconventional warfare was to support resistance movements in foreign lands, local guerrilla forces that shared America's pro-Western, anti-communist goals. Any resistance movement that the U.S. Army would engage with would likely already be militarized and semi-organized. But to say that unconventional warfare could ever be defined in simple terms was wishful thinking. Resistance movements were notoriously turbulent, almost always led by charismatic leaders with big personalities, some noble, others corrupt. For the U.S. Army to find success in training and equipping these foreign fighters, its special forces operators would have to be flexible, patient, and extremely disciplined. They'd have to be self-reliant, quick-thinking warriors capable of operating in openly hostile territory without the support of conventional military forces close by. In the winter of 1952, General McClure secured the necessary blessing of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
The 10th Special Forces Group would be a small and secret unit. Its soldiers would become known as quiet professionals. Finding the right volunteers was a priority. McClure had his adjutant general prepare a roster of ex-OSS officers with commando, ranger, and guerrilla warfare backgrounds. He sent one of his officers to visit with retired General William Donovan at Donovan's law office in New York City. Donovan shared with McClure his personal files, containing the names and addresses of more than 3,900 former soldiers who'd served in the OSS during the war. The Army sent out queries to hundreds of these individuals, some active duty service members, others retired, to see if they were interested in volunteering for the clandestine unit. Volunteers had to be at least 21 years old, airborne qualified or willing to become so, and able to pass a series of physical and psychological tests. Enlisted men accepted into special forces had to commit to training in one or more of five specialty areas, operations and intelligence, engineering, weaponry, communications, and medical aid. On June 19, 1952, the Army activated its first unconventional warfare unit at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, consisting of one officer, one warrant officer, and seven enlisted men. The group's first commander was OSS Jedburgh, Colonel Aaron Bank. By the end of the month, 122 soldiers of all ranks were present for duty. In November of the following year, the 10th Special Forces Group, Airborne, received overseas orders and sailed for Europe. They arrived at Bremerhaven and then traveled by train to Bad Tolz. Their facility was a former Nazi training facility for the Waffen-SS. The group's original mission was to conduct unconventional warfare behind enemy lines in the event of a Soviet invasion of Europe, modeled after what the OSS Jedbergs had accomplished in France. These small, 12-man units were called A-detachments, or A-teams. Each was made up of two officers and ten non-commissioned officers, or NCOs. Every individual on the team had to pass months of training and a series of grueling tests to become Special Forces qualified and wear the Green Beret. Each A-team would be capable of infiltrating a target by air, land, or sea, and exfiltrating stealthily. Each team, led by a captain, had members trained in weapons, demolition and engineering, medical, communications, and operations and intelligence. They would build their own bases, conduct their own perimeter defense, and be able to operate in hostile territory for an indefinite period of time. Everyone on the team was schooled in at least one foreign language. The members of this new group called Special Forces prided themselves on being a certain breed of soldier with distinct temperaments and special abilities. Hard-bitten troopers who were willing to take calculated risks and face challenges that conventional units need never be concerned with, said Bank. Men born of an almost inhuman ability to absorb any stressful situation and carry on into battle without letting mental concerns or emotions get in the way. Operators needed to be extremely competitive, self-reliant, stress-resistant, and stoic to the point of arrogant. Major General Edward Partain, an early member of Special Forces, summed it up this way. In the early 50s, special forces groups were not a recognized part of the army. They were seen as outsiders, great warriors, but they could not live comfortably within the peacetime regimental system. You had people of the sort that you wished you could deep freeze on the last battlefield and thaw out on the next battlefield of the next war. It was a rough group. Billy Waugh recalls Special Forces operators being called snake eaters, miscreants, and rogues, 
by conventional officers in starched shirts. Many of those recruited for special forces in the early 1950s were soldiers who fought in World War II for foreign armies in foreign countries, men like Larry Thorne. Larry Thorne, christened Lori Torney in Finland, stands out as a special forces legend, fearless, driven, and recklessly daring. He would have been at home with the Greeks who infiltrated Troy inside a wooden horse, said James Goodby, former U.S. ambassador to Finland. The doomed protagonist in the mold of ancient Greek heroes. Thorne began his career as a captain in the Finnish Army Reserves, where he trained Army ski troops. When the Soviet Union invaded Finland in November 1939, Torne served as unit commander. Under arduous conditions and in sub-zero temperatures, Torne and his unit were infiltrated behind enemy lines, where they engaged in hit-and-run operations on skis against Russian troops. The Red Army had more than three times as many soldiers as the Finns, and what should have been clear Russian victories instead went to Torne's unit. In reaction to Thorne's brave, devastating raids behind Soviet lines, the Red Army placed a price on his head, dead or alive, reputedly the only Finnish soldier so singled out for bounty, says his biographer, J. Michael Cleverly. For his leadership and bravery, Torne was awarded the Knight of the Mannerheim Cross, the country's highest commendation for valor, and the equivalent of the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor. Finland's relations with the Soviet Union changed several times during the war, and when the country's leaders turned to Nazi Germany for military aid, Torne traveled to Austria for seven weeks of training with the Waffen SS. He returned to Finland as a Finnish officer and was also recognized as a German Untersturmführer. In 1943, he commanded a guerrilla warfare unit called Detachment Torne. This 70-man anti-Soviet strike force was a Finnish Waffen-SS battalion. As its commander, Lori Torne wore a Nazi uniform and was awarded the Iron Cross. After the war ended, he was arrested and charged with treason. Found guilty and sentenced to six years, he was incarcerated in Finland's notorious Turku prison. But the indomitable Lori Torne escaped from prison three times until he was transferred to Rihimaki prison on a small island north of Helsinki. In December 1948, he was pardoned by Finnish President Juho Pasakivi and released. But when the threat of additional war crimes charges resurfaced, Torne assumed the identity of a Finnish merchant sailor and fled to Venezuela under the alias Eno Morski. From Venezuela, he secured passage on a freighter headed to the United States. Just a few miles out from the shores of Mobile, Alabama, Torna leapt overboard and swam to shore in a classic example of clandestine infiltration into a foreign target. A fugitive in the United States, he made his way to New York City, changed his name to Larry Thorne, and worked as a carpenter in Brooklyn and Connecticut. It did not take long for the consummate warfighter to become restless and bored. In 1951, he sought out William Donovan, the former director of the OSS, and asked for his help joining an American unconventional warfare unit. Donovan schooled Thorne on the newly instated Lodge-Philbin Act, which Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr. had been instrumental in getting passed. It allowed foreigners to join the U.S. military and earn citizenship if they served honorably for the United States for at least five years. Larry Thorne breezed through U.S. Army basic training and was singled out as a prime candidate for the 10th Special Forces Group. 
sent to Bad Tolts, he became an invaluable part of the unit. Thorne is one of the most devoted and conscientious officers I have known, wrote his commander, an aggressive officer who is at his best in a situation which demands physical exertion, direct action, and forceful leadership. In addition to his physical prowess and irregular warfare skill set, he spoke English, German, Estonian, Swedish, Norwegian, and of course Finnish. Working alongside Larry Thorne, Billy Waugh was amazed by the soldier's breadth of talent, his discipline, stamina, and confidence. At Bad Tolts, Thorne was participating in a third military command. He'd fought for the Finns, the Nazis, and now the United States. He was what we call a total oneer, explains Waugh. Having engaged in clandestine ops for several nations, in just about every environment known to man, he could adapt to stressful situations anywhere in the world. Mostly, he preferred going at it alone. In Bad Tolts, Larry Thorne was made captain and became the quintessential Green Beret. He was exactly what the special forces were looking for in a warfighter. One example of Thorne's skill and prowess involved the successful completion of a perilous mission in Iran. In 1957, a U.S. Army C-130 transport plane filled with classified military equipment crashed somewhere in the mountains of northern Iran in unchartered territory. The rescue operation called for locating the crash site, getting a team in there, recovering the bodies and the classified equipment, and getting out undetected. Three previously orchestrated attempts had all failed when Captain Larry Thorne volunteered for the job. Thorne parachuted into Iran with a 12-man team of Green Berets. The unit made their way up a 14,000-foot peak, recovered all the bodies and the equipment, then exfiltrated undetected by the Iranians. Bad Tolts was not for everyone but for the disciplined nonconformists who embraced unconventional warfare, it was home. Countless foreign languages could be heard spoken in the coffee shop and around the team rooms. Besides European languages, French, Polish, Czech, one heard Turkish, Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, and Pashto. The concept of training guerrilla fighters in other countries was at the core of the new U.S. Army Special Forces capability. Partnership with special units of foreign armies was a primary goal. In service of this mission, Special Forces operators trained with teams in Norway, Germany, Spain, Italy, Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. A team led by Major Joseph Callahan traveled to Jordan to establish the first airborne school for the Jordanian army at the behest of King Hussein. A team led by Steve Snowden traveled to Turkey to train what would become known as the Turkish Special Forces. Another group went to Saudi Arabia and trained 350 officers and non-commissioned officers in a guerrilla force supported by King Faisal. Four teams traveled to Iran to train the Iranian special forces in mountain warfare. Another team trained Kurdish tribesmen in the mountains of Iran. One team went to Pakistan, where they trained with their special warfare warriors in desert warfare. The 10th Special Forces Group remained a closely guarded secret until 1955, when the New York Times published a cryptic article about the men, describing them as a liberation force designed to fight behind enemy lines. A photograph showed members of the group wearing their green berets, their faces blackened out to keep their identities concealed. The U.S. Army Special Forces began to grow. Hundreds, then thousands of unconventional American warriors volunteered to join this elite group. They worked tirelessly, training and equipping guerrilla fighters around the globe so as to keep the threat of Soviet expansion in check. 
U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers would eventually fight secret wars alongside many of the foreign fighters they trained. Other times, they would find themselves fighting against them. Chapter 5 Ruin and Rule in Guatemala On the wild night of June 16, 1954, a charismatic 26-year-old Argentine doctor named Ernesto Che Guevara stood staring out the window of an apartment in Guatemala City, listening to machine gun fire and watching a fighter-bomber aircraft fire on civilians below. He sat down to pen a letter to his mother, a wealthy aristocrat whom he adored. He felt a rush watching people die for a cause he confided to her. Even the light aircraft bombings have their grandeur, the sound of its machine gun and the light machine guns that fired back at it leave me with the magic sensation of vulnerability. At the time, the young doctor had no idea that the jet fighter he observed was being flown by an American-trained mercenary pilot who was part of a covert action operation for the CIA. The moment transformed him, he later said. Like an inciting incident in a Shakespearean tragedy, the attack on Guatemala City catalyzed Che Guevara into action. Many men dream of leading a revolution, but Che Guevara would actually do it. His actions put him directly in the crosshairs of three U.S. presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. He would eventually be assassinated by CIA-trained fighters in the mountains of Bolivia in 1967. Che Guevara had come to Guatemala to study medicine amid social revolution. When he first arrived, the country was in the throes of civil unrest. Guatemala, located just south of Mexico in Central America, had been plagued by violence and social upheaval since 1944, when university professor José Aravalo became the country's first democratically elected president. For the first time in its history, Guatemala got a constitution, an elected representative body, and a Supreme Court, but the violence was constant. President Aravalo survived 25 coup and assassination attempts in his six years in office. From the perspective of the White House, political instability of this magnitude made Guatemala a prime target for Soviet meddling, and in 1950, the U.S. State Department sent its top diplomat, George Keenan, to investigate. After touring Latin America, Keenan took a hard-line view that Moscow was indeed making ominous inroads in the Western Hemisphere. Here, as elsewhere, Keenan wrote in a secret report for the Secretary of State, the inner core of the Soviet communist leadership is fanatical, disciplined, industrious, and armed with a series of organizational techniques which are absolutely first-rate. In all likelihood, Keenan warned, Moscow's first conquest in Latin America would be Guatemala, which it could then use as a beachhead to launch a takeover of the Americas. Keenan advised the Secretary of State that communist influence in the Western Hemisphere had to be curtailed at any cost. Diplomacy was unlikely to work, and military intervention was not plausible, he wrote, which left covert action as the third and best option. Now this gets us into dangerous and difficult waters, where we must proceed with utmost caution advised the man who first proposed that the CIA develop a guerrilla warfare corps. What choice was there? From Albania to Poland, seven governments in Eastern Europe were now being ruled by Stalinists, leaders who'd been emplaced by rigged elections and who maintained power through a devious partnership with Moscow's iron-fisted state security services. 
Moscow's movement toward Latin America forecast only disaster. Keenan's report was reviewed by the President's National Security Council, whose members unanimously agreed. Covert action was the best way forward. The following year, in March 1951, a liberal Democrat named Jacobo Arbenz, son of a Swiss-German father and a Guatemalan mother, was elected president. In his inaugural address, Arbenz promised to move Guatemala from a backward country with a predominantly feudal economy into a modern capitalist state. The way he intended to do this, he said, was by limiting influence by foreign corporations. Guatemala was a poor nation with an agrarian-based economy. Two percent of the population owns 72 percent of the land. The largest landowner, also one of the country's largest employers, was the American-owned United Fruit Company, a banana farming concern. When President Arbenz instituted sweeping reforms in farm labor and called for the expropriation and redistribution of land, including 234,000 acres owned by United Fruit, President Truman's National Security Council took the position that these anti-American moves were being engineered by Moscow. The time had come for the hidden hand of the United States to intervene. It is essential to our security that we fight fire with fire, Keenan observed. President Truman created a powerful new advisory committee to determine the desirability and feasibility of covert action operations. Called the Psychological Strategy Board, PSB, it included the Director of Central Intelligence, the Undersecretary of State, and the Deputy Secretary of Defense, with a representative of the Joint Chiefs of Staff acting as Principal Military Advisor. The informal structure of the PSB allowed for problem-solving to occur outside the scope of normal bureaucratic channels, insulating the president from potential backlash through plausible deniability. The working group should shy away from any thought of a charter which would require formal departmental concurrence, suggested Frank Wisner, then CIA Deputy Director of Plans, in an early staff meeting. An agreement was reached to develop a paper which would be informally accepted by the board as indicating the general lines which we would probably follow. In the case of Wisner, who was simultaneously in charge of JAC operations in Korea, the construct of plausible deniability insulated him personally from consequence, as the historical record makes clear. Whether Wisner was aware of his outsized incompetence during this fateful time, willfully ignorant of it, or mentally ill, remains the subject of debate. What is clear is that the goal of the PSB was not only to devise and plan covert operations, but to manipulate the public's perception of these hidden hand events. Our job is to influence the minds and wills of other people, board members agreed, not as in word warfare, but through paramilitary actions that had real-world consequences. We help shape events to include all elements of pressure and persuasion, PSB Director Gordon Gray told the President. The PSB's plan for Guatemala was to stage a coup d'etat against President Arbenz and overthrow him using a CIA-trained guerrilla fighting force. The Office of Policy Coordination was in charge, as in Korea. The man chosen by the CIA to lead the mutiny and be installed as Guatemala's new pro-American president was a former Guatemalan military officer living in exile in Honduras, Carlos Castillo Armas. He was corrupt, right-wing, and militaristic, 
but the Office of Policy Coordination was willing to work with him because he had a decent-sized guerrilla force loyal to him, fighters who could be trained and equipped by CIA paramilitary officers with relative ease. In January 1952, CIA headquarters began drafting its first known assassination list, a compilation of individuals to eliminate immediately under the agency's Title 50 Covert Action Authority. This list was followed by at least two additional kill lists, one titled Guatemalan Communist Personnel to be disposed of during military operations of Caligaris, the code name for Carlos Castillo Ramas, and the other under the heading Selection of Individuals for Disposal by Junta Group. The targets, or disposees, would be neutralized under a construct called executive action. This euphemism, adopted by numerous future U.S. presidents, remains in effect as of 2019. Whether President Truman was made aware of the assassination campaign remains a mystery. But the very next month, the subject of Soviet assassination capabilities was discussed by Gordon Gray in a top-secret report to the president. Throughout the world, Gray wrote, the Kremlin has built up networks of agents who would move at the word of command to carry out an assassination or foment a civil war a subtle suggestion that the PSB plans for assassination were but a necessary means of fighting fire with fire. Assembling a list of individuals for assassination was a flawed and haphazard process. CIA officers first worked from a 1949 Guatemalan army list of communists, augmented by information from the Directorate of Intelligence as it came in. Memos made public in 1997 show that the list included top-flight communists whom the new government would desire to eliminate immediately in the event of a successful anti-communist coup, but quickly grew to include other Guatemalans. Clandestine service officers were queried to help decide who else should be included on a final list of disposees, with one employee assigned the job of quality control to verify the list and recommend any additions or deletions. The assassination list was sent to Carlos Castillo Armas for input. The illegitimate son of a farmer, Armas had spent much of his life engaged in guerrilla warfare. From 1948 to 1949, he'd served as the director of Guatemala's military academy. By 1952, he'd been involved in two previous coup d'etat in Guatemala. He was a wanted man in his own country, and his list of enemies was long. In September 1952, Armas added as many as 58 names to the CIA's assassination list things quickly got more complicated. That same month, in the Dominican Republic, the strongman Generalismo Rafael Trujillo, called the cruelest dictator in the Americas, got word of the CIA's assassination list and wanted in. Trujillo made a deal with Carlos Castillo Armas. In exchange for the killing of four Santo Dominicans at present residing in Guatemala, he offered Armas his material support. Castillo Armas readily agreed, says CIA staff historian Gerald Haynes. In addition to requesting that certain of his enemies be targeted and killed by the CIA, Trujillo offered to send his own assassins to participate in the action, special assassination squads that were already trained. In a declassified agency memorandum, these death squads were referred to as Trujillo's trained pistoleros and as K, presumably for kill, groups. But after considerable debate, says Haynes, the idea was vetoed by the State Department. Still, 
Armas continued to make side deals of his own, and the CIA learned that Armas intended to make maximum use of the K-groups and would dispatch Nicaraguan, Honduran, and Salvadorian soldiers in civilian clothes to infiltrate Guatemala and assassinate unnamed communist leaders loyal to Armas. In Guatemala City, a local asset provided his CIA handler with a hit list with the location of the homes and offices of all targets that had already been drawn up. Haynes says records of what happened next were destroyed or lost. The CIA did not create the Latin American propensity for assassination. Long before the Central Intelligence Agency existed, Targeted killing was a well-established political tool throughout the region. These were the rules of the game for authoritarian regimes that ruled by force and corruption, not laws. In 1949, President Arbenz himself had benefited from the assassination of his political rival, Francisco Javier Arana. Arbenz had been one of only six men present when Arana, chief of the country's armed forces, was shot in broad daylight during an altercation on the Puente de la Gloria outside Guatemala City. As president, Arbenz did little to solve the extrajudicial killing he'd personally witnessed. There was no investigation of the murder, and his rivals' assassins were never apprehended. As of 2019, the killing remains a mystery. As the CIA worked on its paramilitary operations and assassination plans, the President's Psychological Strategy Board oversaw a robust psychological warfare campaign intended to influence the minds and wills of the people to wage a nerve war against individuals, according to a declassified memo. The idea was to instill fear and paranoia in a core group of military officials close to Arbenz, so they might become turncoats and participate in a mass defection of the Guatemalan army. As the plans moved forward, the U.S. presidency changed hands. In January 1953, Dwight D. Eisenhower became the 34th President of the United States, and the PSB briefed the new Commander-in-Chief on its covert action operations. Cold War concerns convinced President Eisenhower to order the removal of the democratically elected leader by force, according to Haynes. Starting on April 13, 1953, Top Guatemalan communists received death notice cards, some for as many as 30 consecutive days, the contents of which remain classified. Others received physical objects courtesy of the CIA, including small wooden coffins, hangman's nooses, and toy bombs. Communist leaders came home from work or woke up in the morning to find graffiti painted on the exterior walls of their homes. Here lives a spy, one message read. Another threatened, you have only five days. The operation was gaining momentum. Declassified documents illustrate how quickly CIA officials at the highest level got on board with more advanced assassination or liquidation plans. J.C. King, CIA chief of the Western Hemisphere Division, learned of the hit list and on August 28, 1953, suggested possibly assassinating key Guatemalan military officers if they refuse to be converted to the rebel cause. The following month, King sent a memo to CIA Director Alan Dulles stating his support for neutralizing President Arbenz. To the CIA, assassination was an objective, an action to be carried out with the precision and detachment of a military operation. 
It was during this period that the CIA assembled its first known how-to instruction booklet on assassination as an instrument of foreign policy, as a political tool, an extreme measure not normally used in clandestine operations. Titled A Study of Assassination, the manual was organized into sections including planning, techniques, and classifications. The ideal assassin worked alone, always mindful of the fact that no assassination instructions should ever be written or recorded. He or she would almost always report to just one person, with this same individual overseeing their infiltration to and exfiltration from the target area. In addition to having all the qualities of a clandestine service agent, an assassin would have to be determined, courageous, intelligent, resourceful, and physically active. Knowledge of a variety of weapons, including knives, firearms, grenades, and small bombs, was imperative for success. It is possible to kill a man with the bare hands, but very few are skilled enough to do it well, the CIA posited. A human being may be killed in many ways, but sureness is often overlooked by those who may be emotionally unstrung by the seriousness of the act they intend to commit. In a section entitled Justification, the CIA warned its would-be assassins of the dark psychological territory into which they would be heading. Murder is not morally justifiable, and... Assassination can seldom be employed with a clear conscience. Persons who are morally squeamish should not attempt it. The unvarnished truth about assassination was that while some operations involved the objective detachment of a sniper rifle, a pistol, or a lethal dose of poison, an assassin must always be ready to kill his target mano a mano. For that, he had to be willing to make use of any real-world object that might be lying around. Anything hard, heavy, and handy will suffice, counseled the CIA. A hammer or axe, fire poker or lampstand. Pushing a target off a bridge, down an elevator shaft, or out an open window was a wise course of action. The assassin could play horrified witness if questioned by police. Staged car accidents were not recommended because a lengthy investigation almost always ensued. But if an assassin could drug his target and push the man and his vehicle off a high point or into deep water, the tactic could be considered. If the target was an alcoholic, getting the man drunk and injecting him with a lethal dose of morphine before he passed out was always a viable option. Avoid explosives and demolition charges, assassins were told. They were unreliable and prone to accidents. Often, when used as a booby trap with a time delay, these kinds of devices wound up killing the wrong man. Most of all, the assassin had to accept that he was not judge, jury, or hangman. Assassination of persons responsible for atrocities or reprisals may be regarded as just punishment, the authors forewarned. But to think of it as retribution for an offense was not what covert action was about. To kill a specific individual under Title 50 authority of the U.S. Code was about prevention, not revenge. Killing a political leader whose burgeoning career is a clear and present danger to the cause of freedom may be held necessary, the authors of the CIA's assassination manual made clear. On September 11, 1953, the CIA submitted its General Plan of Action for Guatemala, codenamed Operation Success, PB Success. President Eisenhower signed off on the operation, approving a $2.7 million budget for psychological warfare and political action, as well as subversion, to be conducted by the CIA. 
On December 23, 1953, the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination opened a classified forward operating base in Miami, Florida, where covert operations in Guatemala would be run. All elements of covert action had code names, people, places, operations, and locations. The PB Success Headquarters building, codenamed Lincoln, was located about 10 miles from Miami on the second floor of a shabby two-story structure in the corner of Opalaca Airport, only ever to be referred to as Building 67. Effective this date, all addressee stations will constitute component elements of PB Success Regional Command, with Project Headquarters at Lincoln under Jerome Dunbar, Alan Dulles wrote. Jerome Dunbar was the code name for retired Colonel Albert Haney, former CIA station chief in Seoul. Haney, Frank Wisner, and Hans Toft had run the ill-fated Jack missions in Korea. The CIA reached an agreement with rebel groups in Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador to train and equip its guerrilla fighting forces inside these neighboring countries' borders. In these secret paramilitary training camps deep in the jungle, the CIA trained and armed local commandos to act as the fighting brigade for Castillo Armas. Come D-Day, this paramilitary army of foreign fighters would make an amphibious beach landing and carry out the CIA's coup d'etat in the style of the Normandy invasion. Declassified documents reveal that at least 1,725 foreign fighters were trained by the CIA, with another 2,500 persons of lesser caliber and faith committed to joining the fighting force if called upon. On January 5, 1954, Albert Haney requested a final list on the liquidation of personnel. The following week, Lincoln requisitioned 20 suppressors for 20 22 caliber rifles, which were sent from CIA headquarters. A small group of key leaders were then chosen for the assassination program. On January 13th, cables were sent discussing training protocols for these assassination specialists. On April 17, 1954, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, the CIA director's brother, gave PB Success the full green light. The following month, perhaps sensing his end was near, President Arbenz offered to meet with President Eisenhower to reduce tensions between the two countries. But it was too late. The CIA coup d'etat was in motion. On June 15, 1954, CIA-trained sabotage teams and invasion forces launched from Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador and moved quickly into staging areas just outside the Guatemalan border. At 5 p.m. on June 18, President Arbenz held a massive rally at the railroad station. The gathering was buzzed by CIA planes. At dusk, Castillo Armas crossed the border with his personal strike force. Overhead, CIA planes strafed Army troop trains. In Washington, D.C., the PSB ordered the Matamoros Fortress in downtown Guatemala City bombed. A hundred miles east of the capital, the city of Chiquimula fell to CIA guerrilla forces as an American F-47, flown by a mercenary pilot, dropped bombs. Finally, on June 27, 1954, as Castillo Armas attacked the city of Zacapa, President Arbenz capitulated and resigned. By June 30th, the CIA decided that the coup had been a success. Now it was time for the hidden hand of the CIA to vanish. Frank Wisner sent a cable entitled Shift of Gears, urging all CIA officers and operators to withdraw. 
On July 4th, the CIA dispatched a recovery team to Guatemala City to collect 150,000 documents related to all communist activity for future use. On July 12th, the Lincoln office in Opelaka was shuttered. Frank Wisner ordered Albert Haney to destroy all documents relating to Operation Success. A few survived. The president asked the CIA to brief him on the operation. Alan Dulles, Frank Wisner, and J.C. King used maps and charts to narrate how the coup had unfolded. The president asked how many men had died. Only one, a briefer lied. Eisenhower shook his head. Incredible, he said. Indeed, it had been incredible, writes CIA historian Nick Kulather. According to the agency's own records, at least 48 rebel fighters were killed in this action. The CIA's perpetuation of the falsehood that it had been a success gave way to a decades-long CIA myth that the Guatemala operation had been an unblemished triumph. It was often cited as a model, a means of encouraging future presidents to authorize similar covert action operations around the world. On September 1, 1954, Castillo Armas declared himself the new president of Guatemala. Shortly after he took power, a group of junior army cadets, unhappy with the army's capitulation, staged a coup. It was quickly put down, leaving 29 dead and another 91 wounded. Come October, so-called elections were held, but Castillo Armas was the only candidate. As his government was being installed, a second insurgency emerged. This new military junta came down hard on the resistance movement, quashing rebellions with murder and oppression. It left tens of thousands, some historians say as many as 200,000, killed, tortured, maimed, or missing. Three years later, on July 26, 1957, Armas, the CIA's puppet dictator, was shot in the presidential palace by a member of his own guard. He died instantly. The assassin, Romeo Vasquez Sanchez fled to another room in the palace and committed suicide. The facts of the CIA's hidden hand operations in Guatemala would remain secret until May of 1997, when the agency's history staff rediscovered the allegedly lost records. Congress had been looking for them since at least 1975, when the Senate began its investigation into U.S. government-sanctioned assassination. Four years later, in 1979, a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit ordered the Guatemala documents be declassified, but the CIA was able to keep its records sealed on national security grounds. As for the assassination programs and kill lists, CIA staff historians continue to insist that no one was actually assassinated. This is a doubtful claim. When the documents were finally declassified, the names of the people targeted for assassination were redacted, making it impossible to discern if any were killed before, during, or after the coup. Extreme secrecy and illicit hiding are but two elements of plausible deniability designed to keep the office of the president from being embroiled in controversy and disgrace. But there is so much more that results, including grave and unintended consequence, the CIA can neither foresee nor control. In its hidden hand operations in Guatemala in 1954, the CIA created a revenge-seeking monster intent on destroying its creator. It took the form of Che Guevara, the young doctor who watched the CIA-led coup through an open window in an apartment in Guatemala City. 
shortly after he wrote the letter to his mother, expressing the magical sensation he felt watching violence and revolution unfold. Che Guevara set out onto the city streets to organize a resistance movement against the plotters of the coup. He teamed up with an armed militia organization called the Communist Youth and expressed a desire to fight. Instead, the group's leaders assigned him hospital duty and instructed him to await further orders. Within a few days, martial law was declared across Guatemala, and the Communist Party was disbanded. With its fighters being rounded up, Che Guevara sought refuge in the Argentine embassy. There, he learned that the heart of the Latin American communist movement was moving to Mexico City. He applied for a visa and made his way. It was there that he met a young, Cuban-born revolutionary living in exile there, Fidel Castro. He is a young man, intelligent, very sure of himself, and of extraordinary audacity, Che Guevara wrote in his diary. I think there is a mutual sympathy between us. Fidel Castro asked Che Guevara to join his guerrilla movement and serve as the rebel group's official doctor, and he accepted on the spot. In just five short years, the two revolutionaries would transform from complete unknowns to two of the highest-ranking enemies of the United States. Back in Guatemala, as the CIA's cleanup group was sorting through files of the fallen Arbenz regime, CIA officer David Atley Phillips came across a single sheet of paper about the young doctor named Che Guevara and his communist ties. Should we start a file on this one? Phillips' assistant asked his boss. Yes, I guess we better have a file on him, Phillips replied. Soon, the CIA would place Che Guevara on their kill list. Chapter 6 Kings, Shahs, Monarchs, and Madmen Halfway across the world in the Middle East, the president's covert action advisors also had their eyes on Iran. In these early days of the Cold War, the Middle East was awash in spectacle killings that the CIA saw as motivated not only by politics, but also by religion and revenge. Assassination operations undertaken by religious fanatics were particularly dangerous, the agency believed. Since a fanatic is unstable psychologically and must be handled with extreme care. In Iran, a group of these fanatics had recently succeeded in assassinating eight high-ranking members of the country's secular government. They called themselves Fedayeen e Islam, self-sacrificers of Islam. Shiite fundamentalist Muslims whose declared mission was to rid Iran of corrupting individuals through assassination. In 1953, President Eisenhower's PSB met to discuss covert action plans involving Iran's Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, who the CIA believed was at the top of Fedayeen e Islam's kill list. The assassination of a prominent government official creates a vacuum of instability, both actual and perceived. By 1953, when briefing Eisenhower on the assassination threat level in Iran, CIA Director Alan Dulles, a member of the Psychological Strategy Board, told the president in no uncertain terms that if something wasn't done about the situation, Moscow would surely take advantage of it. A communist takeover of Iran is becoming more and more of a possibility, Dulles told the president, and the elimination of Mossadegh by assassination or otherwise might precipitate decisive events. The result would be a domino effect across all of the Middle East. If Iran succumbed to the communists, 
there is little doubt that in short order, the other areas of the Middle East, with some 60% of the world's oil reserves, would fall into communist control. The CIA decided that its best bet for a covert action partner to counter Soviet influence in Iran was the country's vain young king, Shah Mohammad Reza Pavlavi. The Fedayeen-e-Islam had tried to kill the Shah just a few years before. It was a cool, crisp morning in 1949 in the capital city, and the 29-year-old king climbed out of his limousine and began making his way up the steps of Tehran University, waving to the crowd. A man pretending to be a photojournalist called out the Shah's name. As Mohammad Reza Pavlavi looked his way, the assassin fired off five shots, hitting him. One bullet entered the Shah's face through his open mouth, passing through his upper lip and exiting his face without hitting any bone. As he fell, a second bullet struck him in the backside, wounding him. The assassin fired off three more bullets, all of which hit the Shah's hat before police leapt on the man and killed him. As the assassin's dead body was pummeled by a vengeful mob, the Shah was rushed to a nearby hospital, where he spoke with members of the press. A few shots won't deter my duties to my beloved country, he told visitors gathered at his bedside. The assassin's name was Fakir Arai, a member of the Fedayeen-e-Islam. By the time he tried to kill the Shah, the group had already succeeded in killing two prominent members of Iranian society, Ahmed Kasravi, a historian in 1946, and Mohammad Massoud, a newspaper publisher, in 1948. Both men had been writing and publishing anti-religious pieces when they were assassinated. Their writings had deeply offended a central figure inside the self-sacrificers of Islam, a 49-year-old cleric named Ruhollah Khomeini. Though relatively unknown outside religious circles at the time, in the decades to come, this revolutionary cleric would become one of the most infamous villains in the Western world, known as Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran. Fedayeen-e-Islam modeled their activities after history's original assassins, the Hashashin, an 11th century strike force of Shiite fundamentalist warriors led by the enigmatic holy man Hassan Isaba, from whom the word assassin derives. Like its medieval predecessor, the modern Fedayeen e Islam in Iran sought to target and assassinate those it deemed enemies of Shiite Islam. The assassins and their abilities, indeed, the very mention of their name, bred terror. They were deadly and cunning, rumored to possess invisibility. One of the first known Western references to the assassins appears in a report written by Frederick I the Holy Roman Emperor, in the year 1173. They had a habit of killing enemies in an astonishing way, explains Bernard Lewis, professor emeritus at Princeton University, who first located the original reference in 1967. But it was the fanatical devotion rather than the murderous methods of the assassins that struck the imagination of Europe. Dormant for hundreds of years, the assassins were now at it again. The Shah's political ideology, the divine right of kings, was a Western concept the self-sacrificers of Islam vowed to destroy. After the Shiite fundamentalists tried to kill the Shah in 1949, and despite the group's clear allegiance to Islamic fundamentalism, the Shah's secular government, led by a prime minister, instead placed blame on Iran's pro-Soviet Union Communist Party, the Tuda Party, or Party of the Masses. 
As the Shah recovered in the hospital, Iranian state police arrested more than 200 Tuda party members and confiscated the group's assets in an effort to rid the country of communists. The remaining members of the Tuda party went underground. In Western media outlets, the assassination attempt was reported as being linked to economics, not religion. The assassination attempt came one day after 2,000 students marched around the Majlis Parliament building and demanded cancellation of the Anglo-Iranian oil company's concession, that is, exclusive rights, to take oil out of Iran, reported the United Press. Half a century earlier, in 1901, a British entrepreneur named William Darcy secured from the corrupt former Shah of Iran, Mosafar ad-Din Shah Qajar, the exclusive rights to pump oil out of the desert on decidedly one-sided terms. Darcy's British oil company would keep 84% of the profits, while 16% would go to the monarchy for the king to disperse as he saw fit, which was mostly in his pocket. Now, 48 years later, the bogus terms of the oil deal had become a legitimate point of contention for many Iranians. But in 1949, it was not oil that was directly related to the assassination attempt on the corrupt and ineffectual Shah Mohammad Rezi Pavlavi. It was religion. In the Western media, the Soviet Union was cast as the villain in the Iranian situation. Iran has been the scene of unrest since the end of the war, reported the Associated Press. Its vast oil resources have been a bone of contention between the Soviet Union, which has demanded concessions, and the Western powers, which have resisted Russian entrance into the oil fields where they have long dominated. This was precisely what Stalin warned Ambassador Bedell Smith about during their meeting at the Kremlin. Nine months after the self-sacrificers of Islam failed to kill the Shah, they succeeded in assassinating his minister of the royal court, Abdul Hussein Hazir. In an attempt to keep order, the Shah appointed a hard-lined anti-communist military general named Ali Razmara to be the new prime minister of Iran. In response, the fedayeen e islam dispatched an assassin to kill him. On March 7, 1951, Prime Minister Razmara was paying his respects at a funeral in the Shah Mosque in Tehran when a religious zealot named Khalil Tamasebi stepped forward from the crowd and fired a bullet directly into his face, killing him instantly. The assassination garnered the world's attention. Premier of Iran is shot to death in a mosque by a religious fanatic, victim of assassin, headlined the Associated Press. Just 12 days later, General Razmara's Minister of Education, Abdul Hamid Zangane, was shot and killed by the same group while standing on the steps of Tehran University, where Fedayim e Islam had almost killed the Shah two years before. In response to the back-to-back -back assassinations, the Shah declared martial law. In Washington, D.C., members of the CIA convened to discuss next steps. The assassination of Prime Minister Razmara seriously worsens an already grave situation in Iran, warned a representative from the Office of Policy Coordination. Political and economic insecurity, combined with chauvinist and fanatical religious emotions, have produced an atmosphere extremely favorable to Soviet subversion. Alarmist or not, the perspective of the CIA was that the entire Middle East was on the brink of falling to communism. The successful assassination of a head of state can prompt copycat killings, raising the specter of chaos and instability, which is exactly what happened four months later, as a series of brutal assassinations swept across the Middle East. The first was in Lebanon. 
As with most of its Arab neighbors, Lebanon had only recently gained independence from French colonial rule after the end of World War II. As per the terms of the United Nations Charter, the last French troops withdrew from Lebanon in December 1946. On July 17, 1951, Riyad al-Sol, Lebanon's first prime minister, was gunned down at Marka Airport in Amman, Jordan. The killers, members of a group called the Syrian Socialist National Party, declared that theirs was a revenge killing for the execution of one of their own party's co-founding members. Three days later, on July 20th, King Abdullah of Jordan was killed by a Palestinian assassin at the entrance to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. He was walking into Friday prayers. The king, age 69, died instantly from three shots to the head and the chest. The king who made Jordan a nation is no more, a British newsreel proclaimed. He was our friend, and for this he died. Standing at the king's side when he was assassinated was his 15-year-old grandson, Prince Hussein, hit by bullet fragments. The prince's life was saved when the fragments bounced off a medal pinned to his chest that his grandfather had given him earlier that same day. The assassin was shot dead by bodyguards, and a state of emergency was declared in Jordan. The king's eldest son, Prince Talal took the throne. But Talal had a hidden history of mental illness and had been secretly treated for schizophrenia in a Swiss clinic the year before. After ruling Jordan for a year, he was removed from power by the parliament. Prince Hussein became King Hussein of Jordan, now age 16. He would rule Jordan for the next 45 years. Having witnessed the assassination of his grandfather by a Palestinian fanatic made the teenage King Hussein forever cautious of those around him, he later said, and caused him to treat his fellow Arab rulers with a degree of skepticism. He is said to have always carried a gun when he left the palace and slept with a pistol within arm's reach. After the death of King Abdullah of Jordan, the State Department sent a telegram to all its ambassadors in the Arab states and Israel, encouraging them to counsel restraint and moderation as it worked to shore up a secret partnership with the Shah of Iran. The killing of other heads of state in the region could promote a further weakening of Iran's internal stability, CIA analysts feared and the result could be a general sense of aimlessness, insecurity, and frustration, highlighting Iran's lack of capable leadership, which is exactly what happened next. In Tehran, riots broke out. To appease an angry public, the Shah appointed Mohammad Mossadegh, an Iranian nationalist, to serve as prime minister, giving him authority over Iran's military forces. One of Mossadegh's first actions was to wrest control of the oil industry from the Anglo-Iranian oil company, which infuriated the British. Mossadegh imprisoned the founder of the self-sacrificers of Islam, Nawab Savafi, which enraged the fedayeen e islam who put Mossadegh on their kill list. Unable to kill Mossadegh, the Fedayeen went after the Prime Minister's loyal foreign minister, Hussein Fatimi. In what was sure to be a spectacular display of fanaticism and revenge, the Fedayeen engineered a plan to kill Fatimi while he was attending a commemorative event marking the assassination of newspaper publisher Mohammed Massoud. But the exact moment the assassin was reaching into his front jacket pocket to pull out a gun, a local photographer just so happened to snap a photograph of the killer, an image that would be reprinted in newspapers around the world. Adding to the uncanny timing of the photograph was the fact that the killer wasn't a grown man, but a young boy of 15. 
In 1952, the marriage of violence and Islamic fundamentalism was unfamiliar to most Westerners, and the idea that a teenage boy could be seduced into becoming an assassin in the name of religion was considered downright shocking. The teenager managed to get off only a single shot, hitting Iran's foreign minister in the stomach, wounding him. The boy was captured by the Shah's state police, who took him back to police headquarters, where he confessed to being a member of fedayeen e islam In Washington, D.C., President Eisenhower approved the Psychological Strategy Board's plans for a hidden hand coup d'etat in Iran. A year passed. On March 4, 1953, the National Security Council convened to discuss Iran. Dulles repeated his thoughts on what the assassination of Prime Minister Mossadegh would mean for the United States. If he were to be assassinated or otherwise to disappear from power, a political vacuum would occur in Iran and the communists might easily take over. And if the communists moved on the Middle East and all its oil, it would mean the outbreak of war. President Eisenhower was briefed on numerous plans. When he expressed a preference for U.S. financial support to Mossadegh instead of getting rid of him, representatives from state, defense, and the CIA argued that to do so was useless. The days of propping up people who didn't like the United States were coming to an end, CIA Director Alan Dulles advised. Charles Wilson, Secretary of Defense, agreed. In the old days, when dictatorships changed, it was usually a matter of one faction of the right against another, and we had only to wait until the situation subsided, Wilson told Eisenhower. Nowadays, however, when a dictatorship of the right is replaced by a dictatorship of the left, a state could presently slide into communism and become irrevocably lost to us. It was the same mantra that had allowed the CIA to garner covert action authority in Korea and Guatemala. Diplomacy wasn't working, and military intervention was unwise. That left the president with his third option, the hidden hand. The president told his advisors that the situation was a matter of great distress to him, that he could not understand why we seemed unable to get some of the people in these downtrodden countries to like us instead of hating us. After listening to the president, the National Security Council secured authorization to proceed. The following month, on April 4th, 1953, $1 million was wired to the CIA's Tehran station to bring about the downfall of Mohammed Mossadegh. The CIA plot to overthrow Mossadegh, codenamed Operation Ajax, took place the third week of August 1953. The details of the coup, even the basic questions like who hatched the plot and who carried it out, remain the subject of debate. Mossadegh was not assassinated, but instead arrested and convicted of treason. He served three years in jail before being banished to house arrest. He died in 1967. A retired army general named Fazlola Zahidi became the CIA's frontman, retaining power as prime minister for two years. But the real goal for the United States was to quietly help the Shah assume absolute power in Iran. With military and economic backing, by 1955, the CIA got its wish. The Defense Department sent General McClure, founder of the U.S. Army 10th Special Forces, to Tehran to serve as chief of the U.S. military mission in Iran. His job was to help Iran build up its conventional military forces, as well as a guerrilla warfare corps. In a letter to his liaison at the National Security Council, 
McClure relayed what he'd learned. His Majesty's first and most important problem was the morale of the armed forces. Something must be done immediately to provide minimum housing requirements for its officers and non-commissioned officers, many of whom are at present living in squalor, McClure wrote. Like a kid in a candy store, the Shah's wish list was long. He desires a highly proficient and technically trained small army with considerable mobility, which could be backed, in time of war, by large numbers of tribesmen armed as infantry and trained to fight defensively until overrun, and then resort to guerrilla tactics. The Shah insisted he needed an arsenal of weapon systems and artillery from the United States in order to exercise dominance in the region. Three battalions of patent tanks, an anti-aircraft battalion to protect troops, steel mating for airstrips, 155 howitzers and landmines, wrote McClure. The Shah accepted the fact that it was too early to talk about being supplied with U.S. jet fighter aircraft. The Shah's military reorganization was well underway, McClure wrote, the country's charter being rewritten to move military authority away from the prime minister so it was entirely under the Shah's direction and control. President Eisenhower expressed his approval for what was originally seen as a successful coup in Iran. The Soviets were at bay, at least for now. The CIA carried out a successful regime change operation, says CIA staff historian David Robarge. It also transformed a turbulent constitutional monarchy into an absolutist kingship and induced a succession of unintended consequences. Not until the Iranian Revolution in 1979 would the most impactful of the unintended consequences be revealed. Scores of foot soldiers of the revolution seeking to overturn the Shah were members of Fedayeen-e-Islam. But in 1953, with the Shah firmly installed as the American puppet, an order seemingly in place. CIA officers mistakenly believed they could control the self-sacrificers of Islam, maybe even work with them. A new strategy for dealing with radical Islamic fundamentalists emerged. The communists were avowed atheists. The CIA and the National Security Council advised President Eisenhower that the United States should begin using the communist irreligiosity against them. In September 1957, at a White House meeting with the President, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, the CIA's Frank Wisner, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and President Eisenhower agreed. We should do everything possible to stress the holy war aspect endemic to the Middle East, Eisenhower said. Dulles suggested that the CIA create a secret task force through which the United States could deliver weapons, intelligence, and money to American-friendly monarchs, including King Saud of Saudi Arabia, King Hussein of Jordan, and King Faisal of Iraq. It was an idea that would have grave unintended consequences. From these task forces, a thousand monsters would be born. As was the case with many Arab rulers in the 1950s, Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser came to power using assassination as a political tool, at least according to his successor, Anwar Sadat. In an interview with Arab television, Sadat said that Nasser conducted a large-scale assassination campaign starting in January 1952, an act that helped him secure power and respect. After trying unsuccessfully to machine-gun down a political rival during a military parade, Nasser led a successful military coup against King Farouk, which launched the Egyptian Revolution. 
No one liked Egypt's King Farouk. He was corrupt and ineffectual, vilified for riding around the country in his private train, consuming oysters, while so many of his subjects suffered from poverty and hunger. Spared execution, King Farouk was forced to abdicate, and he lived out the rest of his life in Monaco and Italy. Nasser became president of Egypt in 1956. The use of assassination as a political tool cuts both ways. In a region where assassination was as much about revenge as it was about politics and religion, once you tried to assassinate a rival, you could assume that your rivals were going to be coming after you. Two years after taking power, Nasser became the target of an assassination attempt by the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt's Sunni fundamentalist group. On October 26, 1954, Nasser was in Alexandria, delivering a speech to celebrate the British military withdrawal. The historic event was broadcast live on radios all across Egypt and the Arab world. As Nasser regaled the massive crowd of supporters who'd gathered in Manshea Square, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood stood up and fired at President Nasser from just 20 feet away. Despite firing eight shots in all, the assassin missed Nasser entirely. Pandemonium erupted among the crowd while Nasser remained sublimely calm. He seized upon the moment for political advantage, addressing millions of Egyptians listening to his speech on the radio. My countrymen, Nasser shouted, my blood spills for you and for Egypt. Even though Nasser wasn't bleeding, the crowd went wild. Let them kill me, he cried. It does not concern me so long as I have instilled pride, honor, and freedom in you. If Gamal Abdel Nasser should die, each of you shall be Gamal Abdel Nasser. As the crowd erupted in cheers, Nasser continued shouting into the microphone, Gamal Abdel Nasser is of you and from you, and he is willing to sacrifice his life for the nation, he repeated again and again. Nasser, already popular, was now also publicly adored across the Arab world. His vision for pan-Arabism, the desire to unify the Arab world from North Africa to West Asia, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Arabian Sea, could now take hold. In neighboring Libya, a young Bedouin boy named Muammar el-Gaddafi listened to Nasser's Monshea Square radio broadcast with supreme adoration. In school, Gaddafi would leap up onto his chair and recite Nasser verbatim. People thought he was odd. His classmates made fun of him. He didn't care. One day, he said, he'd prove all of them wrong, and he'd exact revenge on anyone who ever dared doubt him. Muammar el Qaddafi would grow up, join the military, and seize power from Libya's corrupt King Idris. He would emulate Gamal Nasser, promote his ideology, and insist the two men become friends. 2,000 miles away, in Iraq, a rebel group plotted to assassinate their king. On July 14, 1958, the last king of Iraq, his family, his advisors, and his prime minister were all killed in one of the most brutal assassination and coup d'etat in modern history. The bloodbath was a terrifying mix of political killing and revenge murder, finalized and sensationalized in a sadistic display of mob rage. King Faisal II, born in 1935, became king of Iraq when he was just three years old, after his playboy father died in a car crash. During World War II, the boy lived with his mother, Queen Aaliyah, in England, as a teenager, he attended the British boarding school Harrow alongside his second cousin, Hussein, then serving as King of Jordan. 
King Faisal was 23 and engaged to be married when, on July 14th, the military stormed the palace in Baghdad. One of the king's military commanders, a brigadier general named Abdal Karim Qasim, ordered that the members of the royal family be lined up in front of a wall and machine-gunned to death. Prime Minister Nuri al-Said escaped the immediate carnage and the following day donned an abaya and sneaked out the back door of the palace. He was captured, shot, and his corpse cut up by shawarma knives by a vengeful mob. The mutilated corpses of the crown prince and the prime minister were then strung up outside the Ministry of Defense and hit with sticks. After the bodies were taken down, they were laid out in the street where they were run over by an army vehicle. The corpses resembled sausage, reported a Baghdad newspaper, which ran photographs of the bodies and the mayhem. King Faisal II had been decidedly pro-Western, a friend of the State Department and a guest of the White House during a visit to D.C. His 1958 assassination was a blow to the CIA's desire for regional control. The king had been a cornerstone partner in the Baghdad Pact of 1955, a five-nation alliance signed by Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Turkey, and the United Kingdom in support of Western democratic ideals. The alliance, known as CENTO, was modeled after NATO and promised mutual cooperation among its signatory nations. At its core, the Baghdad Pact was an agreement to contain the spread of communism and limit Moscow's influence in the already volatile Middle East. After the murders, Alan Dulles was asked to meet with President Eisenhower to brief him on worst-case scenarios in Iraq and how the king's killing might affect the overall region. Dulles told Eisenhower that a chain reaction downfall could easily occur across the entire Middle East. The kings of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Iran were all extremely vulnerable to assassination, Dulles warned, and if they were murdered, their weak governments would surely fall. Iraq's new leader, General Abdal Karim Qasim, withdrew from the Baghdad Pact and began forging a partnership with the Soviet Union. In 1959, in keeping with the cycle of revenge, a six-man hit squad aligned with an underground resistance force tried to assassinate Qasim. One of the assassins was a foot soldier from the village of Tikrit named Saddam Hussein. During the ambush, Saddam Hussein began shooting prematurely, drawing fire from Qasim's bodyguards and causing the plan to go awry. Qasim's chauffeur was killed, but General Qasim survived the attempt on his life. Believing they'd killed General Qasim, the members of the hit team fled. Saddam Hussein vanished. When he resurfaced years later in Egypt, the world was a different place. Chapter 7. The KGB's Office of Liquid Affairs Through the 1950s, the President's advisors continued to see the Soviets as the cause of anti-American acts and sentiment they could otherwise not explain. At the same time, Moscow remained hyper-focused on controlling the public's perception of communism. From 1954 onward, the CIA believed that the Kremlin was behind a recent spate of émigré kidnappings and assassinations in Eastern Europe. Too many community leaders who'd spoken out against the Soviet Union were winding up disappeared or dead. For the most part, this was speculative. If only the CIA had hard evidence— the hit-and-run ambushes were brazen and bold, often occurring in broad daylight on city streets. Finally, in 1954, the CIA got the evidence it was looking for in the strange case of KGB assassin Captain Nikolai Edgenievich Koklov. Captain Koklov was a shy man, quiet and unassuming. 
His first career before the Second World War was as a theatrical performer. His special talent was whistling. Now, here he was, standing in a hallway in Frankfurt, Germany, a KGB assassin on a mission to kill. It was April 1954, and everything in Kokolov's life was about to change. He rang the doorbell above a small nameplate that read Yorgi Sergeyevich Oklovich. Russian by birth, Oklovich was an outspoken anti-Soviet emigre and chief of operations of the Popular Labor Alliance of Russian Solidaris, a virulently anti-communist group in West Germany. The door opened. The two men stood face to face. Yorgi Sergeyevich, Koklov asked. Da, said the man. Yes, I am he. I have come to you from Moscow, Koklov stated. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union has ordered your assassination. The murder is entrusted to my group. I cannot let this murder happen. The target, Yorgai Oklovich, let the assassin, Nikolai Koklov, inside. Koklov sat down, presented his credentials, and went over the details of the plan. Then he begged for help. He couldn't go on like this, Koklov said, overseeing the deaths of people the Kremlin wanted killed. Koklov wanted to switch sides, to betray his country and defect to the West. If Oklovich were willing to help him, they both would live. And so, assassination as a secret weapon in the battle between East and West moved out of the shadows and into the public eye. One week later, on April 22nd, Captain Nikolai Evgenievich Koklov took to the podium at a press conference in Bonn, Germany. He announced to the world that he was an assassin for the KGB. A crisis of conscience had prevented him from killing, he said. The KGB was evil and had to be stopped, he warned. As proof, he revealed yet another Soviet covert action operation that had been carried out the week before. While Koklov was being debriefed by U.S. intelligence agents in Bonn, a second assassination team dispatched by the KGB had succeeded in kidnapping and assassinating an anti-Soviet emigre named Alexander Trushinovich, Oklovich's counterpart at the Popular Labor Alliance of Russian Solidarists in Berlin. At first, the CIA was suspicious of Koklov. His story sounded apocryphal. The more likely scenario was that Koklov was a double agent, a Soviet mole. But after a few days of questioning, Koklov's American handler became convinced he was indeed a KGB assassin who had experienced a crisis of conscience that led to an ideological shift. In the Cold War battle between the United States and the USSR, most defecting was done from east to west, which made Russia look bad. The Soviet Union spent time and treasure trying to control the free world's perception of communism, which is why outspoken anti-Soviet emigres like Gregory Oklovich and Alexander Trushinovich were high on the assassination list. Now, so too, was Koklov. Adding to the drama of his defection was the fact that he carried with him physical evidence of the Soviet-led assassination plot. The weapon the KGB had given him was a cunning little close-quarters killing machine, a poisoned dart gun disguised to look like a cigarette pack. At first glance, the two rows of tightly packed smokes appeared normal. But Koklov demonstrated how, with the press of a secret button, a four-inch-long dart gun sprang forth, capable of firing small, poison-tipped bullets into a victim. The weapon's delivery system was no louder than the snap of the fingers, Koklov demonstrated, and designed to be fired in a public space without notice. 
In Koklov's debrief, the CIA learned quite a bit about the unusual man, codenamed Whistler, including his intelligence activities during the war. When higher-ups in the KGB's predecessor organization, the NKVD, People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, learned that the blonde, blue-eyed Koklov spoke German and could whistle, they foresaw an excellent disguise for a wartime covert agent. In 1941, Koklov was recalled from a frontline infantry unit, indoctrinated by the NKVD, and sent for paramilitary training, where he learned assassination techniques behind enemy lines. He studied infiltration and exfiltration tactics, reconnaissance tradecraft, hand-to-hand -hand combat skills, and the art of silent killing, training similar to OSS operators. In the fall of 1943, Koklov had parachuted into Belarus under cover of night, where he linked up with Soviet partisans and oversaw the assassination of Nazi General Commissar Wilhelm Kube, the butcher of Belarus. Koklov, it seemed, was the communist version of the special operations executives Jan Kubisch and Josef Gabczak, the commandos who assassinated SS Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich, the butcher of Prague. After the war, Nikolai Koklov went to work for Russian intelligence, posing as a German, a Pole, and a Romanian. In 1954, after the death of Stalin, the NKVD became the KGB, and Koklov was called back to Moscow. He began to have second thoughts about being a professional assassin right around the time he was sent to Frankfurt to kill Yorgai Oklovich. During Koklov's debrief, the CIA learned information it coveted. The KGB's assassination unit was called the 12th Department and was divided into sections, Atelenia, or directions, Napralenia, by countries or groups of countries such as, for example, the United States, the principal enemy, England, Latin America, etc. According to Koklov, the 12th Department headquarters in Moscow maintained 50 to 60 experienced employees and was headed by a general named Nikolai B. Rodin, who, under the alias Korovin, had previously been a KGB resident in Great Britain. Secrecy regarding assassination operations were maintained through careful selection of agents and the specialized training of Soviet personnel. The officers do not discuss their experience among others. Department documents are not circulated, Koklov's handlers learned. If an assassination plot were ever recorded, it would be kept track of under the code phrase executive action within the KGB Directorate of Liquid Affairs, Mokredjela, also known as wet matters. The 12th Department had two secret weapons laboratories whose scientists worked on weapons for executive action operations. One of these laboratories, codenamed Laboratory No. 12, produced special weapons and explosive devices. It was here that the Soviets engineered and prepared deadly tools of assassination from drawing up blueprints to melting and pouring bullets. A second lab, called Camera, or The Chamber, developed poisons and drugs for special tasks. Stalin personally oversaw the creation of the Camera Lab, Koklov said, which was located in a suburb outside Moscow called Kuchino. The laboratory housed a torture chamber, a place where death row prisoners were used as guinea pigs, injected with different powders, beverages, and liquors to test the effectiveness of various types of injections. One high-priority effort for the scientists and engineers at Camera, Koklov said, was to create poisons that would be undetectable in an autopsy. Only a handful of high-level persons were ever allowed to enter this classified facility. 
Koklov had never been to Kamara, he said, but knew people who had. All assassins were trained in the art of kidnapping, the preferred hit-and-run tactic of the 12th Department. The Russian strike force units were called combat groups, Boevia Gropa. Each consisted of a Soviet staff officer, like Koklov, augmented by a team of indigenous agents, local assets familiar with customs and terrain near where a target lived. On the mission to kill Yorgai Oklovich, Koklov had been assigned to work with two German-born KGB agents he identified as Hans Kukovich and Kurt Weber. All combat group paramilitary operators were armed and prepared to perform executive actions when required to do so, either in time of peace or war, Koklov said. The list of Soviet targets for assassination was long, particularly among the anti-communist émigré community. The members of the Politburo guarded a reputation they constructed for themselves and were determined to stamp out dissent. The best way to silence former citizens who threatened the façade was to kidnap and assassinate them. The assassinations of some émigré leaders are often carried out so skillfully as to leave the impression that the victims died from natural causes, reads a declassified CIA report. The individuals who died were reportedly victims of an apparent heart attack, suicide, fall, or traffic accident. Other émigré leaders were wanted for information they had. These people were targeted for kidnapping by a direct action strike force called a combat action team. The paramilitary team followed orders from the Directorate of Liquid Affairs. The CIA had a thick dossier on the disappeared emigres, to which Koklov added several names. There was Walter Lintz, president of the Association of Free German Jurists, lawyers, kidnapped off the streets of Berlin in July of 1952 by a 13-man KGB combat action team never to be seen again. There was Bohumil Lausman, an outspoken anti-communist Czech who disappeared from Vienna in 1953 and was later reported to have been taken to a Soviet gulag where he died. The Ukrainian national Valery P. Tremel was grabbed off the streets of Linz, Austria in June 1954, never to be seen or heard from again. For his high-profile defection to the West and his refusal to kill on moral grounds, Koklov was featured in Time magazine and Life magazine and in a four-part series in the Saturday Evening Post, I Would Not Murder for the Soviets. When he testified for Congress, he made the Soviet Union sound downright diabolical. He spoke of Soviet death camps, brutal police tactics, and the machine-gunning of citizens who'd gathered to resist totalitarian rule. Under oath, he swore that while members of the elite enjoy very good living conditions, the ordinary man in the Soviet Union is treated as a slave. Embraced by the United States, Koklov soon became the target of the KGB. To assassinate their former assassin, the KGB ordered scientists in the 12th Department, now renamed the 13th Department, to develop a special toxin undetectable in an autopsy. They wanted a poison that would first disfigure him, then bring about a long, slow, excruciatingly painful death. Not as much for revenge, but to send a clear message to anyone who might be thinking about betraying Russia. Three years passed. In 1958, Koklov traveled to Germany to give a speech at a convention of anti-communist emigres gathered at the Palmengarten Conservatory in Frankfurt. During a break, he was sitting at a terrace cafe enjoying a cup of coffee when he became lightheaded. There weren't many people around, he recalled, just a few beer drinkers. Sipping the coffee, he suddenly thought that it tasted funny. Never mind, he thought and got up and went into the conservatory's concert hall to enjoy the opera being performed. 
His ears started ringing. He felt nauseated. His vision blurred. Things began to whirl, he later told the CIA. Koklov staggered out to the parking lot, found the car he was driving, and somehow made it back to his hotel, stopping to vomit several times along the way. In the hotel foyer, he collapsed and lost consciousness. Taken to Frankfurt University Hospital, he awoke to learn he'd been diagnosed with a basic case of gastritis. But his condition quickly worsened and worsened. Soon, his entire body turned a copper-colored red. My mind began disintegrating, he recalled. He could not accurately determine if he was dreaming or awake. He lost the ability to count beyond ten. Days passed. A nurse came into the room, looked at him, and froze. Then she screamed and ran out. Looking in the mirror, Koklov saw that he was covered in black and blue marks. Patches of his skin were mottled brown. His pillowcase was covered in blood. My face had turned into a mask, reminiscent of a Boris Karloff monster, he remembered. When he reached up to touch his hair, huge tufts fell out. In Washington, D.C., the Pentagon received word of what had happened to Nikolai Koklov. The Defense Department swung into action, sending American military physicians to bring Koklov under their care. His white blood cell count had fallen from the normal level of 6,000 to 7,000 down to 700. Doctors took a bone marrow sample. His blood-building cells were dying off. The test samples came back. He'd been poisoned by some kind of radioactive isotope. Doctors gave him very little chance of recovery. Then, after a week of blood transfusions, Koklov somewhat miraculously recovered. It was the CIA that concluded that Koklov had been poisoned with radioactive thallium, a deadly toxin likely created by Soviet scientists in their Chimera lab. The poison had been engineered to work in a diabolically clever fashion, an analyst wrote, designed to produce an initial display of symptoms doctors would almost certainly misdiagnose as generic gastritis. The assassins, assumed to be from the KGB's Directorate of Liquid Affairs, had probably posed as waiters at the Palmengarten Conservatory Terrace Café where one of them had slipped a few drops of radioactive thallium into Koklov's coffee cup. Just one week after Nikolai Koklov was released from the American military hospital in Frankfurt, the Directorate of Liquid Affairs struck again. This time, they succeeded in poisoning a high-profile anti-communist Ukrainian politician named Lev Rebet, killing him. The assassination occurred in Munich, Germany, in the stairwell of a newspaper office where Rebet had been working with a reporter to expose Kremlin-sponsored assassinations. In World War II, Rebet was the leader of the Ukrainian government until he was arrested by the Gestapo in 1941. He'd survived imprisonment at Sachsenhausen concentration camp only to be killed by a KGB assassin with a poison dart gun in an office building stairwell. Initially, Lev Rebet's death was reported as being from natural causes. The autopsy that followed his collapse in the stairwell stated the cause of death as heart attack. But four years later, in 1961, a second KGB assassin, Bodan Stashinsky, defected to Berlin, surrendered himself to West German authorities who turned him over to the CIA. At a U.S. facility in Frankfurt, Stashinsky spent weeks in custody of the CIA, interrogated by an officer named William Hood. Stashinsky told Hood that he was assigned to the Directorate of Liquid Affairs and that he'd assassinated Lev Rebet with a specially crafted poison gun a tiny weapon with which he'd sprayed atomized hydrogen cyanide directly into Rebbit's face. He described watching Rebbit crumple over and die right in front of him. Unlike Nikolai Koklov, 
Bodan Stashensky did not experience a crisis of conscience. He was a double agent. In 2011, at the age of 80, he revealed in an interview with Ukrainian journalist Natalia Priodoko that he was always a committed communist and had been sent by the Kremlin to turn himself in, win the good graces of the CIA, and continue his work as a Soviet mole. Bodan Stashinsky served eight years in a German prison for the murder of Lev Rebet. This light sentence was likely a result of the lie he propagated, that he couldn't bear to be an assassin and instead turned himself in. After Stashinsky's release in 1966, he went to Washington to work with the CIA. But they suspected a double game, he says, and he was sent to a backwater post in Panama. After a few years with no access to anything important, Stashinsky was extracted and transported to Paraguay by the KGB. He went to Africa, had plastic surgery so the CIA couldn't find him, and returned to the USSR in 1970. The CIA's files on Bodan Stashinsky remain classified. In Moscow, the KGB opened two new divisions inside its Directorate of Liquid Affairs. Department T, for terrorism, oversaw assassinations by shooting, poisoning, blowing things up, and subversion. Department V, for victory, kept track of its assassins' successes. The new name for work being done by Department T was now Direct Action, Declassified CIA Documents Reveal. Chapter 8. Greenlight It was the fall of 1960, and Billy Waugh stood in the open air, on the inky Black Sea, near the jackstaff of the nuclear attack submarine USS Greyback. As the sub slid through the water off the east coast of Okinawa Island in the Pacific, Waugh and three team members prepared for a top-secret wet-deck launch a subsurface infiltration technique mastered by a small, elite group of U.S. Army Special Forces operators called a Greenlight Team. The training mission was to emplace a tactical nuclear weapon into the target area, arm the device, and exfiltrate without detection. The submarine's motto, De Profundis Futuris, was indicative of these perilous Cold War times. Here, now, in the last year of the Eisenhower administration, if the United States went to war, the battle cry would likely be nuclear. It was an atomic weapon we were carrying, remembers Waugh, not a mock-up. The Army had us train with an actual nuclear device. We had to be battle-ready, and we were. The tactical nuclear weapon Waugh and his teammates were carrying was a W-54 Special Atomic Demolition Munition, or SADM. It weighed 98 pounds and had a projected yield of between 1 and 7 kilotons. This weapon was designed to be carried on a man's back, or chest, or in pieces, to be assembled on the battlefield. Built by Sandia Laboratory in New Mexico, the portable atomic weapon was capable of entirely destroying an area roughly one mile in diameter. Few humans, buildings, or structures in the kill radius would survive, according to material declassified by the Department of Defense. Greenlight operators who trained with an actual SATAM device, who parachuted with it and swam with it strapped to their bodies, understood the profound responsibility. The blast from a one-kiloton atomic weapon was equivalent to 20,000 pounds of TNT. But as Green Berets, Waugh and the men he was with had been trained to operate under extraordinary pressure, entrusted to handle a device capable of death and destruction on an unimaginable scale, whose power was contained inside a small aluminum vessel the size of a kitchen garbage can. 
Waugh strapped the components of the heavy and cumbersome nuclear weapon to his chest. As a team leader, I carried two of the four plutonium rings, he remembered in 2016. Two of the other team members each carried a single ring. The rings were attached to his body with cloth ties and secured with metal clips. Waugh pulled his infrared device for night viewing down over his eyes, scanned the surface of the water, and climbed down off the submarine stanchion. Skillfully as trained, he lowered himself into the 15-man rubber boat, RB-15, and assumed position. Were the inflatable boat to strike the jack staff, it could mean disaster. If the RB-15 flipped, the submarine's powerful propellers would likely suck the green light team members into its wake. But the four men on Waugh's team boarded the boat without incident, and the submarine sunk down below the surface and disappeared. We paddled 400 meters to shore. Quiet, silent, no motor, no sound, recalls Waugh. Once on the shore, the green light team deflated the rubber boat, buried it, and covered their tracks with sand and foliage. We walked to the target area. Once we got there, we assembled the device, set the timer for four hours, and armed it. It took two of us to do it. That was the fail-safe. No single team member could arm the nuclear device alone. When it was time to exfiltrate, we started walking out, used Kamo to relay our position. The effort to communicate was successful, and finally the team was picked up by helicopter and taken back to base. To Camp Hardy, says Waugh, for a debrief. Camp Hardy was a U.S. military installation on the northeast coast of Okinawa, halfway between the villages of Higashi and Arakawa. That top-secret, green-light team, atomic weapons training missions took place here starting in 1960, has never been officially acknowledged by the Department of Defense. Strategically located 910 miles from Tokyo, Japan, Okinawa had a blood-soaked history. In the spring of 1945, a final showdown between the United States and Japan took place here, the last stepping stone before the mainland. More than 140,000 people died on Okinawa between April and June 1945 in the largest sea-air-land battle of World War II. More than 12,000 Americans were killed and 36,000 wounded. By June 22nd, when the fighting ended, 110,000 Japanese soldiers had been killed, and 160,000 Okinawan civilians had been sacrificed by the Japanese army or killed by U.S. military personnel. After the Japanese surrender, Okinawa became a protectorate of the United States, technically no longer part of Japan. The U.S. military constructed bases for its army, air force, and navy here, including at Naha and Kadena and Tori Station. In 1950, with the outbreak of war on the Korean Peninsula, Okinawa became a strategic foothold for the U.S. military and intelligence operations in Asia, a place from which the army and navy launched conventional force operations. But the need for unconventional warfare bases was now expanding for classified units like the Greenlight teams and others. In June 1957, the U.S. Army activated the 1st Special Forces Group, Airborne, on Okinawa, tasked with responsibility for Pacific Theater guerrilla warfare operations. As for Billy Waugh, after being singled out for parachute and weapons handling skills back at Fort Bragg, he'd been sent to Okinawa as a member of Company A, 1st Special Forces Group, for live-action SADM training. The role of a green light team was to carry a nuclear device into battle behind enemy lines where it could be used as a tactical weapon. Saddam was designed for sabotage, to blow up fortified enemy infrastructure, including tunnels, viaducts, and mountain passes. The small nuclear weapon could also be placed just inside the enemy's front line and detonated there. 
In addition to killing significant numbers of enemy soldiers, a nuclear explosion near the main line of defense would force an army to spend precious resources caring for what would likely be tens of thousands of mortally wounded soldiers, casualties of small-scale atomic warfare. To be selected for a green light team was a rare and private honor. Team members worked under pseudonyms and wore fatigues with no military markings or insignia. The unit was classified, and you didn't go around discussing it or talking about it at the mess hall, says Wa. Being chosen meant you demonstrated an ability to perform flawlessly with laser focus under great stress, flexible and rigorous in equal measure. Initial training was at the U.S. Army Engineer Center at Fort Belvoir in Virginia, where Greenlight team members learned infiltration techniques, including parachute drops onto land, wet deck launches from subs, and a combination of parachute drops into the ocean accompanied by underwater infiltration in scuba gear. To parachute a tactical nuclear weapon out of an aircraft required meticulous attention to detail. Timing was everything, remembers Wa. You all had to jump quickly. You couldn't afford to be spread out when you landed on the ground. The disassembled device was placed into a breakaway bag made of canvas, sealed with a heavy rubber band, and attached to the team leader's parachute harness. A jumper's rigging was engineered in a way that once out of the aircraft, the nuclear component would fall to the end of a 17-foot lowering line. According to declassified Defense Department material, by separating the munition from the jumper, the impact shock on water entry would be decreased. It also keeps the weapon from free-falling and prevents loss in night missions or heavy seas. But accidents happened, as Wa recalls. A green light crew on Okinawa lost a nuclear device. It slipped out of its harness and fell into the mud on the sea floor. Every asset in the U.S. Navy was involved in finding the missing Saddam. Eventually, we found it. These kinds of mishaps are always resolved. The Defense Department has never confirmed the incident. The nuclear weapons work of the top-secret green light teams on Okinawa was a product of President Eisenhower's limited nuclear war doctrine, officially called the New Look. The concept of a limited nuclear war was a paradox, a seeming contradiction of Eisenhower's military doctrine of mutual assured destruction, or MAD. Mutual assured destruction presumed that opposing sides would each build an arsenal of nuclear weapons so massive the capability alone would serve as a deterrent or disincentive for ever starting a nuclear war. Neither side would be crazy enough to launch a nuclear weapon strike against the other side, the theory went, because all-out nuclear warfare guaranteed complete annihilation of both sides. But what about smaller wars, so-called limited nuclear wars? To satisfy this question, Eisenhower's National Security Council created the New Look Limited War Strategy, which gave birth to thousands of tactical nuclear weapons in the late 1950s and early 1960s, including the Saddam. These small-sized nuclear weapons were designed for actual use on the battlefield, not for deterrence. Nuclear weapons were miniaturized to fit into artillery shells, surface-to-air missiles, air-to-air -air missiles, short-range missiles, as truck-portable weapons, man-portable weapons, as atomic landmines, and depth charges. But the very possibility of limited nuclear war presented an obvious problem. It was like asking a dying man to fight with a butter knife when there is an ice pick within reach. The way to deter aggression is for America to be willing and able to respond vigorously at any place and with means of its own choosing, 
Secretary of State John Foster Dulles told the Council on Foreign Relations in January 1954 in his first public speech promoting the use of strategic nuclear weapons to win small wars directed by Moscow. These atomic munitions could be used in the Arctic and in the tropics, in Asia, the Near East, and in Europe, by sea, by land, and by air, Dulles warned. With this new-look doctrine in play, the United States promised it could, and if it wanted to, would, respond to a conventional threat anywhere in the world with a precision nuclear strike. But just four months after Dulles' 1954 speech, its hollow bluster became clear in the tiny Southeast Asian country of Vietnam. There, on a small mountain outpost on the Vietnamese border near Laos, a ferociously fought battle came to a brutal climax, stunning the world. The event, now long forgotten by most, was the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, a 57-day armed conflict between the communists of North Vietnam and the far more technologically advanced French Union Army and its Air Force. It was one of the most significant unconventional warfare battles of the modern era. At Dien Bien Phu, 42,000 guerrilla fighters, aided by more than 114,000 Vietnamese civilians, put a decisive end to 100 years of French colonial rule. The success of the battle belonged inarguably to two men, the group's charismatic leader, Ho Chi Minh, and the general of his army, Vo Nguyen Jop. Just nine years earlier, during World War II, these two men had been trained by an OSS special operations team to fight Japanese invaders inside Vietnam. Called the OSS Deer Team, the unit was the Vietnamese equivalent of the French Jedbergs. In September 1945, Colonel Aaron Bank, leader of one of these teams, spent a day personally driving around Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh after Bank's OSS car broke down. In the modern history of unconventional warfare, General Jop's battle tactics at Diem Bien Phu remain remarkable. In addition to the guerrilla fighters, trained in tactics taught to General Jop by the OSS Deer Team, the 114,000 civilians who showed up proved invaluable to the cause. Men and women of all ages and abilities walked to the remote mountain outpost of Dien Bien Phu from across North Vietnam, transporting supplies and heavy weapons from hundreds of miles away. Among the weapons hauled through the treacherous terrain were roughly 500 American-made howitzers left behind by U.S. forces in Korea and appropriated by the Chinese. To get to Dien Bien Phu, General Jop's army of civilians built roadways and footpaths through deep mud, dense jungle, and mountainous terrain with shovels carried on their backs. Once they reached the battle area, they hand-dug a trench around the 14,000 French forces holding ground there. Ho and Jap's revolutionaries set up their Soviet and Chinese-made anti-aircraft guns they'd pulled up the mountain using ropes. They used these gifts of their communist benefactors to fire at French fighter bombers, shooting down scores and making resupply impossible. Entrenched and surrounded, the French lost the ability to fight. On May 7, 1954, after a nearly two-month-long siege, French forces surrendered. Some 1,600 French troops were dead, 5,000 wounded, 1,600 missing. Over 8,000 French soldiers were captured by the communists, called Viet Minh, and marched off to prison camps, some as far as 500 miles away. Fewer than half of these POWs survived. 
In the final days of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the United States did not come to the aid of its ally, France. In the aftermath of the French capitulation, President Eisenhower was forced to consider anew the national security challenge that was Vietnam. A delegation of U.S., French, British, Soviet, and Chinese diplomats met in Switzerland and agreed to divide Vietnam into North and South, as had been done in Korea at the end of World War II. Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh were given control of the North. Emperor Bao Dai and a new prime minister named No Dien Diem were assigned control in the South. The situation was the best the United States could hope for in Vietnam in 1954. In a classified memorandum to the president, CIA Director Alan Dulles relayed a simple truth. The evidence shows that a majority of people in Vietnam supported the Viet Minh rebels, Dulles wrote. The victory in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu has tremendously boosted Ho's popularity. And right behind Ho in popularity was General Jap. In the north, in Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh made General Jap his vice premier and defense minister and the commander in chief of the Vietnam People's Army. General Jap wrote a handbook on guerrilla warfare, People's War, People's Army, which was aggressively studied within the CIA. Jap shares with Premier Khrushchev a conviction that the future holds many just wars of national liberation, one analyst wrote. Jap's book provided guidance for regular citizens who wanted to join the underground movement and participate in sabotage and subversion against the South. Guerrilla war must multiply, wrote Jap. It was time for the movement to develop into mobile warfare, he commanded, to wear out and annihilate bigger enemy forces and win ever greater victories. At the CIA, plans for covert action operations against Ho Chi Minh and General Jap moved to the fore. In an effort to diminish Ho and Jap's rising popularity and to bolster Emperor Bao Dai and Prime Minister Diem, the CIA established a secret presence in Saigon in the south. With clandestine offices tucked away inside the U.S. Embassy there, the CIA dispatched a retired Air Force colonel named Edward Lansdale to serve as chief of covert operations. Within weeks of his arrival, Lansdale reported back to D.C., describing the situation in Saigon as chaotic and ungovernable. Bandits of roving gangs controlled the streets. A criminal gang called Bin Huin held power over the riverboats. Animist-based religious sects, including the Ho Ha and the Cao Dai, sold protection against violence and crime in the form of trinkets and magic spells. But Lansdale believed America could work with President Diem, he told his superiors. Diem was an avowed anti-communist and espoused admiration for everything the West represented. Diem dressed like a British dilettante and spoke fluent English, having studied Catholicism at a Mary Knoll seminary in New Jersey for almost a year. He seemed easy enough to control. Using CIA cash, Colonel Lansdale paid off the criminal gangs to cease and desist, then bribed Diem's opposition leaders to step down. In 1955, also with CIA funds, he helped rig an election that got rid of the increasingly unpopular and corrupt Emperor Bao Dai. Lansdale encouraged Diem to unify the disparate groups of people who populated South Vietnam, including the urban elite, the rural peasants, and the tribal hill people. This is what the communists were doing up north, through heavy-handed, Soviet-style coercion. But the North was unified, Lansdale told Diem, and without unification, the communists would be more likely to succeed in dividing and conquering the South 
with their mobile guerrilla warfare plans. Declassified documents from CIA archives indicate Lansdale tried repeatedly to get Prime Minister Diem to unify and strengthen civil society through education and infrastructure programs for people in the South, ones the CIA was ready and willing to pay for. But Diem would have none of it. President Eisenhower had called him the miracle man in Asia during Diem's visit to America, and apparently Diem thought that made him invincible. He was wrong. Lansdale began working on covert actions that did not require Diem's cooperation. Operation Passage to Freedom, disguised as a humanitarian effort by the U.S. Navy, was a covert action operation run by the CIA. Under the catchy slogan, God Has Gone South, the effort drew the world's attention to the plight of religious Vietnamese being persecuted by God-hating communists. With help from the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet, and non-governmental organizations, NGOs, the CIA engineered the exodus of 1.25 million Vietnamese Catholics from the North to the South. U.S. officials wanted to make sure that as many persons as possible, particularly the strongly anti-communist Catholics, relocated in the South, Lansdale later recalled. But how to get people to uproot their families and move hundreds of miles? Lansdale, a master of propaganda, devised a plan. He had CIA artists create pamphlets showing Hanoi with three nuclear mushroom clouds superimposed on a map. He infiltrated CIA assets into the North to spread rumors of a possible U.S. nuclear strike against Hanoi. The way to avoid death by nuclear holocaust was to move south. The public remained naive as to Lansdale's efforts, and the campaign was a success, lauded by the international press. But it damaged Ho Chi Minh's reputation as a liberator, at least temporarily, and it infuriated the Politburo, which fired back with a brutal, covert action assassination campaign against South Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh and General Jap did not have a powerful navy at their disposal, but what they did have were assassins. Starting in 1959, they began developing an entire mobile warfare army of singleton killers— men and women willing to travel south and assassinate pro-Western South Vietnamese officials, teachers, policemen, and intellectuals. By the time the CIA was wrapping up Operation Passage to Freedom, hundreds of Hanoi's assassins had been emplaced below the 17th parallel. Aided by a partisan support network of communist sympathizers in the South, these groups— called Special Activity Cells, were trained by a security operations officer named Win Tai. Win Tai's story did not become public until 1990, after his memoirs were published in Hanoi. He served in the Ministry of Public Security, North Vietnam's espionage and security organization modeled after the KGB. His father, Win Con Huan was one of Vietnam's most famous authors, says former CIA operations officer Merle L. Pribinow. Tai's rise to power came after he'd helped the government build a case against his own father for anti-regime statements. To betray one's family in the name of the Communist Party was rewarded as loyalty. In 1959, Assassins trained by Nguyen Thai and his security operations officers succeeded in the hit-and-run killings of more than 1,200 South Vietnamese officials. The assassins would run up to a target, point a pistol at the person's head, pull the trigger, and disappear. The ease with which the assassins were able to strike, then vanish, bred paranoia, chaos, and fear. 
The following year, in 1960, the number of close contact assassinations more than doubled, with upwards of 3,500 district officials, rural police, village chiefs, local teachers, and others murdered in the South. This covert war was a difficult, dirty, no-holds-barred struggle that employed assassination and terror as its stock in trade, says Pribino. Eisenhower was in an untenable position. Diplomacy was out of the question, and military action was deemed unwise. The president's third option in South Vietnam, covert action, was having little effect. The president's advisors suggested Eisenhower take action in Vietnam's neighbor to the west, the Kingdom of Laos, where a new communist insurgency was beginning to take hold. These guerrilla fighters, who were allied with Ho Chi Minh's forces in North Vietnam, were called the Pathet Lao. The result was a CIA-led covert action program in Laos, first called Operation Ambidextrous, renamed Operation Hotfoot, and finally known as Operation White Star. The man in charge was Colonel Arthur D. Bull Simons, a hard-charging, unconventional warfare specialist from World War II operations in the Philippines. CIA officers and U.S. Army Green Berets, disguised as land surveyors with the National Geodetic Survey Association, were sent to Laos to train Royal Lao soldiers in unconventional warfare techniques. The 107 Green Berets who participated in the operation were assigned to units called mobile training teams. One of these operators was Billy Waugh. One morning, during SADM training on Okinawa Island, Waugh received his unusual orders. His paper stated that he was going on a six-month temporary duty assignment, TDY, to Vietnam, when in fact, he was going to Laos as a member of Operation White Star. Waugh and a 12-man Special Forces A-team traveled from Okinawa to the Philippines, to Bangkok, and then to Vientiane, Laos. From there, the A-team took army vehicles to Pakse, Laos, located in the western part of the country near its border with Thailand. The Green Berets wore civilian clothing and carried Defense Department civilian identification cards. When the White Star team arrived at what would be their training center for the next six months, they found nothing but an isolated village of thatched huts. Everything the Green Berets needed to set up training operations was airdropped in from Okinawa, food, weapons, construction materials, even two trucks and a bulldozer. Laos was an impoverished country living in a pre-industrial age. When Wa first arrived there, the landlocked nation didn't have a single paved road, railroad, or newspaper. Its estimated two million people were more likely to identify themselves as Hmong and Mao tribesmen than as citizens of Laos. Most of the White Star trainees were illiterate, and many did not know that Laos was an independent nation or that it possessed a standing army, says Defense Department Command historian Ken Finlayson. White Star advisors faced an almost insurmountable task in trying to instill a sense of urgency and purpose in the Laotian soldiers, to implement rigid training schedules, and to prepare them for battle with the path at Lao. The intention of White Star was to train Laotian troops to a level of competence that would enable them to fight the communist path at Lao. This proved to be a daunting task, if not an impossible one. The Laotian commander of our unit drank a lot and drove his Mercedes around, remembers Wa. The concept of discipline or physical training did not exist. White Star advisor Colonel Alfred Paddock recalls, an astonishing 15 soldiers were killed by their own mines during our stay. How to train a rebel army in the developing world, in keeping with U.S. Army standards. The same conundrum 
has plagued the U.S. Army from World War II to the present day. But there was a far more dangerous problem unfolding, one that neither the CIA nor the Defense Department foresaw. Hanoi was using Laos as a supply route, a way to move weapons, fighters, and supplies from North Vietnam into South Vietnam. This passageway would become known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It consisted of more than 1,500 miles of interconnected pathways and roads, some wide and sturdy enough for trucks, others meant for elephants, foot soldiers, or bicyclists. A top-secret National Security Agency, NSA, report declassified in 2007 called the Ho Chi Minh Trail one of the greatest achievements in military engineering of the 20th century. Thanks to the triple canopy jungle that stretched across much of Laos and Vietnam, the construction of the trail was happening right under the CIA's nose. It was a communist-led covert action operation of epic proportions, viciously effective and so easy to plausibly deny. Historians agree the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a primary factor in America's losing the Vietnam War. Chapter 9 The Special Group During the last year of Eisenhower's presidency, in a radical escalation of hidden hand operations, a small group of the president's principal advisors began openly discussing among themselves plans to assassinate foreign leaders. This new group was called the Special Group. It was not uncommon for the president's covert action advisory board to change names. The National Security Council remained the official oversight board, and smaller ancillary groups were often created to deal with the most incendiary and potentially scandalous covert operations. First, there was the Psychological Strategy Board, formed in 1951, as we have seen. During the Guatemala coup d'etat in 1953, the PSB was reorganized as the Operations Coordinating Board. OCB. After the issuance of a new directive, Covert Operations NSC 5412-2 in 1955, the Planning Coordination Group, PCG, was created. Some months later, the special group emerged, with requirement for membership a rank of Assistant Secretary or above. The word assassination was never used and certainly not committed to paper. Instead, a Senate investigation later found the president's advisors used secrecy, compartmentation, circumlocution, and the avoidance of clear responsibility to maintain plausible deniability around assassination schemes. The president's inner circle discussed the pros and cons of eliminating or neutralizing certain individuals and getting rid of or disposing of foreign leaders so as to advance U.S. foreign policy goals. Speaking in riddles to each other became commonplace, Senate investigators found. On February 25, 1960, members of the special group convened to discuss eliminating General Qasim, the Prime Minister of Iraq, the man who had ordered the machine gun killing of the King of Iraq, his family, and his Prime Minister in 1958, and whom Saddam Hussein had tried to kill the following year. A stenographer took notes as the special group discussed setting up a health alteration committee to poison Kasim. We do not consciously seek subjects' permanent removal from the scene. We also do not object should this complication develop, said the CIA's Near East Division Chief. After deliberation, the special group agreed that the Prime Minister should be mailed a monogrammed handkerchief laced with poison. For this, the CIA's new Deputy Director of Plans, Richard Bissell, 
brought the agency's top poison expert, Sidney Gottlieb, on board. The plan never materialized because Prime Minister Kasim's internal enemies killed him first. He suffered a terminal illness before a firing squad in Baghdad, an event we had nothing to do with, a special group memo sarcastically clarified. Other assassination plans discussed by the special group in 1960 involved Patrice Lumumba, Prime Minister of Congo. We agree that planning for the Congo would not necessarily rule out consideration of any particular kind of activity which might contribute to getting rid of Lumumba, members agreed on August 25, 1960, a prime example of special group circumlocution. Killing Rafael Trujillo, president of the Dominican Republic, was also discussed. But the most intense focus during Eisenhower's last year as president was on eliminating Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and Raul Castro. In less than a year, these three revolutionaries had emerged from virtual anonymity to establishing a Soviet foothold on the island nation of Cuba, located just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Unless Fidel and Raul Castro and Che Guevara could be eliminated in one package, J.C. King warned the special group on March 9, 1960, the situation in Cuba would likely be a long, drawn-out affair. Admiral Arlie Burke, chief of naval operations, agreed. Any plan for the removal of Cuban leaders should be a package deal since many of the leaders around Castro are even worse than Castro. In March, the special group reached unanimity. Fidel and Raul Castro and Che Guevara should disappear simultaneously. In the six years that had passed since Che Guevara witnessed the CIA-directed bombing of Guatemala City, he'd become a hardcore guerrilla fighter and an enterprising revolutionary. After leaving Mexico and secretly arriving in Cuba in 1956, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, and a band of guerrilla fighters set up a training camp in the Sierra Mastra and began preparing for revolution. Their rebel army numbered between 12 and 200 men at any given time, and with so few fighters in their ranks, loyalty was everything. This world was black and white. You were friend or enemy. If you were enemy, you were targeted and killed. Desertion, insubordination, and defeatism, wrote Che, were punishable by death. When a rebel fighter named Sergio Acuna was caught trying to run away, he was tortured, shot, and hanged. In his journal, Che called the incident sad but instructive. When Che learned that a guy named Yutimo Guerra had sold information about their group to the Batista regime, he executed him on the spot. The situation was uncomfortable for the people and for Yutimo, so I ended the problem by giving him a shot with a thirty-two pistol in the right side of the brain, Che wrote in his diary. After two and a half years of training in the mountains, on January 1st, 1959, the rebel fighters began making their move on the capital city. Che Guevara led a column of guerrilla fighters out of the mountains and into Havana, while Fidel Castro and a separate column of revolutionaries marched on the south. By the end of the day, in an astonishing display of giving up without a fight, President Batista's 40,000-man Cuban army laid down their arms en masse. Batista fled to the Dominican Republic, allowing the revolutionaries to assume control. The tyranny has been overthrown, Castro declared. The people won the war. Fidel Castro was the leader of Cuba now. Within weeks of taking power, he began executing people perceived to be leftovers from the Batista regime. He named Che Guevara commander of Havana's La Cabana prison, where war crimes tribunals were hastily set up. 
those pronounced guilty were lined up against the prison wall and executed by firing squad. In the days that followed the revolution, more than 150 pro-Batista Cubans were shot dead. When asked by the foreign press about the summary executions, Che fired back, To send men to the firing squad, judicial proof is unnecessary. Besides, he said, the concept of justice was a hypocritical creation of Western capitalists. These procedures are an archaic bourgeois detail, Che insisted. This is a revolution. A revolutionary must become a cold killing machine, motivated by pure hate. The executions were about revenge as much as they were about redress, said Raul Castro. In an interview with the Associated Press, he called the men being executed Batista's assassins and cited their responsibility for what he said were 6,000 Batista-era assassinations in Oriente province alone. Cuba was not experiencing a peaceful transfer of power. There was no swearing-in ceremony. Power was being conveyed through bullets, not ballots. As it was in Vietnam, the CIA was deeply troubled by the majority support these radical revolutionaries garnered from the people. At a rally in Havana on January 21, 1959, Fidel Castro asked an estimated half-million-person crowd if they supported his policy of execution by firing squad. I am going to ask the people something, Castro announced from his podium. Those who agree with the justice that is being carried out, those who agree that the Batista henchmen should be shot, raise your hands. A sea of hands went up, followed by nearly two minutes of applause. Batista is our Hitler, Castro exclaimed, drawing a comparison between the Nuremberg trials and the executions being overseen by Che. The Allied powers punished the war criminals after the Second World War, and they have less right to do so than we have, because they meted out punishment under the ex post facto legislation, while we are punishing the war criminals under legislation passed before the crime, in public trials, in courts made up of honest men. Castro's background as a lawyer was not lost on the CIA. In no time, Fidel Castro began severing ties with American businesses, oil consortiums among them, ending 50 years of bilateral trade. He delivered firebrand anti-American speeches, rallying against capitalism in the West. When he signed a deal with the Soviet Union to buy their oil in return for military and economic aid, the Sovietization of Cuba officially began. Che started learning Russian and hosting Marxist study groups. He wrote and published a book, Guerrilla Warfare, its title an homage to Chairman Mao's on guerrilla warfare. Santa Claus was outlawed in Cuba, English no longer allowed. The Chaplin Cinema in downtown Havana was renamed the Carlos Marx. In Washington, D.C., the Eisenhower White House shuddered to think of all that could go wrong. Castro's Cuba raised the specter of a Soviet outpost at America's doorstep a Senate report read. The State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, the oldest civilian intelligence element in the U.S. government and a direct descendant of the Office of Strategic Services Research Department, sent its director of the American Republics, a man identified in declassified documents as Mr. Hall, to Cuba to assess the situation. What Mr. Hall discovered and reported back to the State Department laid the seeds for a series of Title 50 hidden hand operations, including assassination, in Cuba over the next four years. The hypnotic hold Fidel has over the mob is frightening, Hall reported. He can raise it to a bloodthirsty pitch, then cool it to an obedient ardor. Hitler was never as good, Although it must be admitted he worked on a better educated element, Hall wrote on November 18, 1959. 
Fidel gave one the impression of a complete hysteric with a messianic complex, if not a manic depressive, he observed. But Mr. Hall expressed an even greater sense of foreboding when speaking of Che. Che Guevara did not rant nor rave, spoke in the tone of a man who knows what he wants and how to get it, and, as the best educated of the lot, is a truly sinister character. All gave us the devil. What to do? In Mr. Hall's assessment, Fidel's hold on the lower class and on at least half of the middle class is complete. There is an atmosphere of terror prevalent, and for all purposes a police state exists in Cuba. People are not only afraid to speak before strangers, but persons disappear as in the time of Batista. To Mr. Hall's eye, the devil we knew, General Batista, was gone, and the new devils, Che and Fidel, were far more menacing than previously realized which is when the special group began actively discussing the pros and cons of assassinating Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and Raul Castro at a meeting on January 23, 1960. The following month, the State Department approved a $4.4 million budget to get rid of the three. Possible removal of top three leaders is receiving serious consideration at HQS according to declassified minutes of the meeting. A follow-up memo discussed arranging an accident, but the State Department's Mr. Hall warned against such action. The assassination of Fidel would bring about looting and a bloodbath such as Havana has never known, cautioned Hall. Over the next four months, various means of assassination were considered. Then, in July 1960, Alan Dulles vetoed the idea. Dulles favored a covert action to invade Cuba with an exile army and force a coup d'etat. Styled after what the CIA had done in Guatemala, this was meant to be a hidden hand operation. Instead, it would become known to the world as the most inglorious CIA debacle of all time, the failed invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. The invading paramilitary force would be drawn from anti-Castro refugees living in Miami. After Fidel Castro and Che Guevara took power in 1959, some 100,000 Cuban refugees fled the country, a great majority of them landing in Miami. The U.S. government set up resettlement programs, offering housing and jobs to this new diaspora. The CIA began setting up its hidden hand operations for Cuba inside a nondescript building on the University of Miami campus, codename Building 25. For a period of time in the 1960s, the CIA's Miami station was the largest CIA intelligence operation facility in the world. Case officers assigned to Operation J.M. Wave began keeping track of Cuban emigres, creating profiles and databases, and ultimately figuring out who best to approach for its forthcoming covert action. In the summer of 1960, the CIA began recruiting assets from a pool of young anti-Castro dissidents of fighting age to make up a paramilitary force codenamed Brigade 2506. What started out as 28 men in a South Florida jungle training camp would eventually grow to more than 1,400 paramilitary operators, spies, saboteurs, and pilots trained by the CIA and the U.S. Army Green Berets. One among them was a 19-year-old architecture student named Felix Rodriguez. Well-educated, determined, and nationalistic, Felix Rodriguez was born into a ruling-class family in Sancti Spiritus in central Cuba in 1942. When he was 12, Rodriguez's wealthy uncle Toto 
who served as President Batista's Minister of Public Works, paid for him to attend an American boarding school in Pennsylvania. When the revolution happened in 1959, Felix Rodriguez and his family were vacationing in Mexico. There, they received word that the Castro regime had seized their properties and turned them over to the state. The family never returned to Cuba, instead moving to Miami. Exiled from his homeland, the young Felix Rodriguez became fiercely anti-Castro. His parents begged him to accept what was, he says, to move on and embrace their new situation. They bought him an Aston Martin convertible and enrolled him in the University of Miami. But Felix Rodriguez wanted none of it. I was more interested in joining an anti-Castro organization than I was in continuing my education, he explains. In the fall of 1960, while preparing to begin freshman classes at the university, he was approached by a clandestine service case officer with the CIA. I knew the mission was to overthrow the government of Fidel Castro, Rodriguez explained in 2017, but I had no idea I was being recruited by the CIA. In those days, he guesses, not one in a thousand Cubans had ever even heard of the Central Intelligence Agency. Rodriguez believed the cover story he and the other recruits were told, that the man paying for the paramilitary action was a wealthy sugar mill baron whose property in Cuba had also been confiscated by the Castro regime. Felix Rodriguez was thrilled to be chosen for a commando operation against the Castro regime. In September 1960, he learned the mission was a go. We were told we were going to a secret location not in the U.S., Rodriguez recalls. He and a group of young Cuban exiles were driven to an airport in Opa-Laca, Florida, the same airport the CIA used for its Guatemala coup d'etat. Our clothes and personal possessions were taken. We were strip-searched to make sure we weren't carrying any forbidden articles, like a compass. Our watches were confiscated so we wouldn't know how long we flew. The truck drove into a closed hangar where the men disembarked, only to be greeted by U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Services, INS, officials, who gave each of them a form to fill out. It dawned on Rodriguez that if we were leaving the country, we were apparently doing it with the approval of the U.S. government. Dressed in army fatigues and a khaki shirt, the rebel fighters were loaded onto a C-54 aircraft, its windows painted black, then flown for several hours, landing just before dawn. After we landed, a jeep drove up, and I noticed immediately that it had Guatemalan plates. The CIA's paramilitary army was in Guatemala City as guests of President Roberto Alejos Arzu, a friend of the CIA. The CIA's anti-Castro covert action training camp was located 80 miles northwest of Guatemala City in the countryside of Retalejo, codenamed Camp Tracks. At this abandoned coffee plantation, owned by a business associate of President Arzu, U.S. Army Green Berets trained the Cuban emigres in guerrilla warfare techniques, including pistol shooting, map reading, and hand-to-hand -hand combat, but also more ambitious tactics like how to land an amphibious craft on a rocky beach and how to use explosives powerful enough to take out a bridge. Conditions were grim, Rodriguez recalls. It was humid beyond measure. Poisonous insects and alligators were a constant threat. But morale was high, thanks to the camp's enthusiastic commanding officer, Colonel Napoleon Valeriano. Colonel Valeriano was an unconventional warfare legend among commandos in training. As a young army soldier in World War II, Valeriano had been infiltrated into the Philippines by submarine. 
There, he led guerrilla warfare operations against the Japanese, alongside Colonel Volkman, one of the original founders of the U.S. Army Special Forces, with General Robert McClure and Colonel Aaron Bank. Valierno's staff of trainers at Camp Tracks were Ukrainian-born Green Berets, beneficiaries of the Lodge Philbin Act, called Lodge Billers, many of whom trained with the 10th Special Forces at Bad Tolts. These Green Berets taught the Cuban Exile Army how to shoot Thompson submachine guns, 57-millimeter recoilless rifles, and 45 caliber pistols, remembers Rodriguez, an 18-year-old novice at the time. They gave us instructions in explosives, communications, jungle survival, and escape and evasion techniques. We learned how to judge the distance of the enemy from sound and muzzle flash. Four months into the training, the group was flown to the Panama Canal Zone to the U.S. base Fort Clayton for a New Year's Eve party. Our instructors provided Heineken beer and wine so we could celebrate. Shortly before midnight, Rodriguez remembers being struck with a truly inspired idea, he explains, an operation that would shorten the war and save lives. He volunteered to assassinate Fidel Castro. And the CIA took me up on the idea, he says. One week later, Felix Rodriguez was flown to Miami, where he was taken to a safe house in the homestead area outside the city. I was given a rifle and told to wait. Soon, he'd be infiltrated into Cuba by boat, his handler told him, then taken to Havana, where local partisans working with the CIA would assist him. In Havana, he would go to the upper floor of a predetermined building, set up his high-powered rifle in an open window, and assassinate Fidel Castro as Castro rode by during a parade on the street below. While the CIA was training Brigade 2506 for a paramilitary invasion of Cuba, the special group approved another covert action operation inside Cuba's Caribbean island neighbor, the Dominican Republic, 500 miles to the east. The plan was to assassinate the nation's corrupt, unelected leader, General Rafael Trujillo. For three decades, Trujillo, kept in power by American allies, had ruled his country by terror. Trujillo was power-mad and masochistic. Historians hold him responsible for tens of thousands of extrajudicial killings, including those in 1937 in the border region with Haiti, which would become known as the Parsley Massacre. Few bullets were used, according to a UN Security Council report on the mass killing. Instead, 20,000 to 30,000 Haitians were bludgeoned and bayoneted, then herded into the sea, where sharks finished what Trujillo had begun. For reasons that remain murky, suddenly in the winter of 1960, President Eisenhower's special group decided the United States would end its support of Trujillo. Ambassador Joseph Farland remembers appealing to Trujillo's daughter, Flor, during a visit to her home outside the nation's capital. I drove out to her house in a Volkswagen that I had and said, Your father is going to be assassinated. There is no question in my mind whatsoever about that. We want him to retire and leave this country. When Trujillo refused an offer of exile, the special group agreed it was time to eliminate him. He kept law and order, and he didn't bother the United States, so that was fine with us, said the State Department's Henry Dearborn in a 1991 oral history interview. Dearborn served as charge d'affaires at the embassy in Santo Domingo, which had been renamed Cuidad Trujillo or Trujillo City. Something had to be done about this man, Dearborn recalled. On March 16, 1961, Matters took an active turn, according to a CIA document marked top secret, later reviewed by a Senate Intelligence Committee. They, 
the CIA, developed an assassination plot which, because of my close relationship with them, I was fully aware of, Dearborn testified. Dearborn served as liaison between the CIA and the assassination team, which was made up of seven anti-Trujillo partisans. I carried out the contacts with the opposition reporting to CIA, Dearborn clarified. We were using all these weird means of communication because we didn't want to be seen with each other. Things like notes in the bottom of the grocery bag, rolled up in cigars. Richard Bissell, then working as CIA station chief in Santo Domingo, oversaw plans on the ground. On March 22nd, he requested that headquarters send him three 38 caliber revolvers and ammunition. In a separate cable, Dearborn wrote, Plans for Trujillo's assassination coming to a head. The following week, Bissell briefed Dearborn. A shipment of four machine guns and 240 rounds of ammunition was en route to the U.S. Embassy, which he was to give to the assassins in a clandestine manner. Separately, three carbine rifles were being dropped off at the U.S. Embassy by a Navy contact, Bissell said. Dearborn kept the assassins in the loop through a liaison or cutout so as to ensure he never had direct contact with the killers. I had a different typewriter on which I typed out my messages to the opposition so that it wouldn't be traced to embassy typewriters, Dearborn recalled. But in truth, I had told the State Department via CIA communications all about the plan. Dearborn's job was to maintain plausible deniability should anything go wrong. I knew how they were planning to do it. I knew, more or less, who was involved. Although I was always able to say that I personally did not know any of the assassins, I knew those who were pulling the strings. Until then, he had a facade of diplomacy to uphold. There had to be a certain set of circumstances when they could put their plan into action. For now, he was ordered to wait. Meanwhile, in Miami, the lethal covert action operation in which Felix Rodriguez would assassinate Fidel Castro was given the green light. It was the second week in January 1961, Rodriguez recalls, just days before John F. Kennedy took office as president. Late one night, a handler picked up Felix Rodriguez from the safe house outside Miami where he'd been staying. Rifle case in hand, he was driven to a small beach in the Florida Keys. The driver flashed the lights and a small boat came ashore, he recalls. Rodriguez climbed into a small rubber boat that ferried him out to a much larger yacht waiting about a half mile out at sea. The captain was an American, Rodriguez remembers, but the crew were all Ukrainians tough-looking SOBs who carried Soviet bloc automatic weapons. Back at the safe house, Rodriguez was told he wouldn't have to sight the rifle when he arrived in Cuba. It had already been zeroed in. The resistance army in Cuba had obtained a building in Havana, facing a location that Castro frequented at the time, and they'd managed to pre-sight the rifle, says Rodriguez. Under the cover of night, the yacht sped across the ocean to infiltrate Cuba near Varadero Beach on the north coast. We showed up at a predetermined location, recalls Rodriguez, but the rendezvous boat failed to show and the group returned to Miami. Days later, another attempt was made. Arriving at the target area the second time, Rodriguez recalls seeing a hundred-foot-long ship, clearly far too large for a clandestine op. It looked like a ghost ship. We couldn't see anybody on board. The group aborted the mission a second time and again returned to Miami. On a third infiltration attempt, the yacht suffered hydraulic failure. Back in Miami, the vessel was met by a case officer who asked Felix Rodriguez for the rifle and ammunition. They said they'd changed their minds about the mission, Rodriguez recalls. 
In Washington, D.C., President Eisenhower and his staff prepared to leave the White House. The baton would now pass to the handsome young senator from Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy. The day before Kennedy's inauguration, he met with President Eisenhower in the Oval Office. Partially declassified records from this meeting on January 19, 1961, indicate that the outgoing and incoming presidents discussed the most critical covert action operations being planned by the special group in Cuba, Vietnam, and Laos. The incoming president was struck by the idea of covert action, of a hidden hand power to be wielded at the sole discretion of the commander-in-chief. One of his first actions as president was to meet with the special group to learn more. Just eight days after taking office, the CIA's Edward Lansdale briefed President Kennedy on the dire situation in Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh and General Jap's mobile warfare campaign was as aggressive as it was ruthless, assassinating an average of 11 civil servants every day. Vietnam is in a critical condition, and we should treat it as a combat area of the Cold War, as an area requiring emergency treatment, Lansdale told the president. Kennedy appealed directly to Congress, bringing to its attention the assassination campaign. In a speech called Urgent National Needs, he warned of Soviet hidden-hand operations in Vietnam and elsewhere, and the existential threat communism posed to the free world. Their aggression is more often concealed than open, Kennedy said. They have fired no missiles, and their troops are seldom seen. They send arms, agitators, aid, technicians, and propaganda to every troubled area. But where fighting is required, it is usually done by others, by guerrillas striking at night, by assassins striking alone, assassins who have taken the lives of 4,000 civil officers in the last 12 months in Vietnam alone. Vietnam, Laos, Cuba President Kennedy inherited complex, hidden-hand operations in each of these three tiny countries from his predecessor. He also inherited President Eisenhower's special group, to which he quickly added his brother, U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. It was an unusual arrangement with far-reaching consequences. As chairman of the special group, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, the most senior Justice Department official in the United States, was now in charge of overseeing the CIA's covert operations, most of which the majority of Americans would consider illegal. Assassination was at the top of the list. Part 2, 1961 Chapter 10. An Assassination Capability On the morning of February 23, 1961, in the residential Miramar district of Havana, Che Guevara left his home on 17th Street and walked with his bodyguards down the pretty, tree-lined street headed to his car. As he climbed in the driver's seat, Four or five assassins emerged from where they'd been hiding in the bushes and opened fire. A violent gun battle left one of Che's neighbors, a man identified as Mr. Salinas, dead on the grass. As Che sped away, his bodyguards continued firing. Inside the house, Che's wife, Alida, heard the intense gunfire. She grabbed their three-month-old daughter, Aladita, and with their nanny, rushed to hide under the stairwell. In Havana, there was a news blackout on the attempted assassination. Aleda Guevara kept her story secret for 30 years, sharing it with Che's biographer, John Lee Anderson, after she left Cuba for Spain to live in exile. Because Cuba is a police state, very little unflattering news ever leaves the island. 
that such an important leader as Che Guevara would be vulnerable to assassination was not a message the Castro regime wanted to convey. Instead, a semi-official cover story emerged, purporting that the dead man, Mr. Salinas, had been having an affair and that the killing was an illicit romance gone awry. In a country where possession of an illegal firearm was a capital offense, the cover story seems implausible. Was the CIA involved? Or were the assassins really anti-Castro Cubans acting on their own? Further news was repressed, not surprising, given Che Guevara's views of the press. Newspapers are instruments of the oligarchy, he told the Cuban people. We must eliminate all newspapers. We cannot make a revolution with free press. As of 2019, the mystery remains unsolved. But in response to the assassination attempt against him, Che Guevara is said to have kept a grenade in the cigar box he often carried. After three failed attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro, in late January or early February 1961, Felix Rodriguez was reassigned to the CIA's Brigade 2506. He was emplaced on a five-man, direct-action, paramilitary team called a Gray Team. The Gray Teams would be infiltrated into Cuba in advance of an assault by Brigade 2506, at Bahia de Cojinos, the Bay of Pigs. Assassination plans aside, the CIA was now moving forward with a covert action amphibious invasion followed by a coup d'etat. The CIA was relying on its gray teams to locate, train, and equip pockets of previously identified resistance fighters, similar to what the OSS Jedbergs had done shortly after Allied forces stormed the beaches at Normandy. But in France, 93 Jedberg teams had been airdropped in behind enemy lines. In Cuba, there were just seven teams, each made up of five men. It was high risk, Rodriguez remembers. Thirty-five of us went to Cuba. Only fifteen survived. On February 28, 1961, Rodriguez and the members of his gray team left an isolated beach in Key West, bound for Cuba. This time, instead of a yacht, they rowed in a 25-foot Zodiac boat, filled to the gunnels with weapons and explosives. Four and a half hours later, the team made a stealth beach landing at Arcos de Canazi, 40 miles east of Havana. It was Rodriguez's first time back in Cuba since he was a schoolboy. We had our weapons and backpacks, but we also had two tons of equipment, explosives, grenades, machine guns, ammunition, and communications equipment. To be caught likely meant summary execution. Rodriguez and his gray team members were met on the beach by anti-Castro partisans, local farmers and sugar mill workers who were members of a group called Movimiento de Recuperación Revolucionaria, MRR, a pro-U.S. resistance movement. The MRR had already been partially armed. CIA air branch pilots had managed to covertly airdrop bundles of World War II-era M3 submachine guns and 45 caliber pistols. In addition to the CIA's ground branch, there is Air Branch, which is the aviation wing of the Special Activities Division, and Maritime Branch for amphibious operations. There's also a political action arm, which interfaces with all three branches. From the beachhead at Arcos de Canasi, Felix Rodriguez was driven to Camagüey, where he was met with the head of the Cuban resistance, a young man who went by the code name Francisco. Seeing him on the street, you'd mistake him for a student, recalls Rodriguez. Francisco was an eloquent, soft-spoken engineering student. He naturally inspired people, Rodriguez said. The popularity of Francisco's movement made him the number one target of Castro's intelligence services, 
and meeting with him was a tense affair. Over the next few weeks, Felix Rodriguez moved from safe house to safe house around Havana, meeting individually with leaders of the underground. In mid-March, he was called back to Miami to resupply. Then he was told that he'd be reinserted again soon. The invasion would be happening any day now. Finally, word came. I was driven to the Keys by a lanky Texan who went by the code name Sherman, Rodriguez recalls. He presented me with something special to take to Cuba, a mini flamethrower. It fit very comfortably in one hand, yet it threw a 15-foot-yard-wide column of white phosphorus flame. The Texan told Rodriguez that the weapon was highly classified, but he wanted me to have it anyway. This time, he was inserted near Moron on the central coast. There, he was met by another member of the underground and driven to Havana in an old Buick, the flamethrower hidden underneath the dashboard. Rodriguez was dropped off at a safe house in El Vedado and told to lay low and await orders. In its Bay of Pigs invasion planning, the CIA pulled yet again from its own history, as we have seen. Modeling the invasion and coup on the Guatemala operation was ironic, given that those operations had radicalized Che Guevara. But Cuba in 1961 was a very different environment in which to operate than Guatemala had been in 1954. President Arbenz commanded an army of 10,000 men. Fidel Castro allegedly had a million soldiers on call. Arbenz, a socialist, did not run Guatemala as a military dictatorship. Castro controlled the people of Cuba with absolute power, using Soviet tactics of repression and fear. Most significant of all, Arbenz did not have a direct line to the Kremlin the way Castro did. In hindsight, the CIA's disastrous covert action Bay of Pigs operation was born of wishful thinking. As with all military dictatorships, spies in Cuba were ubiquitous. For the CIA, the threat of a double agent was a constant source of concern. Unknown to the agency, Castro had managed to infiltrate its ranks long before the invasion was given the green light. In Miami, the CIA had recruited Benigno Perez Vivancos, a former lieutenant in Castro's army, thinking he was an anti-Castro emigre. Vivancos stood out as brave and reliable and became the 78th fighting-age male recruited for Brigade 2506. In fact, he was a Castro loyalist sent by Havana to spy. The actions of this double agent proved deadly. On the night of April 1, 1961, not long after Felix Rodriguez arrived in Havana with his mini flamethrower, Castro's G-2 intelligence conducted a raid on a house outside Havana and captured Francisco, whose real name was Rogelio González Corso. Tried and found guilty, he was immediately executed. Based on information provided by Vivancos, Castro's government rounded up thousands of people it identified as members of the resistance. Castro herded them into theaters, stadiums, and military bases to squelch the possibility of a spontaneous uprising to overthrow his regime, says a CIA Inspector General report. Unaware of the compromise, Rodriguez waited for word of the invasion. On April 13th, at CIA headquarters, Brigade 2506 was given the green light to set sail from Guatemala. On the morning of April 15th, eight B-26 bombers supplied by the CIA and flown by Cuban emigre pilots attacked military airfields in Cuba in the first move of the covert operation. In response, Castro played an ingenious and unforeseen political card. He ordered his foreign minister, Raul Roa, 
to call the United Nations Political and Security Committee in New York City and demand that an emergency session be held. The request was honored. The session attended by the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson. Cuba's foreign minister rightly decried the United States for having attacked a sovereign nation unprovoked. This was bad news for President Kennedy, whose number one priority was hiding the hand of the U.S. government, lamented an anonymous CIA staff historian in an agency report kept classified for decades. Lying to the U.N. had serious consequences, and a second airstrike would put the United States in an awkward position internationally. The result meant disaster for Brigade 2506. President Kennedy's political considerations trumped the military importance of a D-Day airstrike. Without a second strike, the amphibious assault had no chance for success. And the element of surprise was no longer there. Shortly before dawn the following morning, with Brigade 2506 just hours away from landing at the Bay of Pigs, President Kennedy canceled the second round of airstrikes. Pilots who'd been sitting on the runway awaiting orders for takeoff were told to stand down. As the sun rose on the morning of April 17th, 1,311 members of Brigade 2506 made an amphibious landing. But instead of accomplishing a stealth infiltration, the CIA's paramilitary army of Cuban exiles were met on shore by Castro's military, whose forces far outnumbered and outgunned them. In Havana, Felix Rodriguez learned about the Bay of Pigs invasion while listening to the radio. All the Cuban radio stations were broadcasting the same emergency network, he remembers, saying the same thing, that the Americans had tried to launch a coup d'etat and had failed. Peering out the window, Rodriguez watched in horror as a sea of military vehicles moved through the streets, each one overflowing with Castro's soldiers. On Cuban state TV, news footage showed members of Brigade 2506 as they were captured on the beach and marched off into the woods, their fates unknown. Four members of Felix Rodriguez's gray team were picked up and arrested. Rodriguez fled the safe house and made a run for the Venezuelan embassy. He was aware of a treaty that allowed political refugees safe passage out of Cuba. After weeks in hiding inside the embassy, he was finally loaded onto a bus of refugees and driven to the airport. In a bitter twist of fate, the bus drove first through Miramar, passing Che Guevara's home on 17th Street, where, two months earlier, the assassination attempt against him had failed. It continued on past Uncle Toto's once grand home on 5th Avenue and 28th Street, where Felix had enjoyed so many happy childhood memories. It had been turned over to the state, says Rodriguez. Like all private property, it would be divided up among the people. Later, I would learn five Soviet families were living there, he recalls. The Bay of Pigs was an extraordinary political embarrassment for President Kennedy. In the Dominican Republic, Consul General Henry Dearborn, the U.S. State Department's charge d'affaires at the embassy in Santo Domingo, was woken up in the middle of the night and told to cancel the CIA's plan to assassinate Trujillo. I recall a frantic message from the State Department, I guess signed off on by President Kennedy, Dearborn remembered in 1991. It was saying, in effect, Look, we have all this trouble with Castro. We don't want any more trouble in the Caribbean. Tell those people to knock it off, meaning the assassination plot. Dearborn followed orders, he says. I communicated to the opposition people that Washington was very much against any attempt at assassination. The answer I got back from them was, just tell Washington it is none of their business. This is our business. We have planned it, and we are going to do it, 
and there is nothing you can do about it. I relayed this to Washington, said Dearborn. The plan to assassinate Trujillo went ahead despite Washington's eleventh-hour attempts to call it off. On the night of May 30th, 1961, Trujillo was seated in the back seat of his chauffeur-driven 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air, traveling down a country road outside the capital when he was ambushed by a group of seven assassins brandishing weapons provided to the rebel group by the CIA. We started shooting, recalled one of the killers, General Antonio Embart, in an interview with the BBC in 2011. President Trujillo and his chauffeur were both armed and they began shooting back. Trujillo managed to get out of the car. Trujillo was wounded, but he was still walking, so I shot him again and killed him, said General Imber. We put him in our car and took him away. The assassins drove the dictator's dead body to a safe house belonging to the partisans, where it was later discovered by state police. Dearborn remembered hearing the news. He was out in the suburbs at a country club. The Chinese ambassador was giving some kind of a money-raising thing for charity to which I went. After the event ended, Dearborn and a colleague left together in a State Department car. We started back around 11 p.m. and ran into a roadblock along the Ocean Highway. The state police were stopping cars and conducting searches. They looked in trunks, pulled up rugs, etc. I had a CIA fellow in the car. Along about January, the CIA had sent a couple of people into the consulate, and I said, Bob, this is it. I am sure this is it. The state police wouldn't let the men continue down that road. When we finally got to the embassy, where I had been living for about a year, the telephone rang, and one of my main contacts of the opposition said, it is over. He is dead. I knew immediately what happened and went down to the office and sent off a message to Washington. For the CIA, the assassination of President Trujillo had been an inadvertent success. The killers got away, although they were soon to be betrayed by co-conspirator General José Román. Hundreds of people suspected of being complicit in Trujillo's assassination were rounded up, detained, and tortured in a move that echoed what happened in Czechoslovakia after Reinhard Heydrich's assassination by the British Special Operations Executive. Six of the seven Trujillo assassins were caught and executed. Only General Antonio Imbert got away. Decades later, the consensus in the Dominican Republic is that killing Trujillo was a heroic act, a textbook example of tyrannicide, the justified killing of a tyrant. We Dominicans react very negatively when the people who killed Trujillo are called assassins, says Bernardo Vega, a former ambassador to the United States. Killing the cruelest dictator in the Americas, says Vega, was a good thing to do. The week after General Trujillo was buried, the U.S. State Department's Henry Dearborn was notified of a plan for his assassination. Dearborn was ordered to pack up his things, drive to the airport, and leave at once. He hurried to his office and loaded all the secret files into a burn barrel to destroy. Now, in good conscience, he said, he could leave. In a State Department oral history, he relayed a funny incident that drew to a close his three years as America's top diplomat in the Dominican Republic. I had my shirt, tie, shoes, and socks on, but couldn't find my pants, he remembered. I said to my administrative assistant, an officer's wife, Where are my pants? She said, Oh my God, I packed them. She had to go back down to the car outside and unpack my pants so that I could leave the country with dignity. Upon landing in the United States, Dearborn was called to Washington, D.C. to participate in a briefing of the President of the United States. John F. Kennedy himself, intensely interested in covert action, 
had asked to be briefed on the Trujillo assassination by those involved. In declassified Senate testimony, Dearborn later recalled, One enlightening part of the discussion occurred when I interrupted Kennedy and said, I think that... The president interrupted me and said, We already know what you think. In his oral history, Dearborn made clear what President Kennedy's statement meant to him. That showed clearly enough that he had been reading my cables, Dearborn said. Dearborn's remembrance is notable, given an official Department of Justice summation with respect to Trujillo's assassination. In giving testimony for the Attorney General's official report, that would be Attorney General Robert Kennedy, chairman of the special group, the CIA officials who were interviewed stated that they had no active part but had a faint connection with the groups that in fact did assassinate the president. Henry Dearborn knew otherwise. When the meeting with the president broke up, he shook hands with me and said, You did a good job down there. Dearborn stood by his actions and those taken by the President's special group advisors, the State Department, and the CIA. It is my firmly held view that those who killed Trujillo and those who backed them up would have acted if there had never been a CIA. They were only waiting for a favorable domestic and international atmosphere to give them the required courage, Dearborn stated on the record in 1991. He died in 2013 at the age of 100. Shortly after Rafael Trujillo was assassinated, President Kennedy's special group formalized assassination as a foreign policy tool, a program it called executive action capability, but which Congress later determined as an assassination capability. Declassified testimony given to Senate investigators by CIA Deputy Director of Plans Richard Bissell suggests that the person who authorized the assassination capability was President Kennedy. The special group, augmented, had received its orders from National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy and Deputy National Security Advisor Walt Rostow, Bissell told Senate investigators behind closed doors. But these presidential advisors would not have given such encouragement unless they were confident that it would meet with the president's approval. Moving forward under the Kennedy administration, Assassination operations acquired new euphemisms, including direct positive action, neutralization operations, an accident plot, and the last resort. Under the impossibly unsubtle cryptonym ZR Rifle, the CIA's Executive Action Office was staffed with an array of people from senior managers to case officers, even a principal agent with the primary task of spotting agent candidates, operatives willing to carry out and to conceal the executive action capability. The CIA's Technical Services Division provided covert action operators with whatever items they might need, from disguises to weapons to poisons. The Directorate of Support handled financial and administrative matters. The Office of Security made sure overseas clandestine facilities remained secure. Assassination was now an acceptable course of action, Congress learned, made possible through the establishment of plausible deniability. The chairman of the special group was usually responsible for determining which project required presidential consideration, and from keeping him abreast of developments. According to Bissell, after President Kennedy appointed his brother chairman of the special group Augmented, the construct became almost impenetrable. In this way, a system of plausible denial was fortified said Bissell, a series of obfuscations that served as circuit breakers for presidents, 
preventing the Oval Office from being dragged into scandal should a hidden hand operation be revealed. The President's assassination capability was intended to serve as a means of bringing order to the increasingly volatile situations unfolding in Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam. Instead, it created mayhem, chaos, and collapse. But the real question, the riddle wrapped inside a mystery, inside an enigma, was and remains. By allowing the use of assassination as a hidden hand foreign policy tool, did President Kennedy become an easier target to assassinate? Chapter 11 JFK KIA President John F. Kennedy was outraged with the CIA over the failure at the Bay of Pigs, which stained his first 100 days as president. He'd campaigned on an anti-communist plank, singling out Cuba as a hostile and militant communist satellite, receiving guidance, support, and arms from Moscow and Peking. To have failed so publicly, so early in his presidency, infuriated him. Adding insult to injury, Che Guevara personally expressed his gratitude to the young president for the spectacular defeat, using White House emissary Richard Goodwin to relay his sarcastic message. Guevara said he wanted to thank us very much for the invasion, Goodwin told the president that it had been a great political victory for them, enabled them to consolidate and transform Cuba from an aggrieved little country to an equal. In response, President Kennedy made a move so shocking it upended covert action operations in a way not seen since the creation of Title 50 and National Security Council Directive 10 NSC 10 he gutted the existing paramilitary authority at the CIA, making any large paramilitary operation that was wholly or partially covert now the primary responsibility of the Defense Department, with CIA in a supporting role. The fiasco at the Bay of Pigs changed everything, says CIA staff historian John L. Helgerson. CIA Director Alan Dulles asked to meet with the president, who refused. The president's mind was made up. There is no point in the DCI, Director of Central Intelligence, discussing the matter directly with the president, as that would be counterproductive. Presidential Advisor General Chester Clifton curtly informed the CIA. For the first time since 1947, the Pentagon was now in charge of the President's guerrilla warfare corps. I can't overemphasize the shock, not simply the words, that procedure caused in Washington, to the Secretary of State, to the Secretary of Defense, and particularly to the Director of Central Intelligence, said Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty chief of special operations for the joint chiefs of staff under kennedy historians have glossed over that or don't know about it prouty said in 1989 kennedy lost the battle for a democratic cuba in a most humiliating and public way now he was unwilling to experience a loss in vietnam it wasn't that the new president opposed hidden hand paramilitary operations. He opposed the CIA's handling of them. In a series of meetings with his national security advisors, he ordered covert action operations to be accelerated in Vietnam, only now they would be led by U.S. Army Special Forces. This maverick move would have far-reaching consequences, not just in Vietnam, but around the world, and not just in 1961, but for decades to come. By their very definition, paramilitary operations exist outside formal military operations. Para means distinct from. 
to have the Defense Department now engaging in non-official military operations inside a foreign country during peacetime was a radical move into uncharted territory. Immediately after the Bay of Pigs, President Kennedy asked top advisor General Maxwell Taylor to review all U.S. paramilitary capabilities and advise on next steps. Taylor submitted a report recommending that the president broaden the scope of classified covert operations in Vietnam. Kennedy authorized three top-secret national security action memorandums in succession, significantly widening a war that technically did not exist. To oversee operations in theater, the Joint Chiefs of Staff created a new office inside the Pentagon called the Special Assistant for Counterinsurgency and Special Activities, SACSA, to be run by a military general and his staff. SACSA would now function as the CIA's Office of Policy Coordination had during Korea. The man chosen to run SACSA was a Marine Corps general named Victor Brute Krulak. A legend among his men, Brute Krulak was famous at the Pentagon for the risky nighttime amphibious raids he'd led on islands across the Pacific during World War II. On one of these raids, he was leading 30 commandos on an ambush when their vessel hit a reef and began to sink. Facing certain death, they were rescued by a torpedo boat crew commanded by a young lieutenant colonel named John F. Kennedy. The president and the general had history, and now Krulak was entrusted with a highly classified, highly unorthodox new job at the Department of Defense to oversee quasi-military operations inside a sovereign nation against a belligerent force of guerrilla fighters without a formal declaration of war. One of Saxa's first questions was what to do about Laos. President Eisenhower left John F. Kennedy with a muddled, complicated, and intractable situation in Laos. Laos was a victim of geography, Kennedy's special group advisors told him, hardly a nation except in the legal sense. But to lose Laos would be the beginning of the loss of most of the Far East, Eisenhower forewarned. In an effort to contain communist insurgency within Vietnam's borders, President Kennedy decided to pursue diplomacy in Laos he canceled Operation White Star and instructed his advisors to negotiate a neutralization treaty. In July 1962, the governments of the United States, the Soviet Union, North Vietnam, and numerous other nations signed the Declaration on the Neutrality of Laos, agreeing to leave Laos alone. They all did, says scholar Richard Schultz except for the NVA, the Army of North Vietnam. Insurgents do not honor borders or treaties. This reality continues to plague the Defense Department in 2019. The Laos Neutralization Treaty of 1962 was a colossal deception and a huge strategic win for North Vietnam. By the time the treaty was signed, Hanoi had already spent three long years building a clandestine transportation route and logistical system from Hanoi through Laos and into the south. Eventually, it would also include trails through Cambodia. This was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the secret supply route Hanoi used to move fighters and weapons into territory it sought to control in the south. While the United States felt bound by honor to adhere to the neutrality declaration, Hanoi escalated its prohibited use of the trail. This gave the communists extraordinary momentum and new advantage at a critical time in their revolution. Blind to the realities of the trail, the month after the Laos Treaty was signed, Secretary of Defense 
Robert McNamara, called a meeting in Honolulu, Hawaii, bringing together the Defense Department, the Pacific Command, the CIA, and the State Department. McNamara presented Operation Switchback, a robust covert action program designed to inflict increasing punishment upon North Vietnam. One of the first orders of business was to create a new guerrilla warfare corps for the president to carry out the punishment promised by the Secretary of Defense. Now in a subordinate role, the CIA merged its existing paramilitary program, the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, CIDG, into the Defense Department's Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Mac V. Billy Waugh was an early member of the group and became one of the first Green Berets sent to Vietnam in this capacity. Waugh's group trained President Diem soldiers in paramilitary tactics, in everything from sabotage and assassination to evade and escape, Waugh recalls. The goal of the CIDG program was to create direct action strike force units made up of South Vietnamese peasants from indigenous hill tribes led by U.S. Army Green Berets and CIA advisors. This was a grander, more ambitious version of what the OSS special operations groups, including the Jedbergs, had accomplished during World War II. Waugh and his fellow trainers were to arm the rebels and teach them how to sabotage, subvert, and assassinate the communist infiltrators coming down from the north. The effort was astonishing. Unlike the CIA, whose access to military resources had been limited, SAXA had the Defense Department to call upon, with its resupply capacity that seemed to know no bounds. Through a CIDG support office on Okinawa, warfighting supplies were airdropped into Vietnam by the ton. Each month, an average of 740 tons of weapons and supplies were delivered to special forces units set up in remote villages across South Vietnam. By the end of 1962, there were over 33,000 300 South Vietnamese peasants being paid by the Defense Department to participate in the CIDG program. Assigned American military-style titles, the participants were broken down by number, 6,000 direct action strike force troops, 19,000 village defender militia, 2,700 mountain scouts, 5,300 popular forces troops, and 300 border surveillance guards. Twelve months later, the number skyrocketed again. There were now more than 87,000 peasants on U.S. taxpayer payroll. But the program was grossly ineffective. When the NVA and Viet Cong attacked a village, the strike force just ran away. This is not to say that they were afraid, wrote Colonel Francis J. Kelly, an unconventional warfare expert for the Pentagon and the man who later commanded all special forces in Vietnam. Most had seen a great deal of fighting. They were just not interested in or even remotely enthusiastic about the program. From the point of view of the Vietnam special forces and the government, the CIDG program was an American project. For No Din Diem, the American-supported president of South Vietnam, what was happening in remote areas of the country meant very little. His own situation in Saigon had become dire. The Americans were beginning to lose faith in his leadership, and his military generals were plotting to overthrow him. The people of South Vietnam hated him. He persecuted Buddhists and liberal Democrats in equal measure, arresting monks and nightclub owners, banning boxing matches and beauty pageants. He could barely control the unrest that was building in the cities in Saigon and Hue. 
When people gathered to protest, Diem dispatched military police to beat them into submission. By the spring of 1963, Diem's presidency was on the brink of collapse. The Kennedy White House now viewed the colonialist in the white three-piece suit as a losing horse. The only person in South Vietnam more hated than President Diem was his brother, No Din Nu, chief of the secret police and commander of Army Special Forces. In a last-ditch effort to salvage Diem's presidency, the White House wondered if perhaps the real problem wasn't new. Through State Department channels, President Diem was told to consider getting rid of his brother. Word came back, never. The tipping point came in June 1963, when in protest of Diem's policies, a Buddhist monk named Thich Quang Duc set himself on fire in the middle of a busy Saigon street. The self-immolation was photographed and the image of a human being on fire was reprinted in newspapers around the world. While the international community was shocked by the horror and tragedy of the monk's self-sacrifice, the Diem regime publicly mocked him. This led to what would become known as the Buddhist uprisings. In August 1963, after Diem declared martial law, the White House decided that it would no longer support President Diem. The CIA dispatched Lieutenant Colonel Lucien Conin to gather intelligence. Conin served the CIA as the Saigon Station Liaison between Henry Cabot Lodge, then serving as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, and South Vietnam's top military generals, a job Conin did well, owing to a unique history with several of Diem's generals. Back in 1945, the French-speaking Conin served as a member of the OSS Deer Team, the American group that armed and trained Ho Chi Minh, General Jap, and several hundred of their Viet Minh guerrilla fighters. During that time period, Conin befriended many young Vietnamese officers, some of whom now served as generals under President Diem. In an effort to determine what was happening at the palace, Conin met with several of Diem's generals, using a dentist's office for these clandestine meetings. Conin learned that the generals were planning to overthrow President Diem. The leader of the insurrection was General Duong Van Min, Big Min as he was known. Conin relayed this information to the president and his advisors. In turn, Conin was told to tell the generals that the White House supported this idea. We will not attempt to thwart this action, President Kennedy told Conin, trying to sound officially uninvolved. On the morning of November 1st, 1963, Lucien Conin awoke, changed into his military uniform, and prepared himself for the coup d'etat that was about to begin. He tucked an ivory-handled 375 Magnum revolver into his waist and filled a bag meant for big men with three million Vietnamese piastres, roughly $40,000 in cash. Years later, Senate investigators asked Conin if he knew that the generals he was giving this money to planned on killing President Diem. The majority of the officers desired President Diem to have an honorable retirement, Conin swore. Regarding his brother and other powerful figures in the regime, the attitude was that their deaths would be welcomed. With Green Berets guarding his family, Conin picked up a secure telephone given to him by big men and called the CIA with a secret code, 99999. The coup d'etat against President Diem was about to begin. Conin kissed his wife and children goodbye, climbed into an army jeep waiting in the driveway, and headed off to headquarters near the airport. At 1.30 p.m., scores of big men loyalists 
burst into army offices, police headquarters, and radio stations around Saigon, holding people at gunpoint and informing them that if they resisted, they'd be shot. Military trucks loaded with artillery surrounded the palace. President Diem and his brother slipped out the back and disappeared. Diem's loyal bodyguards had no idea that their president had fled, and dozens of these men died defending the palace and Diem's honor. By 3 a.m., the palace was overrun, and soon looters were running through the streets with President Diem's possessions, gilded furniture, fine whiskey, American adventure magazines. At 6 a.m., President Diem reached out to Big Min from inside the Catholic Church in Colón, where he and his brother were hiding. Diem offered to surrender, provided he was given the full honors due a departing president. When Big Min refused, Diem settled for unconditional surrender and gave up his location at the church. Big Min dispatched an American-made M113 armored personnel carrier and four jeeps filled with soldiers to retrieve the deposed president and his brother. On the drive back to the palace, alongside a train crossing, Diem and Nu were executed, shot with automatic weapons inside the armored vehicle. Their bullet-riddled bodies were photographed and then buried in an unmarked grave adjacent to the Saigon residence of U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. For all the euphemism and convoluted language behind and around President Kennedy's assassination program, there was absolutely nothing vague or indirect about the assassination that took place just three weeks later on November 22, 1963, in Dallas, Texas. From the perspective of U.S. Secret Service agent Clinton J. Hill, killing a leader is a visceral and sickening reality. Clint Hill, age 32, had been on the presidential protective detail since the Eisenhower administration when he guarded the president's mother-in-law, Elvira Matilda Carlson Dowd. During the Kennedy White House, he served as the special agent in charge of Jacqueline Kennedy, overseeing her safety at all times. On this day in Dallas, the president had made a protocol change. He didn't want Secret Service agents, including Clint Hill, to be standing on the running boards of the open-topped presidential limousine. Instead, Hill was now riding in a car directly behind the president and Mrs. Kennedy. He had weapons at the ready, a pistol at his waist, an AR-15 automatic rifle on the seat beside him, and a shotgun in the compartment near the jump seats. When the first shot rang out, Clint Hill leapt out of the vehicle he was traveling in and ran to the president's limousine, using the rear running board to climb onto the trunk area and reach for Mrs. Kennedy, who was reaching out to him. He watched as the president grabbed his throat and lurched forward. A second shot rang out, blasting off a portion of the president's head. As Clint Hill covered Mrs. Kennedy with his body, he observed the president. The right rear portion of his head was missing. It was lying in the rear seat of the car. His brain was exposed. There was blood and bits of brain all over the entire rear portion of the car, Hill told the Warren Commission. As the limousine raced to the hospital, a sobbing Mrs. Kennedy tried to make sense of the carnage. My God, they shot his head off, she told Clint Hill. Then, to her dead husband, she implored, sobbing, Jack, Jack, what have they done to you? At the hospital, doctors determined that a piece of the president's skull was missing. The next day, we found the missing portion of the president's head, Clint Hill told investigators. It was found in the street. Years later, in an interview for the New York Times, 
Former CIA director Richard Helms made a provocative statement. Helms began his intelligence career with the OSS in 1942 and retired in 1973, having served Presidents Johnson and Nixon as director of Central Intelligence. Under the Kennedy administration, he served as CIA Deputy Director of Plans, which put him in charge of the President's executive action capability. In this capacity, Helms oversaw the Kennedy administration's assassination program, including more than 20 now-declassified plots to kill Fidel Castro with an exploding cigar, a contaminated diving suit, poison botulism toxin pills, and other schemes, all of which failed. If you kill someone else's leaders, Helms told David Frost on national television in 1978, why shouldn't they kill yours? Within a year and a half, the covert war became an overt war. The United States increased its military forces in South Vietnam and in March began bombing Hanoi in Operation Rolling Thunder. The governments of Russia and China increased support to Hanoi, providing men, weapons, and guerrilla warfare expertise to the communists. In Washington, D.C., in an effort to define U.S. Defense Department goals inside Vietnam, John McNaughton, Assistant Secretary of the Department used a percentage calculus in a memo for National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. 70% to avoid a humiliating U.S. defeat, 20% to keep SVN, South Vietnam, territory from Chinese hands, 10% to permit the people of SVN to enjoy a better, freer way of life. In South Vietnam, joint CIA-Defense Department hit-and-run ambush operations by the Civilian Irregular Defense Group continued full bore, unleashing bloodshed and chaos on an increasingly divided civilian population while achieving little of the Pentagon's percentage-based goals. Now it was dawn on June 17, 1965, and Billy Waugh was leading a 90-man CIDG team on an ambush against an enemy camp inside a village called Bong Son. The camp, believed to house 200 to 300 communist fighters, was located in South Vietnam, but was under the control of communist forces. Of 90 CIDG men, one was CIA, three were Green Berets, and 86 were indigenous villagers. Their mission was to sneak up on the enemy soldiers while they were sleeping, kill as many of them as possible, and get out without loss. Surprise, kill, vanish. The CIDG men had left their Special Forces A-Team camp at 1.30 that morning. Waugh was the point man, now leading the team silently on a narrow trail that snaked along the An Lao River, just 17 kilometers inland from the coast, the terrain was dense jungle. It was hot and humid, already 85 degrees. After roughly an hour of walking, the team came upon an NVA soldier who was supposed to be keeping guard but had fallen asleep. Waugh instructed one of the Indige to cut the man's throat. Examining the dead soldier's possessions, remembers Waugh, we noted the modern gear he carried, a shiny Chinese pistol, a Russian AK-47, brand-new jungle boots, and an excellent radio. Inside the soldier's medicine kit was an array of supplies almost identical to what Special Forces medics carried and Waugh remembers noting the odd symmetry involved, the kill-or-be-killed rule of unconventional warfare. We took his gear and continued on. The three other Americans on the team were Captain Paris D. Davis, the highest-ranking non-commissioned officer in the group, Sergeant Robert D. Brown, a medic, and Staff Sergeant Davis Morgan, 
the team's liaison to the CIA. Captain Paris Davis, a blue-eyed black man from Washington, D.C., had never been in combat before, says Waugh, and the same went for Sergeant Robert Brown, an all-American kid from Montana who would soon be dead with a bullet in his head. The CIA operator David Morgan, like Waugh, battle-tested and sharp-witted, unafraid of fierce combat or hard work, had already served multiple tours in Vietnam. Each of the Special Forces soldiers wore green battle fatigues and carried an M16 rifle and 25 magazines of .223 caliber ammunition, which meant each of them had 500 rounds. Each soldier had 28 grenades of various types, 14 regular grenades, 10 frag grenades, 2 white phosphorus grenades, an incendiary weapon meant to ignite cloth, fuel, ammunition, and more, and two smoke grenades. Rescue gear consisted of a signal mirror, a compass, and a bright red emergency panel. In his left pocket, Waugh carried hard candy for energy. As they moved along the riverbank, Billy Waugh began to worry about the communications gear. If the operation went bad and they needed air support, the radio was their lifeline. It had been decided early on that the PRC-25 FM radio was to be carried by one of the 86 Indig, but now Wall was having second thoughts. Most of the Indig were poor farmers, he says. Now they were mercenaries, paid to fight someone else's war. This was the first time any of them had been in combat. Waugh had trained the group in small arms and unconventional warfare techniques, just as he'd trained hundreds of others like them, and he knew that the Indige might not stick around once shots started firing. On the other hand, he thought, there was nothing quite like a quick, successful ambush to bolster the confidence and competence of a mercenary. Either way, there was no guarantee. By nightfall, all but 15 of the Indige would be dead or gone. Approaching the camp, the group divided into four units, each with a Green Beret or CIA officer in the lead. A few hundred meters outside the target, Waugh suddenly found himself just feet away from a man and a woman hunched over. By the time they looked up at him, Waugh had his weapon on them. They were NVA cooks, collecting firewood. Hard at work in these pre-dawn hours, preparing breakfast for soldiers who'd soon be awake. Behind a fence, Waugh spotted pots of food cooking over an open fire pit. As the man reached for the pistol on his hip, Waugh took a swift step forward, grabbed him around the shoulders, and pushed his knife into the man's throat. The woman came at him with a stick, striking him and making noise. Waugh slit her throat and set her body down on the jungle floor. All was quiet again. He knew instantly that the pace of the raid had to quicken. The noise could have alerted a sentry. Soon all hell could break loose. He passed word down the line. From here on out, the men would communicate using hand and arm signals, no sound. Rounding a bend, Waugh caught sight of the enemy camp. The bamboo hooches, or sleeping barracks, were wide and low, with ceilings no more than three feet tall. Each hut was roughly forty feet wide and lined with platforms, three soldiers to a bed. Doing the math quickly in his head, he figured there were two hundred and fifty men here. He gave the signal to attack. The CIDG soldiers raised their M-16s and opened fire. The gunfire led to chaos and pandemonium, with empty magazines dropping to the jungle floor. As the NDA soldiers leapt up from sleeping, a relentless barrage of firepower cut them down. Next, Waugh and the others began hurling grenades, observing dispassionately as men and their barracks caught on fire. Waugh recalls watching enemy soldiers drop to the ground and roll, trying to stop from being burned alive. Some fighters returned fire, but mostly they fled. Then 
Suddenly, unexpectedly, it got quiet. The battle was over. Waugh estimated that 150 NVA were dead. The rest appeared to have run off into the jungle. For about 15 minutes, we congratulated each other, remembers Waugh. We were celebrating, patting ourselves on the back, examining the Russian weapons left behind when they fled. Waugh remembers thinking how satisfying it was that the raid had been a success. But war is nothing if not full of surprises. From deep inside the jungle, there was a sharp, distinct sound, a bugle call, unmistakably a military command. Bugles meant soldiers, explains Waugh, NVA regulars. The NVA had called in the infantry using a signal instrument favored by American soldiers during the Revolutionary War. What none of them had realized was that the three sleeping hooches they'd just ambushed were the first three of several dozen hooches stretching deep into the jungle. Each held roughly 60 enemy soldiers. The Defense Department later estimated that there had been as many as 3,000 soldiers at Bong Song. The bugle call had just woken them all up. Wa ran into the jungle, firing at anything that moved. He threw hand grenades and let off two flares, signaling to the team to disperse and retreat. The sound of boots was everywhere around him, the clattering of men. Commands yelled in Vietnamese. There was heavy gunfire coming at him and the green tracers of RPGs. The North Vietnamese Army had begun a massive counterattack, and Wa was running out of ammo fast. Racing through the jungle, he headed toward the rally point, an old cemetery on the high ground, 650 feet to the west. Moving as fast as his legs could carry him, he suddenly found himself in an impossible situation. Directly in front of him, there was nothing but a wide-open rice paddy field. He'd run out of jungle, his only means of defense. Behind him was a battalion of battle-ready NVA. He had nowhere to go but across the open field. He ran fast, his jungle boots sloshing through the wet grass, concentrating hard on how to make it to the cemetery. There was Kamo hidden there, and Kamo meant an ability to call in airstrikes. Rounds from AK-47s buzzed past his head. He was now out of ammunition and grenades. He saw a green tracer from an RPG headed his way. Before he could react, bam, the RPG hit him in the right knee. The impact knocked him over. He lay face down in the wet grass. He pulled himself up on all fours and began to crawl. Finally, he spotted an embankment, a dirt irrigation berm running along the edge of the rice paddy. Concealed for the moment, he looked around to assess who was where. Sergeant Robert Brown, the young medic from Montana, had taken a bullet to the head and lay bleeding out in the grass. He counted 25, maybe 30, mercenaries dead in the open field, cut down by NVA firepower as they tried to escape. Wa kept crawling. After another hundred or so feet, he came upon a hole in front of him, as if someone had dug a pit. A foxhole in a rice paddy? How strange. He pulled himself down into the darkness. It was wet inside, about four feet wide. He couldn't determine how long. As he dragged himself down, he felt a flash of relief. He'd managed to escape from the enemy. He could hide here. Then he realized that there was someone or something down here in the hole with him. He couldn't see much in the dark. He heard breathing. He moved down the hole a little further until he was staring into the flaring nostrils of a water buffalo. He could make out the animal's sharp horns and its dark black skin. There were whiskers on its nose. The animal jerked its head and snorted as if to charge. Wa wondered if he might die here, eviscerated by a water buffalo. But the animal was stuck in the mud, just as he was. 
Wa might have laughed, except that he was soaking wet, bleeding heavily, and possibly losing consciousness. He could feel leeches crawling into his open wounds, eating their way into the space that used to be his right knee. Outside on the field, he heard enemy machine gun fire. His brain struggled to figure out a next move when suddenly David Morgan, the CIA operator, appeared alongside him in the hole. Morgan looked at the water buffalo, then at Waugh. The NBA knew they were in this hole, Morgan said. They had to move out. But Waugh was unable to move, and Morgan couldn't carry him. Waugh told Morgan to try to get to the cemetery alone. From there, he could call in airstrikes to lay down suppressive fire and force the NBA to disperse. Waugh could still get out of here on his own. David Morgan took off running. Waugh pulled himself up out of the hole and started crawling across the field. He made it about ten feet when he was hit again, this time worse than before. The round smashed into the bottom of his foot, tearing through his boot and ripping apart his toes before exiting his body just above the ankle bone. He knew enough about the body to know that this most likely meant his military career was over. Face down in the mud, he strained to breathe. Tracers hit the dirt around him. He figured the enemy was 150 feet away. He needed to keep going, keep crawling, despite the pain. His right leg wasn't working. He looked down and saw exposed bone. My foot had been almost entirely torn off, Wa recalled. There were leeches covering the wound, and I could see my exposed foot and ankle bones, white as snow. Keep going, he told himself. Stop and you're dead. When he took a shot to the left wrist, part of his brain tried having a conversation with him about what it would be like if he lost his leg and never walked on two feet again. Another part of his brain said, Don't think about that, he recalls. The pain was intense, and he figured soon he'd lose consciousness. If the enemy got a hold of him, he was dead. Wa reached into his rucksack. He pulled out his field syringe and morphine bottle, gave himself three quick shots. He waited for the drugs to take effect. A slight warm feeling came over him, but mostly he felt intense pain. Ahead, Wa could see CIA operator David Morgan at the rallying point. He'd made it. Damn, this was a good sign, quickly followed by a bad one. David Morgan's hand signals indicated that the radio had been shot to pieces. There was no way to call for rescue or airstrikes. Wa looked up. My God, he thought, was he hallucinating? Was this really Captain Paris D. Davis coming to get him? Wa remembers staring into Davis's eyes and how incredibly blue they were. He normally didn't notice things like this, and it jerked him back into reality. Neither man had any way to radio for help. The situation was dire. They tried discussing what to do next. Davis had his right hand up, pointing at something when he got shot in the hand. The ends of his fingers were sheared off. Wa watched blood spurt into the air between them. Davis howled and swore. He was right-handed, he said. Now he couldn't even shoot. No commo. No ammo, thought Wa. No way to communicate, no ability to shoot. Their only hope was rescue. The sun was coming up. Wa pulled out his emergency panel and signal mirror. Davis made a run for the cemetery. An aircraft flying overhead, searching for the team, spotted what was happening and notified headquarters. The full fighting force of the U.S. Army and the Air Force was now coming to the rescue. It wasn't over yet. Lying helpless in the rice paddy, Wa looked up and watched the sky. He saw Navy F-8s and U.S. Air Force F-4C Phantom Jets come in fast and low, dropping bombs and napalm on the battlefield. For a moment, he had hope. Then, suddenly, he took a bullet to the right side of his head. 
most likely a ricochet, it sliced a two-inch section of skin and bone off his forehead. The wound was not deep enough to kill him, but it was enough to knock him unconscious. When Wa awoke, the sun was high in the sky. Hours had passed, and he was baked in a thick mud shell like a crust. Warm rays beat down on him, and he looked at his watch to see what time it was. No watch. He was naked. The NVA must have mistaken him for dead, stripped him naked, and taken his watch. After a few minutes, he heard the sounds of a helicopter. He couldn't believe he was alive. Thwap, thwap, thwap went the rotor blades. He watched as the helicopter landed. Out leapt a special forces soldier he knew, Sergeant First Class John Reinberg, a weapons expert. Was Reinberg really running toward him? He was pretty sure it was Reinberg, running in his jungle fatigues, crossing some 250 feet of open terrain. Or maybe the situation wasn't real. Maybe Wa was imagining things. Now, Reinberg was standing over him, talking. He told Wa he was here to get him out of this mess alive. In the distance, Wa eyed the helicopter that Reinberg said was going to medevac him to a MASH hospital not far away. It was a UH-1D. He could see people climbing inside. Reinberg told Wa he was going to carry him the 250 feet across the open field to the helicopters because Wa's right knee and left leg were useless. The blood had dried, but the bones were exposed and there were leeches eating at his flesh. Reinberg hoisted Wa up from behind, holding him under his armpits, dragging him toward the helicopter. Across the field, he spotted Paris Davis, alive, crawling toward the helicopter. Then he heard the terrible sound of RPG tracers all over again. We're gonna make it, Reinberg promised as he dragged Wa across the rice paddy. We're gonna make it. He lugged Wa's body five or six feet at a time. And just when Wa started to believe he might come out of this disaster alive, Reinberg took a bullet to the chest. The bullet hit him just above the heart, remembers Wa. And as he started to fall, a second bullet impacted his body, this time six inches lower down. Reinberg's lung collapsed and he struggled to breathe. In that instant, Reinberg went from being strong and heroic to being in worse shape than me. Another Green Beret came rushing out of the helicopter and began running across the open field. He was young. He grabbed Reinberg and started dragging him toward the helicopter. Maybe someone grabbed Billy Waugh, or maybe he and Paris Davis continued crawling toward the helicopter. Later, in debriefs, neither man could clearly recall. Special Forces training teaches its soldiers what needs to be done to stay alive. Crawl, stay low, get to the helicopter no matter what. Now the helicopter was just a few yards away. Waugh could see David Morgan and a few of the mercenaries waiting inside. The helicopter door gunner was laying down suppressive fire, trying to keep Waugh and Davis from being fired upon by NVA soldiers hiding in the trees. Waugh was inside the helicopter now. As the aircraft started to lift up off the ground, a green tracer flew into the cabin and hit the door gunner, shearing off part of his arm. Wa watched the gunner stare at what remained of his limb as the helicopter took off and they flew away. When Billy Wa awoke, he heard screaming. He was in a field hospital a few kilometers from Bong Song. Beside him in the next bed over, John Reinberg was howling in pain as the nurses worked to debride him, removing damaged tissue and foreign objects, dirt, debris, and insects from his gaping chest wounds. Wa realized he was screaming too and that the nurses were doing the same thing to his leg. 
A few days later, General William Westmoreland, commander of all U.S. forces in Vietnam, stopped by the field hospital and pinned a purple heart on Billy Waugh's uniform. Reinberg was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Then came a U.S. Army doctor with grim news. Waugh was being sent back to the United States, to the lower extremity amputation ward at Walter Reed. Chapter 12 The Studies and Observations Group The Walter Reed amputee ward was a devastating sight to behold. Billy Waugh was now one of its patients, his right leg in a cast. The infection wasn't getting any better, and the doctor said part of his leg would likely need to be amputated, cut off below the knee. Day in and day out, Waugh watched fellow soldiers in the ward come and go. They'd get wheeled away to surgical rooms and return without an arm or a leg. The way Waugh saw it, there were two categories of amputees. Some soldiers became a shell of their former selves after they lost a limb. Others somehow managed to keep things light, like the sergeant major in the next bed over, who recently had his lower leg removed. Waugh went with him to the Friday night dance. Watch this, the sergeant major said, unhooking his prosthetic leg and putting it on backward so the foot faced in reverse. The soldier with the prosthetic asked a pretty girl to dance, and she said sure, but while they were dancing, she looked down at his backward foot, screamed, and ran away. The sergeant major howled with laughter. Waugh didn't know which was worse, to lose a limb or to find humor in it. Soon enough, Dr. Arthur Metz, chief of lower extremity amputation surgery, came to give Billy Waugh the bad news. Despite two surgeries and four weeks of antibiotics, the infection in his right leg had gotten worse. Dr. Metz proposed amputating the foot from the ankle down. If it got any worse, they might have to take the bottom half of the leg. Waugh could not bear the thought. I had it in my mind to return to combat, he says. In 1965, you couldn't fight without a foot. Billy Waugh pleaded with Dr. Metz to be discharged. He wanted to go heal at his sister's house in Texas. Dr. Metz agreed and wrote him convalescent leave orders. Waugh was thrilled at first, but as he prepared to travel to Texas, hope gave way to misery. He missed being a soldier and the intensity of war. Something came over him and, penicillin bottle in hand, he decided to hitchhike to Vietnam as a standby passenger on military aircraft. It seemed like the pilots felt sorry for him with his long cast on his right leg, and he never had to wait long. In less than a week, he made it from Washington, D.C. to Travis Air Force Base outside San Francisco, to the Philippines, and finally to Tan Son Nat Airport in Saigon. Saigon was a busy city in the summer of 1965. Wah checked into the Hotel Majestic and headed to the Tudo Bar down the street, the place where soldiers went for rest and relaxation. It didn't take long for Wah to spot two friends from Special Forces, Billy Kessinger, a medic, and Danny Horton, a communications man. Seated at a corner table, the trio of Green Berets began chatting. After a few beers, Kessinger and Horton hinted to Waugh about a highly classified direct action unit that was just now expanding, an elite, unconventional warfare group that was secreted inside MACV. No one outside the unit knew about it. It was a special access covert program called the Studies and Observations Group, SOG, named to deceive people into thinking its members were Ivy League-type analysts reading reports. In reality, the missions were so dangerously insane, 
Kessinger and Horton said. The acronym was translated to suicide on the ground by some guys. Kessinger and Horton were already in SOG, and they showed WA their credentials, a photo, a few coded letters, and a telephone number that you could call 24-7 if you needed anything. SOG members had unprecedented authority. They could go anywhere in South Vietnam at any time of the night or day, no getting stopped by military police, MP. If you were in SOG, you were authorized to carry a firearm at all times. Kessinger and Horton called the creds a wow pass because you could walk on water with it. Sitting and drinking at the Tudo bar, the men talked late into the night, past curfew for American soldiers. When an American MP approached the table and asked for identification, Kessinger and Horton flashed their wow passes. Wa pulled a piece of paper from his pocket, unfolded it, and showed the MP his convalescent leave orders. What the hell are you doing on convalescent leave in Vietnam, Master Sergeant William D. Wa? the MP asked, reading from the papers. I'm visiting with my amigos, said Wa. The MP was not certain what to make of this situation, so he called his commanding officer, who asked if Master Sergeant Waugh was causing problems. The MP said he wasn't. The commanding officer said convalescent leave orders were good, and Waugh could be left alone. The night ended without incident. A week later, Waugh returned to America, more determined than ever to get himself assigned to this classified, unconventional warfare unit called SOG. In Washington, D.C., he traveled to the Pentagon to meet with the assignments officer for special forces, a woman named Billy Alexander. Seated across from her, Waugh pleaded to be assigned to Mac V. SOG. All she could do was laugh he recalls. She said, I could barely walk. How did I expect to ever fight again? Wa proposed a challenge. If he was able to convince Dr. Metz to reassign him to special forces at Fort Bragg, and if he could last there for a month of training, would Billy Alexander recommend him for SOG? Perhaps she felt sorry for me, Wa remembers, because she looked at me for a while, and then she said yes. Waugh met with Dr. Metz, who rejected his idea. His lower leg was beyond salvage, Metz said, and required amputation. Waugh begged to undergo one last exploratory surgery. The doctor agreed. During the surgery, Dr. Metz went far up into the leg, near the knee, where he located a tiny sliver of Waugh's army boot lodged inside the tibia. This was the likely source of the months-long infection. Once it was removed, the final round of penicillin took hold, and Wa began to heal. The following month, he returned to Fort Bragg. In his second week back in Special Forces, he received new orders. He was being sent to Vietnam as part of MACV SOG. The reason for SOG's highly classified nature was that it violated the Geneva Agreement of 1962, the Declaration on the Neutrality of Laos, which forbade U.S. forces from operating inside the country. But at the Pentagon, after almost two years of reading reports from intelligence assets in the field, the Defense Department was coming around to the idea that Laos was the key to the insurgency and the Ho Chi Minh Trail the locus of the problem. Now, President Johnson needed convincing. The initial job of SOG reconnaissance men would be to sneak into Laos, take photographs of activity on the trail, plant listening devices, and get out alive with the evidence. Eventually, they would be assigned cross-border missions into Cambodia as well. Nobody knew with certainty what was in Laos, says John Plaster, a former member of the classified unit. 
Learning what was there was Sog's new operation. Plaster is considered one of the most competent snipers in U.S. military history, and his experiences in Mac v. Sog would later serve as the basis for part of the video game Call of Duty Black Ops. Sog's first chief was Colonel Donald Blackburn, the former leader of Operation White Star, and he prepared his fighters for battles in Laos that would be decidedly ungentlemanly. Blackburn was a master of guerrilla warfare. During World War II, he led kill-or-be-killed missions in the Philippines, where the tribesmen he organized into a guerrilla fighting force turned out to be headhunters. Blackburn's wartime diary became a best-selling book in 1955 called Blackburn's Headhunters. In Laos, SOG operators would need to employ ruthless, unconventional warfare tactics with unmerciful intensity. To direct SOG operations on the ground, Colonel Blackburn chose another guerrilla warfare legend, the Finnish-born Larry Thorne. Mac v. Sog started out with just 16 volunteers, all Green Berets who'd been training on Okinawa. The men worked out of a forward operating base in Kam Duk, a border village located 60 miles southwest of Da Nang. Similar to the Civilian Irregular Defense Group program and the OSS Jedbergs before that, each SOG team was made up of two or three American soldiers and nine tribesmen. Initially, the tribesmen were Nung, an ethnic Chinese minority. Later, they included Montagnards, indigenous people from Vietnam's central highlands, whom the Americans called Yards. We Americans had advanced technology, such as helicopters, and the tribesmen had ancient techniques, such as silent ambush, explains John Plaster. The tribesmen helped the Green Berets understand the tactics that were being used by the NVA guerrilla fighters, things not found in any manual. For example, Nung tribesmen demonstrated how, by digging a four-foot hole into a hillside, a fighter could see and feel the vibrations of an advancing aircraft long before his ears registered the engine sound. Shared tricks of the trade went both ways. Tribesmen were also recruited to watch and count enemy troops and supplies being moved through the jungle. Because most could not read or write English or Vietnamese, the CIA's technical staff developed a non-literate system of conveyance. Instead of words, the counting devices given out to recruits featured tiny pictograms representing men, weapons, vehicles, even elephants, a common means of transport in the region. When the recruits activated a toggle switch on the device, their data was transmitted to CIA aircraft flying overhead. Unlike the CIDG program, the bond between the tribesmen and the SOG operators was reported to be strong. The Nung and Yards could have cared less about South Vietnam as a country, recalls Plaster. They felt no allegiance to some abstract paymaster like the United States but they were ready to die for their recon teammates, American and Yard alike. SOG's first cross-border mission into Laos occurred on October 18, 1965. U.S. Ambassador William Sullivan forbade SOG from using helicopter insertions into the supposedly neutral country, so the first team to go in, Reconnaissance Team, RT Iowa, was inserted by helicopter on the Vietnam side of the border. They walked through the jungle into Laos. The team leader, or 1-0, was Master Sergeant Charles Slats Petrie. The assistant team leader, or 1-1, was Sergeant First Class Willie Card. Together, these two Americans led seven Nung mercenaries and one lieutenant from the South Vietnamese Army 
ARVN, to gather reconnaissance of enemy activity along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Rather than oversee the mission from Cam Duck, Larry Thorne flew with his men in the helicopter, circling overhead until he received word they'd successfully crossed over into Laos. Each SOG team wore Asian-made uniforms with no labels or insignia. They carried sterile weapons, meaning they came with no identifying marks, such as the Swedish K submachine gun, and they smoked Chinese cigarettes. If anyone got captured in Laos, no one could identify them as Americans. SOG operators were issued unmarked V-42 stiletto knives with six-inch blades, designed by Ben Barker on Okinawa and secretly manufactured in Japan. Not since the days of the OSS had the U.S. military issued stiletto knives. Overhead air support was critical to the success of every mission. The H-34 King B helicopter was SOG's signature aircraft, a bubble-nosed workhorse able to withstand a hail of automatic weapons fire and keep flying. The King Bees were flown by South Vietnamese Air Force pilots trained in Texas by the CIA. With radio call signs like Cowboy and Mustachio, these pilots saved countless SOG men from capture or death, performing radical jungle infiltration, exfiltration, and rescue operations day after day. All gave some, some gave all, says SOG operator John Stryker Meyer of the King Bee Pilots. Cessna aircraft were also used regularly on missions, and flying on the first mission in a Cessna O-2 spotter were U.S. Air Force Major Harley Piles and U.S. Marine Corps Captain Winfield Sisson. If anything went wrong, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy were on standby, ready to send in covert air support in the form of overhead airstrikes. RT Iowa was inserted successfully, and after a few hours, they radioed Larry Thorne to say they'd crossed the border into Laos. Thorne radioed Cam Duke to say he was now heading back to base. He was never heard from again. In the first few minutes of SOG's classified border operations, the program swallowed up one of its finest officers and a whole King Bee helicopter, says John Plaster. That afternoon, the Cessna carrying Major Piles and Captain Sisson disappeared. On SOG's first mission, three men went missing in action, MIA, never to be seen again. It was an indication of the kind of catastrophic loss SOG would face over the next six years. The great majority of such cases are either still classified or lack records, said to have been lost. Over the next eight months, five SOG recon teams working out of Cam Duk conducted 48 cross-border missions. In the winter of 1966, MACV headquarters opened a second SOG base up north at Quezon, closer to the Demilitarized Zone, DMZ. Still limping from five gunshot wounds to the leg, Billy Waugh arrived there in May. Located in the northwest corner of South Vietnam, Khe Sanh was the most remote American military facility in all of the South, a strip of flat land surrounded by 4,000-foot mountains and treacherous ravines. Much of the activity centered around Koh Rock Mountain, a 2,000-foot limestone peak visible from the base, as were Hill 1050 and Hill 950, veritable beehives of NVA activity. The geography here was unlike anything in the United States. Endless, karst limestone outcroppings that looked like giant, vine-covered chimneys. The base camp, under the control of the U.S. Marine Corps, was strategically located just 14 miles south of the DMZ, 
and twelve miles east of the border with Laos. For Sog, this meant that Quezon was within striking distance of key enemy bases along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Sog base at Quezon was a special access facility, partitioned behind concertina wire, surrounded by blast walls and built mostly underground. SOG operations were classified, which meant that even Quezon's Marine Commander, Colonel David E. Lowndes, wasn't privy to its activities. In 1966, when Wa arrived, the new SOG chief was Jack Singlob, the former OSS Jedberg, who ran covert CIA airdrop operations during the Korean War, under the cover name Joint Advisory Commission Korea. Or Jack. There was no rest at SOG, remembers Billy Waugh. Only war, recon, rescue, sleep. International law meant nothing to the enemy out here on the border region between Vietnam and Laos, a concept SOG men were regularly forced to grapple with. Despite the covert nature of their missions, Special Forces soldiers operated under the U.S. military chain of command and were bound by the laws of war. Ever since the Lieber Code of 1863, the execution of captured prisoners and the mutilation of dead soldiers' bodies on the battlefield was expressly forbidden. The 1949 Geneva Conventions updated these protocols for the modern era. And yet, look what the NVA had done to Sergeant Donald Sane, thought Billy Waugh, as he flew over Koh Rock Mountain in a SOG observation aircraft. It was June 1966. R.T. Montana had been ambushed three days before, with two SOG men captured and executed, and seven Indige killed in action, K.I.A., or missing in action, M.I.A. One zero Henry Whalen made it back to Quezon and gave the ambush location coordinates to SOG commanders. Wa was put in charge of a rescue or retrieval mission, which is why he was across the border in Laos now, searching for dead bodies from the Cessna. When he spotted Sergeant Donald Sane's body in a jungle clearing, he felt contempt and disgust. Don Sane was a 23-year-old kid from Santa Clara County, California, who'd worn a white tuxedo and a bow tie to prom just a few years before. Now, he was not just dead, but had been mutilated and put on display by the NVA. Sane's captors had killed him and arranged him in a spread-eagle position, with his legs staked to the earth and his arms tied to a tree. Maggots were crawling around the gunshot wounds that Don Sane had taken to the chest. Once vibrant and full of life, he was now carrion. It was 9 a.m. and Wa assessed the situation. I'd been in combat long enough to know Sane's body was not only displayed so we could see it, but it had to be booby-trapped as well, he recalls. Wa instructed the pilot to head back to the SOG base at Quezon. There, he briefed his commanding officer. After putting together a bright light rescue team, the SOG men returned to the clearing in the jungle. The team included Danny Horton, the communications man from the Tudo Bar, Sergeant First Class James Craig, a medic, and Major Gerald Jerry Kilburn, the most senior officer in the group, and a POW during the Korean War. Flying the H-34 King Bee was South Vietnamese Air Force pilot Nguyen Von Huang, call sign Mustachio, so named after the Clark Gable-style mustache he wore. Once, during a rescue operation and under heavy fire, Mustachio was struck in the neck with a bullet while piloting a king bee over a target. He plugged the bullet hole with his fingers and got the crippled helicopter 20 kilometers back to Quezon, flying with only one hand. With Mustachio at the controls, the king bee hovered over Sane's body. While Waugh tried to figure out how to get a hold of it, 
without being hit by grenade frag, Mustachio searched for a landing zone. NVA were everywhere, and time was critical. Body retrieval was the perfect time for an ambush. Mustachio circled around a few times before setting the King Bee down, roughly 100 meters from the body. The rescue team hopped off. Approaching the body, Billy Waugh felt the anger and disgust return. The stench of rotting flesh was hard to bear. He grabbed a climbing rope and told Major Kilburn his plan. I decided to tie one end of the rope to the wheel of Mustachio's helicopter and the other end around Sane's leg. That way, we'd move the body and let the booby traps explode harmlessly, Waugh recalls. The team looked at Waugh like he was crazy. There was no manual for this kind of horrid shit, he says. The rope was the fastest and most efficient way to achieve the objective. Waugh tied the rope to the helicopter wheel and instructed Mustachio to hover over Sane. Delicately, so as not to set off the grenades, he tied the rope around Sane's leg. Let's move out, he told the team. Everyone stepped back a few yards. Using the helicopter, Mustachio pulled the body off the ground. Three or four booby trap grenades started going off around Sane. Sane was hovering above us by his leg, remembers Waugh. The fluids and maggots and crap from his body poured out as he was being lifted up and away, and as it did, Kilburn got sprayed with debris. Kilburn, a highly decorated combat veteran, had sustained three years of torture at the hands of his communist captors in the Korean War, but this was too much for him. When the fluids hit Kilburn, he screamed. Mustachio lifted Sane's body and set it down. Kilburn finished screaming. Everyone got quiet. Sane's body had been recovered, but there was more work to do. A second SOG man from RT Montana was still missing, a kid from Missouri named Sergeant Delmer Lee Outlaw Laws. The Bright Light team searched the area, trying to find a blood trail and maybe find Laws. The SOG men divvied up ground, each man assigned a quadrant to scour. This part of the jungle was hostile and unforgiving, filled with poisonous snakes like the two-step snake. If it bit you, you had two steps left in you before you died. Wa found himself waist-high in wait-a-minute bushes, prickly plants with claws the sharpness of a cat's that hooked into your skin when you passed by. If you got snagged, you had to wait a minute to unhook yourself or get torn to shreds. After several hours of searching, everyone's fatigues were ripped up, arms and faces scratched up and bleeding, but no one was ready to stop yet. They intended to find outlaw. Danny Horton called out. He'd found a blood trail. Wa saw Horton emerge from the woods looking ill. In one hand, he carried an American jungle boot. Something grotesque was sticking out of the shoe, recalls Waugh, and he figured out he was looking at part of Delmer Law's leg. Danny Horton took the group to where he'd found it. He'd been mostly eaten by a tiger, says Waugh. The ride back to the SOG base was quiet. Beneath the helicopter, Sane's body was swinging from a rope. Delmer Law's leg was lying on the floor of the helicopter in a plastic body bag. Once they landed on the tarmac at Quezon, Billy Waugh climbed out of the helicopter, carrying Law's leg in the bag. My clothes were shredded, I was filthy, covered in horrible things. My arms and face were scratched, I smelled, he recalls. Standing there on the tarmac, waiting for the SOG Bright Light team, was an officer from the 5th Special Forces, taking a break from his desk duties at MACV headquarters in Natrang, remembers Wa. He asked me to come inside. Wa followed his superior officer into the SOG base. The officer began yelling at him. God damn it, Wa, he said. You're filthy, you smell, and you're out of uniform. You're a disgrace, all of you. Wa set the plastic bag on the table. 
He took a moment before he spoke. Every soldier knows chain of command. Every soldier respects authority. Your superior officer is always correct. But Wa could not contain himself. He took Law's leg out of the body bag and set it on the table. How about him? Wa asked, pointing. Is he a disgrace? The officer stared at the jungle boot and the bloody stump. What the hell is that? he asked. It's Sergeant Delmer Lee Law's leg, said Wa. The rest of him got eaten by a tiger. Is he out of uniform, sir? The officer grew quiet, apologized, and left. The following week, a box arrived at Quezon from headquarters in Natrang. Inside, there were three boxes of crisp new jungle fatigues, no markings, of course. No one could know the SOG operators were violating the Declaration on the Neutrality of Laos. Chapter 13. Kill or Capture After the assassination of President Kennedy in November of 1963, President Johnson renamed the special group Augmented the 303 Committee. Assassination plots against foreign leaders appeared to have been toned down, or at least the president's inner circle of advisors stopped allowing the minutes of the meetings in which they were discussed to be recorded. The exception was with plans to kill Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, which moved ahead full bore. In 1967, the CIA Inspector General ordered an internal report on its assassination capability, the working papers of which were then destroyed on the orders of CIA Director Richard Helms. At least one significant assassination plan was likely part of the destroyed cache, an extraordinarily sensitive mission to kill General Jap the indomitable leader of the North Vietnamese Army. Jop was to visit an NVA command center in supposedly neutral Laos, a sovereign nation. The group chosen to kill him was Mac V. Sog. One of the first two men to the target area was to be Billy Waugh. It was June 2, 1967, and Billy Waugh was summoned to a briefing inside SOG headquarters at Quezon. Something unprecedented was about to happen, he was told, a direct action operation so important that all the other air-supported missions across Vietnam would come to a halt. Over the previous 24 hours, the CIA and the Pentagon had intercepted roughly 1,500 communiques between Hanoi and an NVA stronghold located just a few miles from Khe San inside Laos. The area had been given a code name, Oscar 8. Analysis of the intercepted messages confirmed that Oscar 8 was the secret NVA field headquarters the CIA had been trying to locate for months. The CIA sent its U-2 spy planes overhead in search of photographic intelligence. Images confirmed enemy traffic along the lower portion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail was being diverted to Oscar 8. Then came a reconnaissance coup d'etat, signals intelligence intercepted by the U.S. Army, indicated that General Jap himself was headed to Oscar 8 for a meeting. Billy Waugh would act as forward air controller in charge of observation and relay for the mission. At 4 a.m. the next morning, he'd fly in over the target in a Cessna and circle overhead for the duration of the mission, high enough to avoid NVA anti-aircraft fire, but low enough to watch through binoculars what was unfolding on the ground. It would be Waugh's job to relay information to the various parties involved via SOG's communication system serving as a kind of battle coordinator in the sky. The mission plan was succinct. 
nine B-52 bombers would fly in over the target to drop 900 bombs, each 200 pounds, a means of inflicting damage on the enemy camp and obliterating its capacity to respond. Fourteen minutes later, two Marine helicopter gunships would strafe the area, clearing a landing zone, LZ. Next, two troop transport helicopters, piloted by Marine Corps pilots, would deposit two teams of SOG hatchet forces, large 30- or 40-man units used in big operations. Air support would come from two Sky Raider aircraft, propeller-driven workhorses that were slow but effective. Two King Bee helicopters would insert two nine-man SOG teams, experienced operators tasked with locating and killing General Jap. Finally, four fast-flying F-4 Phantom fighter jets would provide close air support. SOG had seven hours to kill or capture General Jap and get out. But Oscar 8 was a defender's dream. The bowl-shaped valley was surrounded by hills on three sides, forming a strategic ridge-shaped horseshoe. On earlier recon missions, SOG teams reported seeing 12.7 millimeter anti-aircraft artillery, called Triple A, scattered on hilltops and platforms in the jungle canopy like hunting blinds. Now it was dawn at Quezon. Billy Waugh climbed into the Cessna O2 spotter aircraft, into the seat beside the pilot, James Alexander, an Air Force major. They flew eight miles out from Quezon, over the jungle canopy and into Laos, becoming the first to survey the Oscar 8 target area. Waugh had been in combat missions in Vietnam, off and on, since 1961 and he thought to himself, this day could change the war. The Pentagon had determined General Jap to be an even greater source of morale to fighters than Ho Chi Minh himself. Killing Jap could end the war. Through binoculars, Wa spotted cook fires down below, soldiers up early preparing breakfast for the fighters, he surmised. Major Alexander moved the Cessna roughly 15 miles to the south, where he began to circle overhead in anticipation of the B-52 bombers soon to arrive. Wa checked his watch. It was 4.45. The sun was coming up and the sky was purple and orange. Above and in the distance, Wa spotted the contrails of the B-52s. Like clockwork, at 6 a.m., nine B-52 bombers passed over Oscar 8, inundating the target area with 200-pound bombs. It was a colossal attack, one that left the surrounding valley seemingly destroyed. Wa observed how the land below was now pockmarked with hundreds of apartment building-sized bomb craters, burned out, smoking holes. Through binoculars, he watched weapons depots explode and burn. Grass sleep shacks had been set ablaze, and scores of enemy fighters were rushing out from makeshift buildings, hurrying to put out fires. He watched fighters remove weapons from burning boxes and roll gasoline barrels out of the way. Overhead, as the B-52s made a second pass, suddenly, Something entirely unexpected happened. The ridges around Oscar 8 lit up. NVA soldiers down below were firing back with a barrage of anti-aircraft fire. How could this be, thought Wa? The camp had been heavily bombed, and yet the NVA air defenses appeared to be entirely intact. The B-52 bombers flew too high for the NVA to hit with anti-aircraft fire, but the SOG helicopters that were about to come in would be vulnerable to direct fire. Concerned with the speed and aggression of the NVA gunner's response, Wa picked up the radio and called the Marine helicopter gunship pilots, who'd soon be heading into the target area.
they needed to turn around immediately. Abort this mission, Wa shouted. Abort! No answer. Nothing but silence over the comms. Wa tried again. Then he tried contacting the marine pilots who were flying the CH-46 troop transport helicopters, each one packed with 30 SOG hatchet forces. No answer. Silence. Shit. Did everybody switch VHF channels? Wa asked Major Alexander. Major Alexander shook his head and tried his own commo. Nothing but radio silence on his, too. Wa checked his watch. The helicopters delivering the hatchet forces were scheduled to arrive 14 minutes after the first B-52 bombing run, which meant any minute now. Desperate to get in touch with someone, Wa kept trying his radio, but it was too late. Below and to the east, he spotted two marine helicopter gunships flying in fast and low. They began strafing the target area, clearing the LZ for the hatchet forces to land. Wa and Alexander watched in horror as one of the gunships was picked off by NVA ground fire. Then the second helicopter was hit. The two helicopters each began to wobble and spin, then crashed into the landing zone almost side by side. The sight of the twin helicopter crashes sent adrenaline coursing through Wa's body. He had to get the CH-46 on the radio. Those hatchet forces could not land. It was suicide, he thought. He tried the UHF radio, then the VHF radio again. Do not land, he shouted. Abort. Hatchet forces. Do not land. All this high technology and nobody could hear anything. But the landings were now in progress, and Wa watched helplessly as the CH-46s entered the target area. Double rotors spinning, one in front, one in back, like two school buses in the sky, he thought. Based on the angle at which they were flying in, the CH-46 pilots would be unable to see the crashed helicopters until after it was too late. Wa and Alexander were both shouting into their radios, Abort! Abort! The helicopters were now roughly 70 feet above the ground, side by side, over the landing zone. Through binoculars, Wa could see into one of them. The door was open, and dozens of men were inside, amped up and ready to deploy. He'd been in that position countless times, standing in the doorway before the helicopter even landed, waiting to hit the ground running. He knew precisely how charged they had to be when, hovering now only 50 feet above the ground, the helicopter was hit with anti-aircraft fire. It appeared to split in half. Wa watched as the SOG men tumbled out of the aircraft and began falling like stones to the ground. It was impossible to survive that kind of fall. Wa felt ill. The second helicopter was now 40 feet over the landing zone when it, too, was hit with anti-aircraft fire and split open. Wa watched some of the men inside fall out and down. Others hung on to anything they could. The helicopter spun and maintained some of its lift, crash landing in a way that left Wa thinking there might be survivors. Straining to see through the binoculars, he counted nine, possibly ten men alive. He watched as they scrambled out of the burning aircraft and ran. Training taught them to take cover in the jungle, to evade and escape. In came the two H-34 King Bee helicopters carrying the SOG teams assigned to kill Jop. One was raked with enemy gunfire. Wa watched as it burst into flames, then crashed into the ground. Through binoculars, he saw three crew members inside scramble out of the burning helicopter and take cover. One SOG operator was shot dead as he ran, but the other two appeared to have made it into the jungle. Wa kept his eyes on the SOG men as they evaded capture. They were definitely alive and definitely running for cover, he noted. The second helicopter appeared to have landed. 
As Wa strained to see, Major Alexander moved the Cessna up to 4,000 feet, where the calm channels might be better, and as he did, Wa briefly lost sight of what was happening on the ground. Up at 4,000 feet, the radio worked, and Wa reached Major Kilburn at the SOG facility at Quezon. Kilburn knew nothing about what was happening at the target area. We got a real problem here at Oscar 8, Wa said, and he relayed the dire situation as quickly and succinctly as he could. The mission to kill or capture General Jap was now a rescue mission, Kilburn said. The goal was to try and get anyone trapped inside Oscar 8 out of there alive. As Wa discussed the situation with Major Kilburn, two Phantom fighter jets screeched in over the valley at Mach 2. Wa watched, stunned, as anti-aircraft fire hit one of the fast-moving jets in the right wing near the fuel tank. The Silver Phantom exploded in the air. Come on, parachute, Wa wished out loud as the jet spiraled down. No parachute. The Phantom jet crashed into the hillside and exploded. Sky Raiders coming in, someone said over the comms, startling him. They think they can take out the AAA. Wa shook his head. This was suicide. He and Major Alexander watched as two A-1E Sky Raider propeller aircraft came in low and slow. Sky Raiders fly 110 miles per hour, and in this scenario, they were sitting ducks. With an explosion of fire, each of them was hit by anti-aircraft fire and crashed violently into the hillside below. It's a graveyard down there, Major Alexander said. Through binoculars, Wa watched as enemy fighters on the ground swarmed to the downed aircraft. He tried again to make radio contact with any of those who'd gone down, but no one responded to his calls. The Cessna was running low on fuel. Soon they'd have to turn back. Wa called over the radio again. Nothing. Not a sound. Then, suddenly, Wa's radio crackled to life. This is hatchet force, on the ground, a faint voice said over the comms. Incredible, thought Wa. Hatchet force, where are you? he asked. See the two red panels at the edge of the crater? the SOG hatchet force operator asked. Through binoculars, Wa scanned the ground until he located a group of SOG men and yards gathered inside one of the bomb craters made by the B-52s just an hour or so earlier. We need air support, the soldier said. We're 25 alive. Unbelievable. But the men in the bomb crater were surrounded on all sides by hundreds of NVA. As Billy Waugh and Major Alexander returned to Quezon to refuel, they pondered the question, how do you get 25 men out of a target area when you can't get any aircraft in? In the jungle outside Oscar 8, SOG operator Sergeant First Class Charles F. Wilklow crawled along on his belly, leaving behind a trail of blood as he went. Wilklow had been badly injured in the CH-46 helicopter crash, along with two other SOG men, four air crew, and 30 Montagnards, all of whom were now either killed or missing. After surviving the initial helicopter crash, Wilklow took cover inside a bomb crater with SOG operators Billy Ray Laney and Ron Dexter and roughly 20 Indige. The soldiers' injuries ranged from compound fractures to chest wounds, and at least 15 of them required immediate evacuation. From the crater, they watched as two SOG King Bee helicopters came in, preparing to load the most grievously injured onto the helicopters to get out. The first King Bee helicopter that was coming in took fire, crashed, and exploded in a fireball. But the second managed to land, Wilklow observed. 
The SOG operators, who'd been assigned to kill General Jop, jumped out while the injured soldiers from the bomb crater were loaded inside. Wilklow crawled to the helicopter and climbed aboard before it took off. Under heavy fire, the King Bee lifted up and began to fly away. Hundreds of NVA bullets punched through the skin of the aircraft as it ascended. Then, just as the pilot got up over the jungle canopy, he took a bullet to the forehead and died. The helicopter lurched into a violent spin. For the second time that morning, Charlie Wilklow found himself in a helicopter crash. The chopper spun and landed in the trees, the thick jungle canopy keeping it from hitting the ground. Wilklow looked around. He was alive, but there were dead bodies everywhere. Pushing past the dead, and despite grievous injuries, he climbed down from the trees and began running. That's when an NVA bullet caught him in the leg. He crawled into hiding out of view, for now. Through the bushes, he saw that SOG operator Billy Ray Laney was dead from a shot to the chest. He watched Ron Dexter be captured and executed on the spot. A third SOG operator, Frank Sias Jr., was also captured, but for some reason the NVA soldiers didn't kill him. They blindfolded Sias and marched him away. Wilklow lay silent in the bush. He was lightheaded from blood loss and without a weapon, having lost his Car 15 in the second helicopter crash. He could hear the NVA searching for him, but he'd found a place to hide. Finally, he passed out. When he woke up, he saw an NVA soldier in the trees staring down at him. The man had a 12.7 millimeter machine gun trained on him and was smoking a cigarette. Wilklow passed out again. When he woke up the second time, there were a group of NVA soldiers around him. He figured he was done for. Back at the SOG base at Quezon, Staff Sergeant Lester Pace was at work on the tarmac, loading and unloading men as they came in. He watched Billy Waugh climb out of the Cessna and hurry down into the SOG bunker. Major Kilburn was holding a briefing inside. He quickly related the facts. Twenty-five SOG men were alive in a B-52 bomb crater at Oscar 8, fighting to hold back an untold number of enemy forces. They would not last long without resupply, Major Kilburn said. He decided to have himself, with weapons and as much ammo as possible, inserted into the bomb crater immediately by King Bee helicopter so he could personally take charge of the situation and direct tactical airstrikes. Together with the 25 alive, Kilburn would hold off the NVA until a rescue operation could be launched, which would have to wait until after dusk. Waugh reported what he'd seen. Several SOG men had escaped into the jungle and were likely still alive. He volunteered to put a bright light rescue team together to search for anyone alive. Kilburn decided that sending in additional aircraft at this time of day was suicidal. Only the cover of darkness would change the calculus. It was barely 9 a.m. Wa would have to wait until dusk to launch a rescue operation. Mustachio volunteered to fly Kilburn into the bomb crater at Oscar 8. Lester Pace loaded up the aircraft for the two men. It was a radical, risky infiltration operation, which Mustachio pulled off flawlessly. In what an after-action report listed as occurring in less than 90 seconds, Kilburn leapt out into the bomb crater, the SOG men unloaded the weapons and ammo, then loaded the five worst-wounded indige into the helicopter, and finally signaled for Mustachio to get out. Back at the SOG base, the question on everyone's mind was, could the men left in the bomb crater last until dusk? In the jungle, Charlie Wilklow was awake again, thirsty beyond description, maggots crawling around his gaping leg wound. The group of NVA soldiers stood over him, staring down, 
a few with guns trained on him. The soldiers dragged Wilklow to a small camp adjacent to the Oscar 8 Bowl. They assigned a guard to him, a strange-looking man whose face had been disfigured, leaving him with no nose, just two nostrils above the top lip. Every time Wilklow passed out, he experienced a terrible nightmare about his captor and his mutilated face. After depositing Kilburn in the bomb crater, Mustachio made it back to base with five gravely wounded yards. While Lester Pace unloaded the helicopter, Billy Waugh asked Mustachio how long until he was ready to go searching for missing SOG operators. Mustachio said he was ready now. It was 10 a.m. That's close enough to dusk, thought Waugh. Mustachio and Waugh headed back to Oscar 8, flying over it, outside the range of anti-aircraft fire, desperately searching for a sign of anyone who might be alive. Any combat soldier who has evaded capture and awaited rescue will tell you that there is nothing like the sound of helicopter rotor blades to sharpen the will to survive. These rescue operations were critical to morale, says John Plaster. The thought that your fellow SOG men would never give up a chance to look for you was why so many SOG operators were willing to keep running into battle despite highly unfavorable odds. Meanwhile, on the jungle floor outside Oscar 8, the group of NDA soldiers who'd captured Charlie Wilklow decided to use him as bait. Wilklow's lower leg was nearly destroyed. He was not going anywhere, so they laid him down in an open clearing and spread out his red rescue panel on his chest, hoping the SOG helicopter flying overhead would see him and come for him. But the jungle was endless, a sea of green trees, and neither Waugh nor Mustachio spotted Charlie Wilklow spread out on the ground with a signal panel on his chest. After dusk, Kilburn and the twenty men in the bomb crater were all extracted alive. But there were no survivors beyond that. Twenty-four hours passed. The next day, Waugh and Alexander continued searching. Nothing. Forty-eight hours passed, then seventy-two. Still searching, still no missing men found. On the fourth day, on a pass over the western edge of the Horseshoe Ridge, Waugh noticed an unusual color on the jungle floor, red. He asked Major Alexander to fly in closer. My God, he thought, that's a red signal panel. There was a body down there with a signal panel across the chest. Waugh was certain of it. Waugh used the FM radio to call back to Quezon. He requested two SOG men and a helicopter for a rescue mission. All the SOG recon men were out on new missions. The only SOG man on base was Lester Pace, working resupply. Didn't matter. Waugh knew Pace to be a dedicated SOG man who also happened to be endowed with hellacious strength. I told him I needed him for a rescue mission, remembers Waugh. Pace said he was just about to leave for some rest and relaxation in Hong Kong. No, you're not, said Wa. Of course I was going to go on the rescue mission, Pace recalled in an interview for this book. I'd already served my time in the jungle, spent six or seven months on a SOG recon team. I knew everyone on base. Now in resupply, I'd get the guys anything they needed to complete a mission. I saw them go out, and I was aware who didn't return. Not wasting any time, Waugh briefed Pace on the rescue mission over the radio. He'd need to rappel down out of a hovering king bee, wearing an extraction rig and carrying a second one. When you reach the man on the ground, said Waugh, hook him to yourself, give the pilot the thumbs up, and both of you will lift off. Pace said he understood. The helicopter pilot flew Lester Pace to the target area, 
loitering over the jungle canopy where the man and his red panel were last seen. I sensed nothing but danger, Pace recalled, all the danger in the world. The NDA were like the Tasmanian devil. They swarmed. They hid. They were everywhere. My gut feeling was, wow, this might be the end for me. With the pilot hovering over the target, Lester Pace leaned out of the helicopter for a better look. He saw the Sog Man move. The man was definitely alive. Pace gave the pilot the signal he was going to go, then repelled down toward the body. He hooked the soldier to the second rig, then gave the pilot the thumbs up. The pilot lifted the two men up off the ground and moved fast out of enemy territory. Wilklow grabbed and hugged me, remembered Pace. He said, I don't believe this, I'm supposed to be dead. The pilot made it safely back to base. When they landed at Quezon with Charlie Wilklow, everyone just grabbed and hugged him, Pace recalls. Sergeant First Class Charlie Wilklow had survived two deadly helicopter crashes, been captured by the NVA, held as a POW, forgotten about, and then rescued, all against impossible odds. The NVA had set Wilklow up as bait and had prepared to ambush and kill or capture the SOG rescue team. But apparently... After three and a half days, the NVA gave up on Wilklow being rescued and instead left him out in the open to die. Maggots that had infested Wilklow's wounds saved his leg and probably his life. The insects ate away the dead tissue and kept him from developing blood poisoning. After the war, Pace recalls driving on base at Fort Bragg. He saw a man walking along the side of the road and recognized him to be Charlie Wilklow. I rolled down my window and introduced myself, told him who I was, remembers Pace. He couldn't believe it. He invited me back to his place. His wife cooked a nice dinner, and he told her the whole story about how I saved his life. Pace retired from the U.S. Army Special Forces, moved to Brooklyn, New York, and worked as a school teacher for 25 years. He never told his family about any of his classified SOG missions. Lester Pace's son, Bakari Pace, found out about his dad's past in 2011, after the existence of SOG was finally declassified by the Defense Department and SOG members started sharing their experiences in forums online. The CIA had been watching Che Guevara's moves closely for eight years. In the spring of 1967, he disappeared. Despite the CIA's reach and resources, they had no idea where he was. In Cuba, things had ended badly for Che Guevara. In a speech in 1965, he'd attacked the Soviet Union, calling its leaders state-run profiteers. He'd expressed outrage over the fact that the Soviet Union wasn't doing more to support small wars of liberation around the globe. Castro was unable to control Che's pro-war rhetoric, which included a call for nuclear war should it come about. Moscow put pressure on Fidel Castro to do something about him. The CIA intercepted a communique from Leonid Brezhnev, warning that the activities of Ernesto Che Guevara were harmful to the true interests of the communist cause. Under pressure from his Soviet benefactors, Fidel Castro sent Che Guevara to Africa to start a revolution in Congo, which failed. In November 1966, Che Guevara left for Bolivia to try to start a revolution there. The handsome revolutionary was one of the most recognizable figures in the world, so he disguised himself as a middle-aged Uruguayan economist, wearing thick glasses and a skullcap that made him look bald. 
Before he left Cuba this last time, Che gave his wife, Alida, a letter to read to their children should he never return. Grow up to be good revolutionaries, Che implored. Remember that the revolution is what is important and that each one of us on our own is worthless. Now it was the summer of 1967 and a deathly ill Che Guevara was holed up in the Bolivian mountains with a small band of Marxist revolutionaries who were in equally bad shape. Like men shipwrecked on an island, Che and his guerrilla fighters had barely anything to eat. When a local peasant shared his food with them, cooked pork, they were unable to digest the meat and got sick. Eventually, they slaughtered their own horses and mules. Emaciated from diarrhea and without asthma medicine, Che hadn't taken a bath in six months. The will to go on withered from him, he wrote in his diary. He felt depressed. The Bolivian army was after him. So was the CIA. In June 1967, in Miami, Florida, Felix Rodriguez received a call from his CIA case officer. Rodriguez had continued to work for the agency on contract operations ever since he was first recruited for Brigade 2506, the Bay of Pigs operation in 1961. Then came a mysterious call. Are you willing to go to Bolivia and lead a mission? A man asked cryptically. Rodriguez learned that the job he was being offered required unconventional warfare skills and that it was an anti-guerrilla operation, a mission so highly classified it had been authorized by the President of the United States. The U.S. ambassador to Bolivia set forth a stipulation that the man chosen by the CIA to lead the covert operation needed to be a non-U.S. citizen. Felix Rodriguez was still a Cuban national. What's the mission? Rodriguez asked. Train Bolivian army rangers in unconventional warfare and go get Che Guevara, he was told. Rodriguez was flown to Bolivia, where he spent months training army rangers in unconventional warfare techniques. By the first week of October, the CIA's network of assets had finally honed in on where Che Guevara was hiding out. He was holed up in the mountains in a remote village called La Juguera in Valagrande province. Two days later, Rodriguez was installing an aircraft antenna in an airplane at the general headquarters of the 8th Division of the Bolivian Rangers when a coded message came over the radio. Papa Consado, the message said, Dad is tired. The Rangers, trained by Rodriguez, had captured Che Guevara alive. Rodriguez notified his CIA handler. That same night, President Johnson received a memo from National Security Advisor Walt Rostow saying that Che Guevara had likely been captured. The Bolivian unit engaged is the one we have been training for some time, Rostow told the president. This tentative information that the Bolivians got Che Guevara will interest you. It is not yet confirmed. In the morning... Felix Rodriguez and Bolivian Colonel Joaquin Zanteno Anaya flew by helicopter to the one-room schoolhouse in the mountains where Che was being held captive. Rodriguez asked to see the prisoner alone. Che Guevara was on the floor, his arms tied and his feet bound. His clothes were torn, his hair was matted, and in place of shoes he wore pieces of leather tied with cord. There in the schoolhouse, with the prisoner looking on, Felix Rodriguez set up his radio and transmitted a coded message to the CIA station in La Paz to be retransmitted on to headquarters at Langley in Virginia. Rodriguez photographed Che's diary and confiscated his belongings. Besides the diary, there were some pictures, 
Che's address book, and a roll of microfilm. Rodriguez says he spoke to Che alone for over an hour, and that he told him he was Cuban and had been part of the CIA's Brigade 2506. I said that in the aftermath of the CIA invasion at the Bay of Pigs, he had personally executed several of my friends. Ha, Che said in response, nothing more. I don't know what he was thinking at that moment, and I never asked, Rodriguez recalls. He says he told Che that he was working for the CIA, and that the agency wanted him alive, not dead. Shots rang out in the room next door. A fighter named Anacetto had just been executed, and Rodriguez recalls hearing the man's body fall to the floor. Rodriguez received a radio call from the Bolivian High Command, he later told the CIA's Inspector General, with a coded message. The code numbers 500 and 600 as orders to execute the prisoner Che Guevara. He knew that this was a violation of the Geneva Conventions. Rodriguez maintains that the Bolivian army was in charge of the operation, not the CIA. He stared at Che, a condemned man. We embraced, Rodriguez says. It was a tremendously emotional moment for me. I no longer hated him. Rodriguez walked out of the room, passing two Bolivian soldiers he says looked drunk. He asked them not to shoot Che Guevara in the face. He walked to a hilltop and stood there. When he heard shots ring out, he noted the time on his Rolex watch. It was 1.10 p.m. After a few minutes, one of the soldiers came out carrying Che Guevara's watch, a Rolex like his own. Rodriguez asked to see it. When the soldier wasn't looking, he says, he swapped out Che's Rolex for his own. It was time to move out. Using a canvas tarp, the soldiers loaded Che Guevara's body into the helicopter. But balancing the corpse inside the small helicopter was challenging, and a decision was made to strap the body to one of the helicopter's skids. Rodriguez struggled with the task. Looking down, he noticed he had Che Guevara's blood on his hands. Back at Bolivian Army Headquarters, Felix Rodriguez briefed Chief of Staff General Alfredo Ovando Candia on the events of the day. At one point during the conversation, the general ordered a subordinate to cut off Che Guevara's hands, remembers Rodriguez. The hands were sent to Cuba, to Fidel Castro, as proof that Che was dead, Rodriguez stated in an interview for this book. I know for certain from sources that they are kept in preservatives in Havana, in a secure facility there. Rodriguez says that on occasion, Che's amputated hands are ceremoniously brought out and shown to anti-American revolutionaries as a physical reminder of the dirty work done by the United States and the Central Intelligence Agency. On February 24, 1969, Felix Rodriguez became a citizen of the United States. He told his CIA handler that he wanted to volunteer for U.S. government service in Vietnam. He was assigned to the Phoenix Program, one of the most controversial programs of the Vietnam War. Phoenix was one of several pacification and rural security programs that CIA ran in South Vietnam during the 1960s, says Colonel Andrew R. Finlayson, an officer in the Phoenix program. The premise of pacification was that if peasants were persuaded that the government of South Vietnam and the United States were sincerely interested in protecting them from the Viet Cong and trained them to defend themselves, then large areas of the South Vietnamese countryside could be secured or won back from the enemy without direct engagement by the U.S. military. This is not what happened. When so-called pacification was not realized, 
as the numbers of Viet Cong in the South went up as opposed to going down, the program was expanded. Whereas the Civilian Irregular Defense Group program focused on armed defense, the Phoenix program was intelligence-based. The CIA created a network of roughly 100 local intelligence committees across South Vietnam. These committees, says Colonel Finlayson, collected information on the Viet Cong and then disseminated it to local police. When this didn't work, the CIA-funded program became even more aggressive. Essentially, these committees created lists of known VCI, Viet Cong, operatives. Once the name, rank, and location of each individual VCI member became known, CIA paramilitary, or South Vietnamese police or military forces, interrogated these individuals for further intelligence on the communist structure and its operations. These CIA paramilitary teams were called Provincial Reconnaissance Units, PRUs. Felix Rodriguez was the deputy field advisor for the PRU in the village of Bien Hoa. His boss was a CIA officer named William Buckley, who, in due time, would become the central figure in President Ronald Reagan's decision to construct a foreign policy tool called preemptive neutralization. But that was far in the future. For now, every day with the PRU was about trying to quell the communist insurgency enveloping the South. Every field advisor assigned to a PRU paramilitary team worked undercover. Rodriguez's cover was that he was a civilian advisor for the U.S. Army. CIA internal memos described the provincial reconnaissance units as the investigatory and paramilitary attack teams that would support the Phoenix program in the field. Witnesses say that the program used torture, murder, and assassination to try to rid the South of the Viet Cong. U.S. officials have long disputed this claim. A similar program was developed in Afghanistan 40 years in the future. What would begin as a program of pacification in Afghanistan in September 2001 would be transformed into the first U.S. government targeted killing campaign to be publicly acknowledged by an American president. Chapter 14, Green Berets The Special Forces A-Team camp at Tan Tri was located in Ken Thuong province in the Mekong Delta, strategically positioned just three miles from Vietnam's border with Cambodia. What happened there in the summer of 1969 would become an international scandal known as the Green Beret Affair, a tragic conundrum that would raise complex questions about murder versus assassination and the mysterious relationship between the CIA and the Green Berets and about the laws of war. Most important to this story, the Green Beret Affair of 1969 demonstrates how the construct of plausible deniability shields the U.S. president from wrongdoing while exposing operators who carry out euphemistic orders vulnerable to prosecution and jail time. As per the terms of the 1954 Geneva Conference on Indochina, fighting in Cambodia was prohibited. By 1967, intelligence dictated that the communists had expanded the Ho Chi Minh Trail down into Cambodia to a terminus point on the border, just 30 miles from Saigon, called the Parrot's Beak. Starting in the spring of that same year, Mac V. Sog began running secret cross-border operations into Cambodia under the code name Daniel Boone. 
Detachment B-57 of the 5th Special Forces Airborne at Tan Tri provided intelligence for those and other missions under the CIA code name Project Gamma. Like so many other Green Beret paramilitary units across Vietnam, the one at Tan Tri was a hybrid of Special Forces soldiers, CIA personnel, and local indigenous soldiers. Detachment B-57 was made up of six Green Berets, three CIA operators, and as many as 450 indigenous fighters. The unit was commanded by one of the CIA operators, a 27-year-old former insurance salesman named Robert F. Morasco. He went by the cover name Captain Martin. In the winter of 1968-69, Morasco had assembled a network of 20 indigenous assets who spied for him around the parrot's beak. His most valuable spy, called a principal asset, was a 31-year-old native of the North named Ty Cock Chwin. Chwin's official position was S-5 interpreter, or TERP, in military speak. Chwin had been recruited by CIA case officer Sergeant Alvin Smith, Jr., who went by the cover name Peter Sands, and who reported to Morasco at Tan Tree. Smith was an enigmatic CIA case officer, older than Morasco by 15 years. He was also a veteran of unconventional warfare, having led covert operations behind enemy lines in Korea. According to his file, Alvin Smith once served as the only American in a battalion of 1,400 Korean and Chinese indigenous troops as part of a jack mission that has never been fully declassified. For better or for worse, Alvin Smith was known for becoming friendly with his assets. At the nearby support base in Ma Kwa, he'd sometimes stay up late into the night drinking whiskey with Chuin. How Chuin spoke such good English irked Smith. Chuin said he grew up reading books in English and that he'd worked for the U.S. military in Saigon. When pressed, Chuin was vague about the details, claiming the missions were all classified. Now it was March 1969, and there'd been an unusual number of mortar attacks in Ma Kwa, an indicator that a bigger attack might be coming. Morasco sent a unit out on a recon mission led by a Green Beret from Kentucky named Terry McIntosh. Just 19 at the time, McIntosh was one of the youngest Green Berets assigned to the war. He'd already been in Vietnam for seven months. It was me, Chuen, and ten indigenous troops on the mission, McIntosh recalled in an interview for this book. A little before dawn, I spotted enemy movement along the tree line, indicating an ambush. McIntosh fired a grenade launcher in the direction of the troops and watched the fighters disperse. He handed the scope off to Twin. He looked through it. I remember that he smiled. I thought that was strange but dismissed it, remembers McIntosh, who then tried calling the A camp for support, but the radio was dead. Ground-to-ground -ground comms were usually excellent out here, he recalls. That the radio didn't work was strange to him. Suddenly, a volley of fire erupted from all sides, as if the Viet Cong had foreknowledge that the team was coming, says McIntosh. A massive firefight ensued, with McIntosh firing his assault rifle until he was out of ammunition. Chuin was on my left, and the others to my right, but I noticed that Chuin wasn't firing his weapon, he remembers. He was fiddling with it, and later claimed that it was jammed. At the time, I accepted his explanation without reservation. Back at the A camp, the commander heard artillery fire and ordered a mortar attack based on the unit's last known position. The firefight ended without any fatalities from Detachment B-57, 
and the men returned to Tan Tree. McIntosh, a radio specialist, and a teammate examined the gear. It had been tampered with, McIntosh recalls. He told Morasco, who became concerned. One of Morasco's other assets told him he'd heard Schwinn was a communist spy. Morasco ran a search in the MACV database, but there was no record of Schwinn. As a CIA employee, Morasco had access to classified information that others did not. That no record on Schwinn appeared likely meant that he was lying about having ever worked on classified missions in Saigon. Fearing he was a double agent, Morasco radioed headquarters at Natrang and asked that both men, Smith and Schwinn, be reassigned. Smith was moved over to the 5th Special Forces headquarters and Schwinn returned to Saigon, where his family lived. A few weeks later, a Special Forces recon team recovered photographs of a high-level North Vietnamese Army general meeting with his local Viet Cong spies. In one of the photographs, there was Chuyen, standing right next to the North Vietnamese general, smiling. Robert Morasco was sure it was Chuyen. Alvin Smith was also shown the photograph and had the same response. It was Twin. Their principal asset was a spy for the North. On June 9th, CIA headquarters instructed Alvin Smith to bring Twin in, under the guise of a covert operation. For five days, Twin was interrogated. He repeatedly failed the polygraph, all the while insisting the person in the photograph was not him. The transcript of what he actually said has never been declassified, but according to reports leaked to the press, he cursed the Americans and said they'd lose the war to the communists in the North. What to do about the double agent, Twin? He couldn't be sent to local law enforcement. The police around the Parrot's Beak were notoriously corrupt and rife with double agents. Twin knew the identities of all the undercover CIA officers, operators, and assets at Tan Tree. Alvin Smith suggested they try to turn Twin into a triple agent, someone who could work for the CIA again. Morasco contacted the CIA station in Natrang and asked what he should do. He was told to kill him. Twin was my agent and it was my responsibility to eliminate him with extreme prejudice, Morasco later told the New York Times. Morasco said these were oblique yet very, very clear orders. He explained further that everyone working covert operations for the CIA and special forces knew that the phrase eliminate with extreme prejudice was a euphemism for kill. Morasco reached out to the commander of the U.S. Army Special Forces, Colonel Robert B. Rowe, asking for his orders on the matter. Colonel Rowe told Morasco that the group was to proceed. The CIA officers and the U.S. Army Green Berets agreed on a cover story. They'd say Twin had been assigned to a covert mission and then disappeared. Everyone involved agreed to proceed except Alvin Smith, who refused to participate. Agent Twin was told he was needed for a highly classified mission. On June 20th, 1969, the CIA officer and the Green Berets drugged Twin with morphine, drove him to a remote beach near Natrang, and loaded him into a boat. They took the boat out into deep waters in Natrang Bay, where Morasco shot Twin in the head with a 22 caliber pistol equipped with a suppressor while Twin was still unconscious. The men loaded Twin's body into a mail sack, weighted it down with chains and tire rims, and threw him overboard into the South China Sea. The following day, a cable came in from CIA headquarters. 
Killing is no solution, it read. Paranoia gripped CIA case officer Alvin Smith. He went to his CIA superior in Natrang and asked for asylum in exchange for information. With immunity in place, he told his superior officer that his colleagues at Tan Tri had killed Chuin and that now Smith feared for his own life. Things moved fast. The CIA officer notified the U.S. Army, which sent the information up the chain of command, all the way to the U.S. commander in Vietnam, General Creighton Abrams, Jr. General Abrams summoned Colonel Rowe to his office and asked what had happened to Chuin. Rowe told the general that the asset was away on a secret mission, when in fact he'd already been killed. When General Abrams learned he'd been lied to, he exploded with rage. The following day, Colonel Rowe, Robert Morasco, and six Green Berets were arrested, handcuffed, and sent to the Long Bin Jail outside Saigon. They'd be tried for conspiracy to commit murder and murder in the first degree, Abrams said. The military imposed a gag order on those who knew about the case, but reporters quickly learned of the arrests and the details of their imprisonment. That American Green Berets were being held in solitary confinement, in tiny five-by-seven cells with just a cot and a bare light bulb, seemed outrageous. How could the U.S. Army treat its own soldiers like this? Most shocking of all, the Secretary of the Army said that if the men were convicted, their punishment would be life in prison, not a firing squad. Firing squad? The press cried absurd. Despite the growing anti-war movement across America, a majority of civilians sided with the Green Berets, calling them scapegoats of the Pentagon war machine. More mysterious details emerged. Double agents, triple agents, Green Berets, the CIA. Then came the rumor that the Green Berets were operating across the border in Cambodia, this at a time when the Nixon White House had already insisted that a New York Times reporter who'd revealed that the United States was dropping bombs in Cambodia was a liar. When someone leaked to the press the photograph of Chuin standing next to the North Vietnamese Army general, smiling, citizens and congressmen alike began to ask questions. How could killing a Viet Cong spy in a war zone be considered a war crime? Life magazine interviewed Colonel Rowe's 11-year-old son, Robert Jr. What's all the fuss about? asked the fifth grader. I thought that's what Dad was in Vietnam for, to kill the Viet Cong. Henry Rothblatt, defense attorney for the Green Berets, made a brilliant move. He deposed the CIA. Morasco's identity as a CIA officer remained classified. Morasco revealed his identity to the New York Times in 1971. Rothblatt was betting that there was no way the White House would allow the CIA to testify in court. Between its ongoing assassination programs, the Phoenix program, the classified Mac V. Sog missions into Laos and Cambodia, these were but a few of the president's hidden hand programs that surely needed to remain that way. The president's inner circle would never allow the CIA to testify about its operations in Vietnam. The White House had far too much to lose. President Nixon had a last-minute idea, a double-cross of CIA director Richard Helms, who Nixon disliked. In a note to Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, Nixon wrote, K. I think Richard Helms should be made to take part of the rap. While there's no record of Kissinger's reaction, based on actions taken, it is likely he advised the president against throwing Helms under the proverbial bus. Instead, the following morning on September 29, 1969, 
the U.S. Army unexpectedly dropped all charges against the eight men involved in the Green Beret affair. The U.S. Department of Justice concluded that a fair and impartial trial was not possible. Further details of the CIA's refusal to testify remain classified, but under pressure, the Nixon White House was forced to acknowledge that the president had been involved in the decision to drop all murder charges. Decades later, after Mac v. Sog was declassified, a fascinating detail emerged. On August 25th, a month after the CIA officers and the Green Berets were arrested, but before the Nixon White House dropped the murder charges, a SOG recon team called RT Florida was sent on a top-secret cross-border mission into Cambodia. There, the team was pursued by a squadron of NVA soldiers using dogs to track them. In the process of evading capture, the SOG operators shot and killed two NVA officers. One of the dead men turned out to be a high-ranking intelligence officer. Inside the large leather satchel he carried was a gold mine, a cache of documents, one of which was a partial roster of double agents and spies operating for Hanoi inside South Vietnam. One name on the roster was the double agent executed by order of Colonel Rowe, writes scholar Richard Schultz. War is never pleasant, says Terry McIntosh. War is bigger than the individual soldier. For the record, as tragic as it was for all parties, I salute Marasco and others who were charged. They were soldiers under orders. There were no good options for them. The job fell to them. The moral issues are still unresolved. It was into this highly charged environment that a young Green Beret named Louis C. Merletti volunteered to go to Vietnam. Lou Merletti stood in the green grass on the side of Interstate 95 North in Fayetteville, North Carolina, with his thumb out. It was 1969. He was 21 years old, and he was hitching a ride to the Pentagon to volunteer for service in Vietnam. His whole life was in front of him, including his plans, dreams, and aspirations of doing great things for himself, his family, and his country. But he also felt he could not do any of this in good conscience if he skipped out on Vietnam. This war was going on, and I knew a lot of guys my age that were being drafted and didn't want to go, and they were going anyway, recalls Merletti. I really felt like, hey, it's not right. I have to contribute to this. I can't be sitting back here safe in the United States if these guys are going over there fighting this war. It just didn't seem to me to be fair. In 1969, the young Lou Merletti had no way of knowing what his immediate future included. He certainly had no idea that one day he would serve on the presidential protective detail of three U.S. presidents, or that he would become the 19th director of the U.S. Secret Service, a law enforcement agency created by President Abraham Lincoln and signed into law on the morning of April 14, 1865, the day of Lincoln's own assassination. The journey to war for Lou Merletti began two years earlier when he signed up for military service as an airborne infantryman. At the end of his first week of jump school, a very confident, very focused, physically fit young man showed up in full military dress to speak to Merletti's group of roughly 300 soldiers in training. The man wore the green beret. He gets up on this platform in front of us and says, Gentlemen, I'm going to be honest with you. Special Forces is losing men, and we need volunteers, Merletti recalls. He volunteered. Training lasted 42 weeks. You learn how to treat gunshot wounds, perform surgeries and amputations, 
It's basically like becoming a highly trained paramedic, Merletti explains. The U.S. Army Special Forces also wanted some of its medics to speak Vietnamese. They would be treating a lot of citizens in country. And so Merletti was sent to the language school at Fort Bragg. Over the course of the next five months, for eight hours a day, he was taught Vietnamese, by a lively young woman originally from North Vietnam. By the time he finished training, he had less than one year on his three-year enlistment. I was told I didn't have to go to Vietnam, he remembers. It was too close to the end of his tour, unless I volunteered. This is why he was hitchhiking to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., that spring day in 1969. Merletti had been standing on the side of the road in full dress uniform with his green beret for about five minutes when a man in a VW bug pulled up, slowed to a stop, and rolled down the window. Where are you going? the man asked. The Pentagon, Merletti said. It was the height of the Vietnam War. It was also the height of the anti-Vietnam War movement. The country was terribly divided. Lou Merletti had a feeling that the outcome here, with the driver of the VW bug, could go either way. The Pentagon? Are you kidding me? The man asked, incredulous. Lou said he was not kidding, that he was going there to volunteer for combat service in Vietnam. Well, if you're going to the Pentagon, the driver said, I'll take you straight there. And he did. Nearly 50 years later, Merletti vividly remembers being dropped off in the parking lot of the Pentagon, and he still thinks about the anonymous man who drove him there, the man's willingness to help do his part, however incremental. There in Washington, D.C., inside Defense Department headquarters, Merletti located Mrs. Billy Alexander, just as Billy Waugh had sought out and found Mrs. Alexander when he wanted to get assigned to SOG. Everyone knew Billy Alexander was in charge of assigning volunteers to special forces in Vietnam, remembers Merletti. And, as she had for so many others, she approved his request. You'll be in Vietnam in August, she said. To get to Vietnam, Merletti first flew from his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Chicago, Illinois, where he had a layover. He traveled in his Class A dress uniform and green beret. You really stood out as a soldier back then, Merletti recalls. No one else in the entire military was authorized to wear a beret. There was only the green beret. Then, to his surprise, as he approached the gate, Merletti spotted a fellow green beret. But it wasn't just anyone. It was his very good friend from Special Forces Training 7th Group, Mike Koropis. He was saying goodbye to his family, so I kind of held back, he remembers. Eventually, Mike Koropis spotted Merletti, and he introduced him to his family, a group of whom had come to the airport to see him off to war. I met everybody, and then it was time to go, to get on the plane, recalls Merletti, to go fight the war in Vietnam. On the airplane, a strange thing happened. Merletti and Koropis were sitting together in the front of the plane. The flight attendants began to serve lunch, Merletti recalls. They put a meal in front of me, and then they said to Mike, We'll get you a meal in a minute. Five or so minutes passed before the flight attendant returned. She says, We're really sorry, but we don't have any meals left. But here's a little voucher, so the next time you fly, you'll get an upgrade or something like that. Mike Koropis looked at the voucher. He looks at me, remembers Merletti, and he says, You know, this is a bad omen. And I say, What do you mean? He says, I'm not coming back. I say, Mike, don't say that. Don't say that at all. I said, You know, we all have those thoughts, but don't go there. Just don't do it. Mike Koropis looked squarely at Lou Merletti and said, No, I know I'm not coming back. When they arrived in country, 
Merletti, Coropus, and the rest of the Green Berets were taken to the island facility of Hon Tre, off the coast of Vietnam. There, special forces soldiers coming from the United States for insertion into the battlefield generally spent several days getting a refresher course in shooting, using hand grenades, setting off claymore mines, and the use of mortars. When the training on Han Tre was over, the group traveled to special forces headquarters at Nha Trang. They tell us, Okay, everybody, fall out, you have your orders. We lined up, and we're standing at attention, and they begin calling names off and telling you where you're going. Merletti heard the sergeant say his name. Merletti, A, 502. This meant he'd been assigned to Detachment A, 502, of the 5th Special Forces Group. The detachment's mission was to advise and assist the Vietnamese Special Forces in the joint CIA Pentagon program, the Civilian Irregular Defense Group. Lou Merletti remembers thinking to himself, hey, that's not a bad assignment. Then he heard Mike Coropus's name being called out and the assignment he'd been given. Coropus, CCC. Merletti remembers thinking to himself, oh God. Everyone knew that CCC was part of MACV SOG. The acronym CCC stood for Command and Control Central, one of what were now three SOG bases in South Vietnam. Special Forces soldiers who were new to the program knew SOG was the place where hardcore warriors with extensive combat experience fought direct action missions behind enemy lines. SOG was where Special Forces legends like Larry Thorne Ed Walkoff and Billy Waugh fought and thrived, some until they died. But for newcomers, for initiates into combat, SOG was dangerous. It was suicide on the ground. Merletti tried to make light of Coropus's assignment, but found the reality of the situation difficult to accept. I volunteered for Vietnam, he recalls. I don't think Mike Coropus had. I believe he'd received orders to go. I knew he didn't want to go to SOG, to CCC, remembers Merletti, but I knew he'd give it his best. The sergeant in charge announced that helicopters would be arriving momentarily to take everyone to their specific destinations. The formation breaks up, says Merletti, and Mike, who is standing maybe two people down from me, he steps over and he puts out his hand and he says, Hey, thank you for your friendship and everything. It's been wonderful. He said, I really appreciate you being my friend, but this is it. It's over. And I said, Please, Mike, don't say that. And he says, No, no, no. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's all right. Loomer Letty got on one army helicopter and Mike Coropis got on another army helicopter. Either right before the birds flew away, or as they were taking off, Merletti either said out loud to Mike Coropis, or he said to himself, No, I'll meet you back here in one year. Lou Merletti was sent to a small village called Trung Dong in the Central Highlands, a remote area at risk of being dominated by the Viet Cong. He lived in a Special Forces A camp there, built earlier by Green Berets. His team consisted of 12 Americans and a unit of indigenous mercenaries called CIDG Strikers, being paid by the Department of Defense to defend their village and to stop the enemy from gaining further control of the area. I had not been exposed to combat, Merletti remembers and on the very first night there was an ambush. In the ensuing firefight, six Viet Cong were killed, and one of the mercenaries was bitten by a poisonous snake, which Merletti treated in the field and had medevaced out, thanks to the guidance, he says, of teammate Sergeant John Deschamps. Some weeks later, he and the team were out on patrol in the dense jungle, 
when the CIDG striker standing right next to him was shot in the head. My immediate reaction, says Merletti, was, I've got to get help. Then I realized I was the help. After a few intense and shock-riddled moments, Merletti's special forces medical training kicked in. I knew exactly what to do, he recalls. I said to myself, I can do this. I was trained for this. And he did. He stopped the bleeding, wrapped the wound, and again oversaw the medevac. For the better part of the year, Merletti served in combat as part of a Special Forces A-team. Every time you go out on patrol, you have a lump in your throat, he recalls. You wonder, is this it? Every footstep you take, you know it could be your last footstep. To stay focused and not let his mind wander, when he went out on patrol, Merletti learned to pay attention to minute details. Every detail mattered. If he wasn't paying attention, he could cross a tripwire or step on a landmine or make a noise that might alert the enemy. You couldn't let your mind drift. You couldn't think, man, I wish I were at the ballpark. I wish I had a cold lemonade or a beer in my hand. Do that and you're dead. You learn to look at the ground in front of you, to look at your flank, pay attention to every single detail, every moment of every day. Merletti's one-year tour of duty was scheduled to come to an end on May 30th, 1970. But in the spring of 1970, the Defense Department announced it was reducing troop numbers in Vietnam at President Nixon's request, and all soldiers were being given what was called a 30-day drop. And so, in the first week of April 1970, Lou Merletti learned he was scheduled to leave Vietnam on April 28. All across Vietnam, Green Berets received the same news, and that included Mike Karopis, who for 10 straight months now had been fighting intense, direct action missions on a recon team for SOG CCC. On the morning of April 15, 1970, trouble began near a Special Forces A camp at Doc Sang in the Central Highlands, 10 miles from the border with Laos. Intelligence showed a massive buildup of NVA forces was underway, positioned to overtake the camp and surrounding valley. The plan was to insert a battalion of Special Forces soldiers and their ARVN counterparts on top of the mountain to protect the camp and all it stood for. One of the soldiers who fought there described this hilltop as little more than a bald knob with craters, but it was a strategic position with a vantage point over the surrounding valley. The U.S. Army and the North Vietnamese Army each wanted to control it. Designated LZ Orange, the Defense Department would initiate an offensive move to control it. So it was that at 0430 in the morning of April 15th, the flight line at Quantum Airfield came alive with pilots, crew chiefs, and gunners busying themselves with their pre-flight checks, mounting weapons, and loading rocket pods recalled Donald Summers, a member of the 170th Assault Helicopter Company. He was about to be inserted. As the sun rose, the offensive began. As at Oscar 8, helicopter gunships cleared LZ Orange, while two troop transport helicopters ferried in South Vietnamese soldiers and their U.S. Special Forces commanders. The first helicopter landed, and its crew charged out. Then, in a move perfected by the North Vietnamese Army, as the second helicopter hovered 50 feet over the landing zone, it was rocketed out of the air, killing nine of the 12 men on board. On the ground, there were eight South Vietnamese soldiers and five American soldiers who'd survived, including one pilot, one co-pilot, a door gunner, a pathfinder, and the crew chief. U.S. Air Force fast flyers came in screeching overhead, laying down suppressive fire. 
Over the past several hours, the losses in the area had been staggering. Four helicopters shot down. Seven helicopters hit, fate unknown. One of the A-1E Sky Raiders was last seen losing altitude above a ridgeline, its engine on fire. It was at this point in the operation that the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force Command assessed the operation from headquarters and decided a rescue mission was not possible without an unacceptable further loss of life, which is when a SOG Bright Light team operating out of Kontum was asked to volunteer for a rescue mission. Like firefighters running into a burning building, Staff Sergeant Mike Karopis, Staff Sergeant Dennis Neal, and six Montagnard mercenaries volunteered for the job. The operational plan was to insert the bright light team onto LZ Orange to rescue the men trapped on the hill. Bill McDonald of the 170th Assault Helicopter Company volunteered to pilot the team into the target area. Helicopter pilot Donald Summers was one of the men bleeding out and dying on the hill. He later recalled seeing the helicopter carrying the SOG Bright Light team on its approach. Roughly half a mile out from the landing zone, pilot Bill McDonald dropped his SOG helicopter into a deep dive and headed down to the valley floor. He had to fly in low and fast up the side of the mountain to the LZ, Summers recalled, or he would have been shot down long before he got anywhere near the hill. He was taking extensive fire from 360 degrees, but he pressed on. Crippled from enemy gunfire, but still flying, Summers watched horrified. The bird slammed into the landing zone. Fuel poured out of a large hole in the fuel cell. A rocket had lodged near the tail but not exploded. Under a barrage of small arms fire, Summers and the other survivors ran toward the helicopter. Summers remembered reaching the aircraft and looking inside. There, SOG Bright Light team members, Mike Karopis, Dennis Neal, and the six Montagards lay dead on the floor, shredded from multiple gunshot wounds. Summers climbed into the crippled helicopter, and by some strange aviation miracle, Bill McDonald was able to fly the helicopter away. Thirteen days later, on April 28th, Lou Merletti completed his service in Vietnam. He was helicoptered down from the A-team camp at Trudong to Special Forces Headquarters in Nha Trang. The first action he took was to walk up to the bulletin board and search for Mike Karopis's name. He found it. It read, Michael Vincent Karopis, killed in action, April 15, 1970. Merletti felt crushing loss. Standing there, I became overwhelmed with emotion, he recalls. The reality set in. I thought about Mike, and I still think about all the guys who died in Vietnam, each one of them. They were alive one moment, and then they got shot. There's no anesthesia on the battlefield. You get shot. It's incredibly painful to get shot. You bleed out before you die, Merletti says. Standing in front of Mike Karopis's name, Merletti made a vow. I wanted to try to live up to certain expectations of myself, for him, for Mike. Merletti vowed that moving forward in his life, were he to perceive something in front of him as difficult, he would stop and think of Mike Karopis. He would acknowledge that whatever problem he was having, he was having the problem because he was alive. Mike Karopis would not have the luxury of problems. Mike Karopis, age just 22, was dead. By the end of 1970, the war was all but lost, the human losses too great to bear. The mighty U.S. Defense Department could not win the war. There were no front lines. The enemy swarmed like bees, like ants crawling, 
or fish swimming, just as Mao Zedong warned in On Guerrilla Warfare, and General Zhap had echoed in his own manifesto. The communists dominated the geography of every environment. For much of the war, the Defense Department believed its helicopters could tip the balance of power. But by 1971, helicopter losses were insurmountable too. The precise number of helicopters shot down during the Vietnam War remains classified as of 2019. Still, the Defense Department was not ready to accept their loss, and several 11th hour attempts were made within SOG before 1971 to develop new tactics to win a guerrilla war. Billy Waugh was at the locus of one of these new ideas, insertion by parachute in an unorthodox manner. It was to be called a halo jump. This involved exiting an aircraft above 10,000 feet, free-falling to roughly 2,000 feet or even lower, then gliding to the earth using a steerable parachute. During the Korean War, General Jack Singlob had practiced this tactic himself as a possible insertion technique to use in the covert air operations he was in charge of for the CIA. But the tactic was never used in Korea. In 1970, the halo jump remained untested in war. Since World War II, paratroopers had always jumped into battle using static lines that would open the parachutes automatically, predictably, one after the next, so a large group of jumpers could land in a pattern on a drop zone. Vietnam was different. SOG recon teams knew the NVA didn't keep watch over landing zones at night because no one ever parachuted in the darkness until now. Waugh was in charge of selecting the world's first combat halo team, then overseeing all SOG halo training, including of the Indige fighters assigned to operations. The units practiced on a tiny islet just a few miles off the northwest coast of Okinawa called Lishima Island. There, SOG operators practiced jumping out of aircraft at 30,000 feet in full combat gear, then performing a military freefall for 27,500 feet, reaching terminal velocity before pulling the ripcord and landing in the ocean. The attempt to train their Indige counterparts was a tall order, remembers Wa. The Green Berets were all airborne qualified. Some, like Wa, had been jumping out of airplanes for more than 20 years. None of the Indige had ever left Vietnam, let alone jumped out of an airplane with a parachute. Half of our Indige had never seen the ocean before, recalls Wa. One of our guys got spooked and pulled his parachute right after he jumped. He missed the target by about ten miles. By the time we got him into the rescue boat, he'd already consumed about a gallon of seawater. He got very, very sick. On November 28, 1970, SOG's first halo team, RT Virginia, jumped into Laos. The unit was led by Staff Sergeant Cliff Newman, Sergeant First Class Sammy Hernandez, and Sergeant First Class Melvin Hill, accompanied by an officer with the ARVN and two Montagnard mercenaries, who had no experience jumping but did just fine, remembers Waugh. RT Virginia conducted five days of reconnaissance behind enemy lines and were exfiltrated without incident. This was the first known halo combat jump in the history of warfare. Seven months later, on June 22, 1971, Billy Waugh led the third halo jump team into combat, also into Laos. Teammate Madison Stroheim was captured and killed. The vertical wind tunnel at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School at Fort Bragg was named in his honor. But no amount of new thinking and no number of unusual infiltration tactics 
could salvage this unwinnable war. The following year, on May 1, 1972, SOG was disbanded. American citizens were fed up with violence and warfare. In January 1973, the Paris Peace Accords were signed, bringing an end to the Vietnam War, with the country to remain divided between the North and the South. With 58,000 Americans killed in Vietnam, guerrilla warfare was a dirty word. Across the military and intelligence communities, budgets were slashed. Across the CIA and the Defense Department, covert action programs were disbanded. The U.S. Army in general and the U.S. Special Operations Forces in particular suffered a black eye. Four of the Army's six Special Forces groups were inactivated. The two small units that remained were assigned to a program called Spartan, Special Proficiency at Rugged Training and Nation Building. To stay active, its soldiers worked with Indian tribes in Florida, Arizona, and Montana, helping to build roads and medical facilities. The U.S. Army vowed to concentrate on conventional warfare, to stay out of ungovernable places like the jungles in Southeast Asia, and to instead prepare for infantry and tank warfare on the flatlands of Central Europe. Men like Billy Waugh and the skills they possessed were not needed by the U.S. military or intelligence services anymore. The Army offered Waugh a desk job at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Waugh knew after more than 10 years of covert action and direct action combat operations that office work was not for him. In lieu of a retirement ceremony, he and six Green Berets halo-jumped out of an aircraft over Fort Bragg, pulling their parachutes 800 feet above parade grounds. They landed, packed up their parachutes, and spent the afternoon drinking beer in honor of their dead friends. Then they went home. Back from Vietnam, Lou Merletti enrolled in Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He would earn his four-year degree in a little over three years. One day before he graduated, he was walking through the student center when he caught sight of a notice on a bulletin board. NSA hiring, the notice read. He took the test being offered to new recruits, aced it, and was called in for an interview. Inside the foyer of a fancy building, he followed instructions that took him up an elevator to the 35th floor. I walked around. There didn't seem to be anybody in any of the offices, but eventually I located the correct room, Merletti recalls. Seated behind a desk was a man. After some small talk, the man spoke candidly. We're an intelligence gathering agency, he said. We're larger than the CIA. We want to offer you a job. Merletti asked why the NSA, an intelligence agency, was interested in recruiting him, a former Green Beret. After an exchange of words, I realized the recruiter was interested in my language capabilities, that I spoke Vietnamese. The man told Merletti that if he were to work for NSA, it would be a solid career but a job with an intelligence agency was not what Lou Merletti had in mind for his future. The war was over, he remembers thinking. How long were we going to be spying on the Vietnamese? Merletti told the recruiter that he was interested in finding a long-term and fulfilling career. The NSA recruiter asked Merletti what it was he wanted to do. I feel that I'm really good at protecting people and saving lives. Merletti recalls telling him, that's what I'd like to do. You should join the Secret Service, the man said. Lou Merletti had never considered a career with the U.S. Secret Service, but it made sense. He had the skills of a Special Forces soldier and the heart and soul of a protector. After two interviews with the Secret Service, he was hired. He thought about how awesome it felt to work for the agency that protected the President of the United States. 
A fascination was as old as warfare and would never go away. For Billy Waugh, the transition to a civil career was not easy. In need of a paycheck, he took a job at one of the few federal institutions that was hiring combat veterans without prejudice, the U.S. Postal Service. In the fall of 1972, he reported for duty at a post office in Austin, Texas, 20 miles from where he was born. Waugh rose up through the ranks. With the discipline of a Green Beret and a desire to excel, he moved from mail carrier to the person who oversaw the automated mail sorting machine. Let's face it, recalls Waugh, for a person like me, post office work is worse than death. Billy Waugh was 43. He'd spent 25 years of his life as a soldier, half of them in combat. In an interview in 2017, he shared a rare emotional moment about what he was thinking at that time. I do not ever recall feeling fear, not up to that moment in my life, not in combat before, and not anywhere since. But there in the post office, I feared my life was over, he remembers, that I would wind up some old man drinking at the end of the bar. For five long years, Billy Waugh continued to work for the Postal Service, until one night in July 1977, the telephone rang. He answered it and recognized the voice on the other end of the line. It belonged to a covert action operator he had worked with in SOG in Vietnam. The man asked Billy if he was ready for action, if he wanted back in. Waugh said yes. Chapter 15 Revenge It was just after 7 p.m., March 1, 1973, and darkness had fallen in Khartoum, Sudan. Outside the Saudi Arabian embassy compound, small groups of diplomats stood around saying goodbye to one another after a successful cocktail party. The American guests of honor were George Kurt Moore, the charge d'affaires, and Cleo A. Noel Jr., the ambassador. They were getting ready to head over to the presidential palace to have dinner with President Ghaffar Namiri of Sudan and Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, when all hell broke loose. A Land Rover screeched to a halt in front of the embassy's plate glass doors, and out leapt eight masked gunmen, each with a dagger attached to his belt. One of the gunmen shot an embassy guard in the head, another raked a wall with automatic machine gun fire. A bullet tore into the leg of Belgian charge d'affaires Guy Eade, and he fell to the ground bleeding. Ambassador Knoll got hit in the ankle, and he too went down. Run, run, run for your lives, shouted Jan Bertens, the Dutch charge d'affaires, the only diplomat to make it to the street before the terrorists locked the gates and took everyone hostage. Inside a reception hall, each diplomat was forced to identify himself by nationality. The terrorists released all but three, Moore, Noel, and Eid. The gunmen identified themselves as members of the Palestinian terrorist organization Black September. Founded in 1963, it had since become the most feared terrorist organization in the world. Through local journalists, the terrorists made their demands known. They wanted Sirhan Sirhan, the Palestinian who'd assassinated Senator Robert Kennedy in 1968, freed from a California jail. And they wanted 100 Black September operatives released from prisons in Israel and Jordan. At the White House, President Nixon was notified of the hostage situation by Henry Kissinger. The men sat down and discussed what to do next. Twenty-six hours later, the president held a news conference. 
The Sudanese government is working on the problem, Nixon said. He said of the hostages, We will do everything that we can to get them released, but will not pay blackmail. The policy, which was not written down, and which Nixon had made up three months earlier during a hostage scenario in Haiti, would play a profoundly consequential role in the decades to come. Just a few hours after hearing this news, the Black September terrorists in Khartoum received a phone call from their commanding officer in Beirut. Since President Nixon wasn't going to agree to the terrorist demands, the commander said, the American diplomats were useless and the gunmen should finish them off. In Khartoum, Robert E. Fritz, the new deputy chief of mission, had just arrived at the American embassy, where he'd been sent to replace Kurt Moore. The embassy staff was in a state of shock. The fate of their superior officers hung in the balance. But the mission of the U.S. State Department was unwavering. Diplomacy must go on. Khartoum was a lawless town, fueled by anti-American sentiment, and this was a fact every foreign service officer knew and accepted. Islamists were fighting Marxists and tribal warlords in the streets. There had been two bloody coups in four years. This majority Arab nation had severed all diplomatic relations with the United States after the 1967 Six-Day War, and only recently had relations been rekindled, largely due to the diplomatic efforts of Kurt Moore. Now he was being held at gunpoint inside the Saudi embassy, along with Cleo Knoll and Guy Eid. As deputy chief of mission, Fritz recalled the devastation he felt trying to bring order to the chaos he was walking into. The embassy occupied the upper floors of a commercial office building adjoined by others on the main street, he recalled. An intense dust storm called a haboob had kicked up and the power was out. Dust and grit were everywhere, in your eyes and teeth. I climbed five or six floors up the back steps, carrying my suitcase and my garment bag over my shoulder. Fritz made his way through the darkness into the embassy, where he caught sight of Sandy Sanderson, an administrative officer, standing in the dim light with his glasses on a string around his neck. I couldn't quite see his face, says Fritz. He was backlighted by the emergency lamps, but I could tell he was crying. We heard there was gunfire in the Saudi embassy, Sanderson sobbed. They may be dead. You're in charge. Sandy Sanderson was right. Moments before their death, Ede, Moore, and Noel were allowed to write letters to their wives. Cleo and I will die bravely and without tears as men should, was the last sentence Kurt Moore wrote. These were not bullet-to-the-head assassinations. The men, blindfolded with their hands bound, were peppered with gunfire, starting at the ankles, with a barrage of bullets leading up to the head. Sadism was Black September's trademark, and its members were notorious for inflicting the maximum amount of pain and suffering on their victims. For Black September, assassination was about revenge, about righting a wrong, the theft of the Palestinian homeland by the Jews. Documents kept classified for decades reveal the Black September gunmen were told by their handler that Kurt Moore was the CIA's top man in the Middle East, that he worked for the Israelis and had personally directed the killing of Palestinians, none of which is known to be accurate. But perhaps the most chilling details of the tragedy are tethered to the United States, in particular to Henry Kissinger. Behind many hidden-hand operations lie secret deals and dark bargains. Just days before the assassinations in Khartoum, 
an NSA listening post in Cyprus picked up a radio transmission indicating that a Black September operation was about to be carried out. The exhibits arrive on the Egyptian plane Wednesday morning, a man in the PLO's Beirut headquarters told a colleague in the Khartoum office, deciphered as code for a coming attack. The exhibits, the State Department later confirmed, were seven gunmen from Black September, four disassembled AK-47s, and eight hand grenades, all of which arrived on an Egyptian air flight from Cairo on February 28th, the day before the killings. Why the State Department failed to properly warn its top diplomats in Khartoum of a suspected imminent attack would take decades to come to light. Although it was not known in 1973, Black September was the brainchild of Yasser Arafat, chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, PLO. That the Black September terrorists took direct orders from Arafat, who planned and ordered the murder of the two American diplomats in Khartoum, was known only to a select few presidential advisors at the time. This information was kept classified by the State Department until 2006, until after Arafat, by then a Nobel Peace Prize recipient, had died. Bruce Hoffman, one of the world's foremost experts on terrorist organizations, explains. Black September had been formed as a deniable and completely covert special operations unit of the PLO group Al Fatah by Arafat and his closest lieutenants, Hoffman says. Its fighters were assigned hardcore terrorist operations that included bombings, ambushes, hijackings, kidnappings, and assassinations. It was the most elite unit we had, one of Al Fatah's former commanding generals told Hoffman. Our members were suicidal not in the sense of religious terrorists who surrender their lives to ascend to heaven, but in the sense that we could send them anywhere to do anything and they were prepared to lay down their lives to do it. No question, no hesitation. Black September's original mission was to foment regional violence and provoke Israel into bloody engagements, forcing its Arab neighbors from a passive to an active stance in its anti-Israel, anti-West campaign of violence. How Black September and the PLO work together in secret is its own complex narrative. What is important to this story is that Arafat chose a man of contradictions, Ali Hassan Salame, to serve as commander of the Special Operations Unit. Salame was the son of the martyred Sheikh Hassan Salame, commander of the Palestinian Holy War Army in the war against Israel, who died in battle in June 1948. But unlike his pious father, he was a playboy who drove around Beirut in expensive cars, ate at fancy restaurants, and dated models. Married with two sons, he flaunted his girlfriend around town. She was a former Miss Universe named Georgina Ritzk. Mossad gave him the insulting code name, the Red Prince. The terrorist organization took its name from the so-called Black September Conflict. In September of 1970, Arafat's guerrilla warfare corps hijacked four international airplanes and forced them to land in the Jordanian desert at Dawson's Field. Jordan's King Hussein used his army against the terrorist group, expelling all members from the kingdom. In revenge, Yasser Arafat secretly ordered the Red Prince to oversee the assassination of Wasfi al-Tal, Jordan's prime minister, during the Arab League summit in Egypt the following year. As Tal entered the foyer of the Sheraton Cairo Hotel, a Black September gunman stepped forward and shot him in the chest at point-blank range. 
They've killed me, Tall cried out as he fell to the floor bleeding. Murderers! They believe only in fire and destruction. As Jordan's prime minister lay dying on the floor, the assassin got down on his hands and knees and licked the blood flowing across the marble floor. This was exactly the image of his Black September killers that Arafat wanted to portray, while keeping his hidden hand role secret from the world. The Times of London ran a photograph of this blood-licking act, an image that was reprinted in newspapers around the world. What Arafat also wanted, at least initially, was American passivity— as the United States withdrew its forces from Vietnam, Arab terrorist organizations started cropping up across the Middle East, inspired by the U.S. military's inability to defeat a much smaller guerrilla army. Create two, three, many Vietnams, Che Guevara had instructed his fellow revolutionaries around the world, calling the Middle East a volcano threatening eruption in the world today. Even after his death, Che Guevara's words lived on. After successfully killing the Prime Minister of Jordan in 1972, Yasser Arafat endorsed the massacre of Israeli athletes at the Munich Summer Olympics, with operational command assigned to Ali Hassan Salameh. Eleven Israeli Olympic team members were murdered sadistically. One of the Olympians, weightlifter Yosef Romano, was castrated as his teammates looked on. Others were beaten and burned to death. Israel kept the most horrific details hidden from the public, knowing that this kind of violence opened the door to copycat operations. In response to the Munich massacre, Israeli intelligence launched Operation Wrath of God with the goal of killing every Black September member involved. Immediately following World War II, before the Nuremberg trials and other forms of procedural justice addressed the killing of millions of Jews, a small group of Holocaust survivors tracked down Nazi war criminals for assassination. They called themselves Nakam, Hebrew for Avengers. The group used an underground intelligence network to learn where individual Nazis lived so that they could kill them. These assassinations were rarely reported in the media because what country wanted the notoriety that came with a revelation that it had been harboring a Nazi war criminal? After Israel became a nation-state, a program of revenge killing was refined and developed by Mossad, Israel's equivalent of the CIA, which was founded in December 1949. Soon, in certain situations, assassination would be Mossad's weapon of choice. Mossad's assassination program was officially classified, but unofficially it was an open secret. The logic was... If you don't punish for one crime, you will get another, says Dina Pora, chief historian at Israel's Yad Vashem, or Holocaust Memorial. This is what was driving the Avengers, not only justice, but a warning, a warning to the world that you cannot hurt Jews in such a manner and get away with it. In its first two decades of statehood, Mossad became the undisputed masters of assassination, overtaking even the KGB in ruthlessness, cunning, and effectiveness. The department inside Mossad responsible for assassination was named Caesara, after the ancient Roman city built by Herod the Great. And inside Caesara, there was an even more secret, more elite assassination unit called Kidon, Hebrew for bayonet. After Black September murdered the 11 Israeli athletes in Munich, Mossad unleashed Kidon on them. Mossad's targeted assassinations of Black September operatives were equally brutal. This, too, was revenge. Wael Zweider was shot 11 times at close range, allegedly one bullet for each murdered Israeli athlete, in his Rome apartment. 
Mahmoud Hamshari was blown up in his Paris home after a bomb hidden inside his telephone receiver was detonated by Israeli assassins from across the street. A black September operative in London was expertly pushed under a fast-moving bus. More than a dozen Operation Wrath of God murders followed, including that of an innocent man named Ahmed Bukili in Lillehammer, Norway, a case of mistaken identity. Kidon operatives believed that the Norwegian waiter was the Red Prince. As the cycle of violence escalated, Black September fought back with a plan to assassinate Israel's Prime Minister, Golda Meir, during a visit with Pope Paul VI. Relations between Israel and the Vatican had been strained since Israel's founding. Mossad legend has it that in 1948, in exchange for diplomatic relations, the Vatican asked Israel to hold a mock trial of Jesus and reverse the original biblical death verdict of Christ. Israel declined, and no prime minister had been invited to the Vatican since. Golda Meir was not about to cancel this historic trip because of a death threat by Black September. In Rome, Mossad learned that the Red Prince intended to shoot down Meir's airplane with Russian-made SA-7 guided missiles as it landed at Rome's Leonardo da Vinci airport. Using a network of sleeper agents, Mossad disrupted the plot with just minutes to spare, according to sources familiar with the case. After failing to kill Golda Meir in Rome, Yasser Arafat assigned the Red Prince an even more incendiary job, oversee the assassination of two U.S. diplomats in Khartoum, Sudan. The cold-blooded, in-plain-sight assassinations of American diplomats inside another sovereign nation's embassy in Khartoum demanded a formidable response. Except most Americans had zero appetite for getting involved in terrorist disputes overseas. 591 American POWs held in North Vietnam were still in the process of being brought home from Hanoi. Diplomacy with armed revolutionaries did not work. Military force was not an option. The stage was set to handle the situation with the president's third option, the hidden hand. After the Black September terrorists killed Kurt Moore, Noel Cleo, and Guy Eid in the basement of the Saudi Arabian embassy in Khartoum, the killers called their PLO commander in Beirut and asked what to do next. Yasser Arafat instructed them to surrender to Sudanese authorities. Your mission has ended, Arafat said, in a communication that was intercepted by Mossad and shared with Henry Kissinger, but which the State Department kept secret until 2006. Explain your just cause to the great Sudanese masses and international opinion. We are with you on the same road, Arafat said. The next morning, the eight gunmen surrendered themselves. Two were released, and the remaining six tried for murder. During the trial, the leader of the group said that they'd acted under the orders of the Palestine Liberation Organization and should only be questioned by that organization. The assassins were convicted by a Sudanese court, but just a few hours later, President Numeri commuted their sentences and put them on a plane to Cairo, where they were turned over to the PLO. When pressed by the State Department, President Numeri defended his actions by saying that other states handed over Palestinian terrorists after far less action, and that America needed to face the political facts of life. President Numeri said that he had Sudanese and Arab opinion to consider. Three decades later, in June 2006, the State Department quietly posted online a 1973 CIA summary of the assassinations in Khartoum. The Khartoum operation was carried out with the full knowledge 
and personal approval of Yasser Arafat, chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, it stated. Robert Fritz recalled the fallout at the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum. The embassy staff was shattered, absolutely shattered. The U.S. government pressured the Egyptians not to release them. They were put under loose house arrest in a Nile mansion. Eventually, they evaporated, tacitly allowed to disappear. It was a travesty, lamented Fritz. Henry Kissinger was cited as having a bigger picture in mind. The bigger picture Henry Kissinger had in mind was dark and complex. In late 1973, in addition to serving as the president's national security advisor, Kissinger was now Secretary of State, meaning he was at the top of the chain of command of all U.S. diplomats. Instead of bringing the killers to justice, the better play, Kissinger decided, was to make a deal with Yasser Arafat and to use the Red Prince, Ali Hassan Salome, as a clandestine asset. At the CIA, the plan had been three years in the making. It began with a CIA case officer, an expert on Middle East affairs, named Robert Ames. Salome and Ames were like two sides of a coin. Ames, 35, looked like an insurance salesman with his 1950s haircut and wide tie. A devoted husband and father of five, Bob Ames was frugal, rarely drank, and sported a small pot belly. Salome roamed around Beirut in open shirts with chest hair spilling out his playboy reputation preceding him. A fourth-degree black belt, the Red Prince chain-smoked, drank expensive scotch, listened to Elvis Presley, and worked out regularly in the Continental Hotel gym. The cryptonym Bob Ames chose for Salome was MJ Trust, too. MJ was the code for Palestinians, PLO. Ames allegedly chose the root word trust because he trusted Salome. The number two designated him as the second CIA asset in a cluster. MJ Trust One was Yasser Arafat. Perhaps it is impossible to understand how and why Bob Ames chose to trust a man who'd orchestrated the murder of 11 Israeli athletes in Munich and two U.S. diplomats and a Belgian in Sudan, plus scores of others. But what is clear is that by 1974, Bob Ames's relationship with Salome had warped. Ames had overstepped the unwritten case officer asset rules in dangerous ways. In a letter to his wife, Yvonne, Ames called Salome his important friend. The two men exchanged gifts. After Salome gave Ames a set of golden prayer beads, Ames wanted to give his friend a gift of equal significance. Salome walked around Beirut with a pistol on his right hip. Beirut's Al Safar newspaper published photographs of him like this, and Ames thought it would be a great idea to give Salome a gun as a gift. Before he did, he sought approval from CIA headquarters. His superior, CIA director Richard Helms, expressed outrage. This crossed some invisible line, writes Ames's biographer Kai Bird. The agency could have dealings with a terrorist, but it would be unseemly to make a gift of a gun. Ames wouldn't give up, says his former analyst colleague Bruce Rydell, so headquarters suggested a compromise. They told Ames, okay, why don't you give him a replica of a gun? Ames, insulted, rejected the idea. Former CIA case officer Henry Miller Jones has an interesting take. They tell you in the CIA never to fall in love with your agent, but everyone does. For a while, the arrangement between the CIA and Ali Hassan Salome suited the CIA. 
that arrangement was to now leave U.S. diplomats and CIA officers out of the Black September bullseye. The Red Prince wrote and signed a non-assassination guarantee for all U.S. diplomats in Lebanon, wrote British journalist Gordon Thomas. In Beirut's intelligence circles, the joke was, it pays to live in the same building as American diplomats because the PLO security is so good. But the arrangement would only last as long as Salome was alive, and Mossad had every intention of assassinating the Red Prince. It would take a covert team of Mossad assassins five years to kill Salome, with a car bomb exploded on a Beirut street on January 22, 1979. Four of his bodyguards and three innocent passers-by were also killed in the targeted assassination. Before Salome was blown up, Bob Ames was able to give him the ultimate gift he longed for, a trip to the United States. With a CIA handler driving Salome around, the Black September operations chief and his new bride, Georgina Ritzk, visited CIA offices in Virginia, Hawaii, New Orleans, and California, where they also visited Disneyland. The agency handler, codenamed Charles Waverly, went out of his way to make Salome comfortable, going so far as to teach the Red Prince how to eat oysters and scuba dive. His January 1979 assassination was a turning point in the Middle East for the CIA and would impact U.S. national security for decades to come. 20,000 people, including Yasser Arafat, attended Salome's funeral. Why did Henry Kissinger, as Secretary of State, encourage the CIA's use of Ali Hassan Salome? a known terrorist, as an ally. Why choose covert action, the president's third option, over diplomacy, the first? This decision likely had to do with Kissinger's proximity to a series of scandalous events that were unfolding in Washington, D.C. In the spring of 1973, Congress began investigating what would become known as Watergate. For the first time in its history, the CIA allowed investigators from Congress to review documents from its files and interview its employees, says former CIA Inspector General L. Britt Snyder. As it turned out, all five of the men arrested for burglarizing the offices of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate Hotel in June 1972 had connections with the CIA. Here began a series of events and missteps within the CIA that would bring the agency to the most dramatic turning point in its history. It was the closest the agency has ever come to being disbanded. Nixon's CIA director, James Schlesinger, was preparing to leave the agency to become Secretary of Defense. Before he left, Schlesinger sent a memo to all CIA employees ordering them to reveal to him any illegal activity they might have been involved in since the agency's creation 25 years before. The instruction prompted a flurry of written reports, which were then compiled into a 700-page document that would become known as the Family Jewels. The action was unprecedented. The CIA had never compiled its hidden hand operations before. Three weeks later, the New York Times broke a story revealing that Kissinger had authorized the FBI and the CIA to illegally wiretap reporters, White House officials, and even his own National Security Council staff. Mindful that a major scandal was brewing in Washington, D.C., the CIA's new director, William Colby, felt the best move was to lock the family jewels inside the safe in his office. Over the next 15 months, the Watergate scandal, 
about a different illegal wiretapping consumed the news media and the public. The family jewels remained locked in Colby's safe. On August 8, 1974, President Nixon resigned, and Vice President Gerald Ford assumed the presidency. But the press was unrelenting, and the focus now swung to yet another CIA scandal that had previously remained hidden, raising alarms across the Ford White House. In December 1974, Colby, who had run the Phoenix program in Vietnam, sent Kissinger a note explaining some of the contents of the family jewels. Kissinger drafted a five-page memorandum for the president, summarizing the contents of what was there. Some of the actions clearly were illegal, Kissinger said. Others raise profound moral questions. The most incendiary material covered the CIA's role in the assassination of foreign leaders, Kissinger warned. He said that if these revelations became public, the CIA would be destroyed. It was a stunning concept that the CIA could actually be considered expendable. President Ford met with his chief of staff, Donald Rumsfeld, and his deputy chief of staff, Dick Cheney, to discuss the next move. They decided to invite editors from the New York Times to the White House for a discussion in the spirit of transparency. During a luncheon at the White House on January 16, 1975, New York Times reporters asked President Ford why the family jewels was not going to be declassified. Ford blundered. It contained explosive material that would blacken the eye of every president since Truman, Ford said defensively. Like what? one of the editors asked. Like assassination, answered Ford. Everyone went silent. The comment was made off the record, the president insisted, but it was too late. The cat was out of the bag. CBS News reported the bombshell. President Ford has reportedly warned associates that if the current Family Jewels investigations goes too far, they could uncover several assassinations of foreign officials involving the CIA. Across the nation and in Congress, there was uproar, moral outrage. The White House vowed to create a commission to investigate, ultimately turning the matter over to Congress. Starting in the spring of 1975, the Senate Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, chaired by Idaho Senator Frank Church, held 60 days of closed hearings. Seventy-five witnesses were called to the stand, including many of the most senior officers at the CIA. Among the findings, the Church Committee learned that the CIA had conducted more than 900 major projects and several thousand smaller operations, three-quarters of which had never been reviewed outside the agency. The assassination plots against Rafael Trujillo, Fidel Castro, the Diem brothers, and others were made public for the first time. Senator Church called the CIA a rogue elephant raging out of control. Exotic weapons used in assassination plots were shown on TV, including a gun that shot poison darts. The investigation lasted six months. That the CIA even had a paramilitary capacity shocked most Americans. That it engaged in plans to assassinate foreign leaders was perceived as morally outrageous. But what's notable is how blame fell almost entirely on the CIA when a comprehensive read makes clear that the orders were coming from the office of the president. The House Select Committee had its own investigation going on, chaired by Otis Pike, a Democrat from New York. The Pike Committee interviewed many of the same individuals as the Church Committee and found that the White House was to blame, far more so than the CIA. 
The CIA does not go galloping off conducting operations by itself, Congressman Pike wrote. The major things which are done are not done unilaterally by the CIA without approval from higher up the line. We did find evidence upon evidence upon evidence where the CIA said, no, don't do it. The State Department or the White House said, we're going to do it. The CIA was much more professional and had a far deeper reading on the down-the-road implications of some immediately popular act than the executive branch or administration officials. The CIA never did anything the White House didn't want. Sometimes they didn't want to do what they did. As the committees prepared to release their reports, there was a stunning move from the White House. President Ford met with his advisors, Rumsfeld and Cheney, who told him the reports had to be suppressed. Any document which officially shows American involvement in assassination is clearly a foreign policy disaster, Rumsfeld said. We are better off with a political confrontation than a legal one. Dick Cheney advised him that the White House should object to the release and attempt to block the reports on grounds that it compromised national security. President Ford agreed. A new team of presidential advisors was needed, Rumsfeld told the president, leading Ford to dismiss several key members of his cabinet. Schlesinger was let go as Secretary of Defense, replaced by Rumsfeld. Cheney became White House Chief of Staff. CIA Director William Colby was replaced by George H.W. Bush. Henry Kissinger retained his position as Secretary of State, but was replaced by Brent Scowcroft in the role of National Security Advisor. Later, Ford expressed regret for taking these actions. I was angry at myself for showing cowardice in not saying no to the ultra-conservatives, he said. It was the biggest political mistake of my life, and it was one of the few cowardly things I did in my life. Despite considerable efforts, Ford's new team of advisors failed to keep the Church Committee report classified, with Congress asserting its right to override the President. The Church Committee report, alleged assassination plots involving foreign leaders, was released in November of 1975. In a note all but lost to history, the Ford White House was able to suppress the Pike Report. Months later, parts of it were leaked to the Village Voice, but the public's mind was already made up. The CIA, not the White House, was to blame. In undated notes located in files at the Gerald Ford Presidential Library, Dick Cheney advised President Ford on the imperative to restore the authority of the executive branch. It had been unduly diminished by Congress in the wake of the Watergate scandal, Cheney said, and by the congressional reports. The advice was significant as it foreshadowed Cheney's own use of presidential authority 26 years later when he served as vice president. As vice president, Cheney would participate in presidential findings and MONs that dictated covert action, says John Rizzo, the CIA's long-serving clandestine service legal officer in an interview for this book. As vice president, in the George W. Bush White House, Dick Cheney served in the inner circle of presidential advisors and was present at most covert action meetings, Rizzo clarifies, not something you usually saw from a vice president. Rizzo was hired at the CIA in 1976 and served seven presidents, including as the CIA's top lawyer during the War on Terror. The remarkable construct of presidential authority, says Rizzo, is that the President of the United States can listen to whomever he wants. The year after the Church Committee published its report, President Ford issued Executive Order 11905, 
a decree to govern covert action operations, and this included a prohibition on assassinations. No employee of the United States government shall engage in or conspire to engage in political assassination, it read. Senator Frank Church objected, stating that a presidential decree could easily be changed by decree by another president, that by having an executive order on assassination and not a new law passed by Congress, the door was left wide open for new liberties in interpretation when a more conservative president took the helm, which is exactly what happened in 1981 when President Ronald Reagan and his advisors began exploring a new executive order allowing for preemptive neutralization of people who wanted to harm the United States. As Americans were reading the Church Committee report, learning about the dark underbelly of hidden hand operations and rogue actors, one of the most outrageous, hostage-taking events of the 20th century unfolded halfway across the world in Vienna, Austria. On December 21, 1975, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, was holding a conference of ministers at its headquarters in the Texaco building on Dr. Karl Luger Ring, when six individuals, five men and a woman, casually walked up to the guard at the front desk and asked to be directed to the proceedings. They looked reasonable enough, wearing raincoats and carrying gym bags. At least one from the group spoke German. But then, reaching into their bags, they pulled out submachine guns and began shooting, killing three people. The gunmen stormed the OPEC conference hall and corralled 60 people as hostages, including 10 of the world's 11 oil ministers, whose countries controlled 80% of the world's oil. Never before, and not since, have so many government officials from so many different nations been taken hostage all at once. Austria's head of state, Chancellor Bruno Kreisky was out skiing in the Alps. When he learned the news from his ministers, he rushed back to Vienna to deal with this first-of-its-kind crisis. In a press conference, Kreisky said that his government did not know who the terrorists were and that their organizational demands were not clear. As chancellor, however, he had granted the terrorists permission to fly out of the country with the ten oil ministers and others as hostages. Kreisky neglected to say that he'd negotiated the release of the Austrian hostages in exchange for meeting the terrorists' demands. In hindsight, this course of action appears absurd, but in 1975, Austria, like most other nations, was unequipped to deal with a hostage crisis. We were pressured into this decision by the fear that the hostages' lives would be taken, Chancellor Kreisky later said. You cannot stamp out terrorism by retaliation, because terrorism has its own laws. At 7 a.m. the following morning, 41 hostages were loaded onto a municipal bus driven to the airport and flown to Algeria, North Africa, in an Austrian Airlines DC-9 with a volunteer crew. At a second press conference, an Iraqi man acting as an intermediary said that the hostage-takers called themselves the arm of the Arab Revolution and that their leader went by the nom de guerre Carlos the Jackal. His real name was Illich Ramirez Sanchez. He was a 25-year-old terrorist and assassin for hire. Born into a wealthy family in Venezuela, Illich Ramirez Sanchez was sent by his Marxist father to Moscow to study at the Patrice Lumumba University, a breeding ground for a wide variety of terrorists in training. After getting expelled for reasons unknown, he transformed himself into Carlos the Jackal, 
hiring himself out to Arab terrorist organizations like Black September. By the time of the OPEC siege, the Venezuelan-born terrorist had killed at least seven people and was wanted by the British, French, and Israeli intelligence services. In Algiers, Illich Ramirez Sanchez met privately with President Huare Boumadien, and an agreement was reached. Five oil ministers and 31 hostages were released, while five oil ministers and 10 civilians would be kept as hostages. The aircraft left Algeria, this time headed for Tripoli, Libya. Here, he met privately with President Muammar Gaddafi, and a secret agreement was reached. After this meeting, Illich Ramirez Sanchez returned to the aircraft and instructed the pilots to fly back to Algiers, where the remaining five oil ministers and ten hostages were freed. He met with Boumondien a second time, flew to Baghdad, and vanished for more than a decade. It was later revealed that in Libya, he had been paid $50 million in cash. Instead of sharing the money with his revolutionary comrades, he kept the money for himself. He would live off the cash as Carlos the Jackal for the next 18 years. The CIA now had a watchful eye on Libya and on Muammar Gaddafi and a list of questions it wanted answered. Who was this man who called himself Carlos the Jackal, and where was Arab terrorism headed next? Would non-Palestinians like Illich Ramirez Sanchez remain committed to the Palestinian cause if there weren't millions of dollars to be made? To learn the answer to these questions would require covert operations, but for now, the CIA's hands were tied. Alternative options needed to be explored, and they would be. Chapter 16 Colonel Gaddafi's Libya For Billy Waugh, the years spent working for the U.S. Postal Service from 1972 to 1977 were misery incarnate. Then came the mysterious call on July 20th propelling him back into the world of covert action operations. The location is overseas, the caller said. Fine by me, said Wah. If Wah was in, the man on the phone said he'd arrange for a down payment to be wired into his bank account. I'm in, said Wah. More details would be forthcoming, but in the meantime, Wah needed to travel to Northern Virginia, and check into a specific hotel at 3 p.m. on July 25th, just a few days away. Wa agreed to the meeting at the hotel. Forty-eight hours later, a large sum of money appeared in Wa's bank account. The down payment was twice as much as the post office paid in a year. The overseas job was guaranteed for six months, but might continue for years, he was told. All travel and living expenses would be paid by the client, whose identity was to remain hidden for now. Bring clothes to last for a year in a very warm climate, the man said. The location is Africa. Waugh considered the situation. My instinct and intuition told me this was a CIA operation, he recalls, that the agency was forming some kind of a ground team for a covert operation in Africa. I figured this was how the CIA worked, now that covert action operations had been curtailed. The next day at the post office, Waugh told his supervisor that he was resigning his position. You're a good worker, and the post office is a good job, Wah recalls the man saying. Why are you leaving? Wah said he wasn't cut out for post office work. At home, he packed a small bag. On the assigned day, he flew to Washington, D.C., and took a cab to the hotel in northern Virginia. At the 3 p.m. meeting, he was not surprised to see the faces of three Green Berets from SOG, soldiers he'd worked with during the Vietnam War. 
based on the skill set of the team members, it was clear to Wah that the job was paramilitary in nature. The four-man team included a medic, a communications man, a handheld weapons instructor, and Wah, an expert in intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and heavy weapons. During the meeting, a fifth man showed up and identified himself as the client's lawyer. The team would be traveling to Libya, the lawyer said. Their job was to train soldiers who were part of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi's elite special forces. In addition to being its president, Gaddafi served as the country's commander-in-chief. The former SOG operators were escorted to the Libyan embassy and issued travel visas. We were told our flight was leaving late the next day, remembers Wa. Back at his hotel room, Wa considered the facts and his suppositions. In order to ensure plausible deniability, he guessed, the CIA was using paramilitary contractors and hiring them in a roundabout way. The situation presented an excellent financial opportunity for him. Still, his intuition said, make a few calls. Waugh reached out to several CIA contacts he had in Washington. None of the people he spoke with had any knowledge of this Libyan operation. He called the client's lawyer and asked if the mission was a covert operation for the CIA. The lawyer said it was not. He assured me it was all above board and there was no legal risk, Waugh says that we were going to be training the Libyan special forces in basic infantry tactics only. Wa asked to know the name of the client. The lawyer said the man's name was Edwin P. Wilson and that he was a former CIA officer. The client's lawyer said that while en route to Africa, the team would stop in Geneva for a briefing. There, they'd meet Edwin Wilson himself, who'd pay them directly and give them the names of their contacts inside the Libyan military. It was a sensitive job, the lawyer said, which is why the money was so good. Not everyone in Libya was pro-American, so it was imperative that the operators keep their identities hidden, for example, by always wearing a balaclava, the lawyer said, whenever they were on a military base. Colonel Gaddafi's friends included Fidel Castro and Idi Amin, the president of Uganda. Gaddafi didn't want anyone to know he also had American friends, the lawyer explained. Wa hung up and considered the situation. While he was sitting there thinking about what all this meant, the telephone rang. The caller addressed Wa by name. Wa didn't recognize the man's voice, nor did the caller identify himself. Instead, he told Wa that the two of them had mutual friends, and he mentioned two names, both of whom Wa recognized as CIA. The man asked Wa to meet him at a restaurant in Arlington, Virginia, in an hour. It was important, the man said. Wa should come right away. The meeting is about your upcoming travel plans to Africa, the caller said cryptically. At the restaurant, the man showed Billy Waugh his credentials, which identified him as working for the CIA. He said that his name was Pat. About the upcoming trip to Libya, it's not an agency operation, Pat said. Pat pulled out a briefcase and set it on the table between them. He opened up the case and removed a Pentax 35mm camera and several rolls of black and white film. He slid everything across the table to Billy Waugh. Pat said that I could assist the agency and myself by taking photographs of the various military facilities I'd be visiting in Libya, Waugh recalls. Of particular interest to Pat was an area 45 miles inland from the Gulf of Sidra called Jebel Akhtar, the Green Mountain, where there was a classified Libyan military facility. Satellite images indicated that surface-to-air missile sites were set up there, Pat explained, protecting the airspace around Benghazi. The missiles were Russian. Pat said that the CIA wanted photographs of them. 
Waugh considered what he was being told. There was a loophole in the U.S. Neutrality Act. While it was illegal to enlist in a foreign army, it was not illegal to advise a foreign army. That said, training a terrorist organization in explosives and munitions was treason. Libya was not yet a designated state sponsor of terrorism, but only because the State Department had not yet created its official list. However, Muammar Gaddafi was under the watchful eye of the CIA. To understand Gaddafi's actions, the CIA relied on open-source intelligence and some human intelligence, mostly from Arab locals, whose trustworthiness was anybody's guess. The CIA wanted Billy Waugh to act as its eyes and ears on the ground, Pat told Waugh. In training Gaddafi's commandos, he'd be part of Gaddafi's inner circle. The risks were great, but the rewards could be huge. Pat slid a small piece of paper across the table. On the paper was written a telephone number. This was to be Waugh's contact, Pat said. He gave Waugh a phrase-and-reply code, tradecraft for CIA assets in the field, and said Waugh should use both elements of the code in the event a problem arose in Libya. Waugh was told not to mention this assignment to anyone, not to his team members in Libya, and not to the man financing the operation, Edwin P. Wilson. Finally, Pat said, if the photographs were decent, Waugh would be compensated for his efforts. Pat asked Waugh if he understood the request and if he accepted the assignment. Waugh said yes. Waugh was going to Libya to work for an American entrepreneur who was doing business with Gaddafi. No one outside Waugh's agency contacts could know that he was also working for the CIA. As Waugh headed to Benghazi in August of 1977, Libya inhabited a peculiar spot in the geopolitical landscape. For those living in Libya, life had already become a living hell, but on the international stage, the country was still considered a tinderbox waiting to catch fire. CIA analysts watched Gaddafi's every move, and its Libyan desk hummed with timely reports. Soon, they would include Libyan military secrets passed on from Billy Waugh. Muammar Gaddafi had seized power in a military coup eight years before, in 1969, overthrowing the monarchy of King Idris. Gaddafi, then a military captain, made himself a colonel and declared his political party, the Revolutionary Command Council, to be the highest authority in Libya. He immediately imprisoned those who'd served the previous administration, many of whom would never be seen or heard from again. He tried King Idris in absentia and sentenced him to death. Much as Che Guevara and Fidel Castro had promised for Latin America unity and harmony among a group of people who live in a certain region, so Gaddafi promised a beneficent solidarity for all Arab nations. Like his idol, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, Gaddafi espoused a pan-Arab nationalism, the revolutionary brand. Within a year of assuming power, Gaddafi expelled from the country all American and British military advisors and shut down their military facilities, calling them bases of imperialism. The Italians, Libya's former colonizers, fared worse. 12,000 Italians were banished, told to exhume the bones of their dead relatives and take them back to Italy. The event was televised on Libyan state TV. Gaddafi promised reform for the people, including the nationalization of state oil. To promote a pan-Libyan identity, Gaddafi created something called the Arab Socialist Union, which fizzled. After the death of Nasser in September 1970, Gaddafi tried to assume the position of Arab unifier, but that endeavor also failed. 
He then worked to create an Arab federation with Egypt, Syria, and Sudan. They all received sizable financial grants thanks to the vast wealth Libya enjoyed through its oil and had no choice but to go along. But this, too, failed. When, in 1973, Gaddafi learned of a coup being plotted against him, his grip tightened. He created a militia to protect the revolution and began a systematic purge of the educated class. Death squads terrorized the population. Political parties were outlawed. Under the draconian Law 75, dissent became illegal. The state took control of the press. There were no legal codes or a legal system. Justice was arbitrary. Constitutional law was suspended and replaced with Sharia, Islamic law. For his first few years in power, Gaddafi was vocal in his disdain for the two superpowers, the United States and Russia, referring to each as a plague. They were together engaged in a conspiracy to harm the third world, Gaddafi said. Privately, he bought MiG fighter jets, anti-aircraft guns, and heavy weapon systems from the Soviet Union. Libya's neighbors, most notably Egypt and Sudan, grew suspicious and then alarmed. Gaddafi was no reformer. He was a megalomaniacal despot. Then, Egypt's new president, Anwar Sadat, began making inroads toward an alliance with the United States. A turning point in public perception came in 1977, when Fidel Castro arrived in Libya for a 10-day visit as a guest of Gaddafi. We are all revolutionaries, Castro told the Libyan Congress. The revolution must continue. To a standing ovation, Castro praised Gaddafi. Comrade al-Qaddafi has struggled for the sake of unity of the Arab world like no one else has done, Castro said. His struggle for prosperity, man's dignity, freedom against exploitation bind us together. We highly admire what you are doing. Castro insisted that the greedy imperialists needed to be fought to death by any means necessary. There was only one way, one path. He ended his speech with a call to arms against the United States. The country of death. It was into this incendiary climate that Billy Waugh landed in Tripoli, Pentax camera in hand, a covert action operator for the CIA. At the airport in Tripoli, Waugh and the others were met by a man who went by the name Mohammed Fatah, likely an alias. The team was escorted through Libyan customs, then to a hotel on the beach. In the morning, they met with Gaddafi's Minister of Intelligence, Major Abdullah Hajazi. He spoke in Arabic, which Billy Waugh was able to understand, with some help from an interpreter. Back in 1956, during U.S. Army Special Forces training, he'd been sent to Monterey for a five-month course in Arabic. He was rusty now, but soon he'd be almost fluent. The team split up into their areas of expertise. Waugh was taken to Benghazi, roughly 600 miles to the east on the coast. It did not take long for Waugh to figure out that Edwin P. Wilson had several teams of former Green Berets inside Libya doing an assortment of jobs. All were related to weapons training. Wilson said to be a close personal friend of Gaddafi, owned a seaside villa on the north shore of Libya near Tripoli and ran his operations from there. In Benghazi, Billy Waugh was set up in a room at the Omar Kayoum Hotel under the watchful eye of Libyan handlers. Each day, a woman in a black abaya sat in the hallway outside his room taking notes. The only thing visible was her eyes, remembers Waugh. She was so hidden by a black robe, she could have been a man. Who knows? 
For several months at a time, Wa trained Libyan commandos in small arms, heavy weapons, and explosives. How to ambush a target, conduct hit-and-run operations, sabotage. Most of the soldiers were unqualified and lazy, he recalls. Many of them were Qaddafi's friends, or people he owed a favor. Most of them ignored training or flat-out refused to be told what to do. Sometimes the consequences were lethal. Qaddafi wanted his own version of the U.S. Navy SEALs and assigned Wa to lead training. During a training exercise on the Gulf of Sidra, one of the commandos in a boat ahead of Wa leapt out of the boat into the water and drowned. He didn't know how to swim, recalls Wa. He thought the scuba suit worked like a life preserver and would keep him afloat. In a post-accident debriefing, Wa learned only two of the 22 commandos knew how to swim. Things were heating up across the Middle East and North Africa, with Colonel Gaddafi playing the role of central provocateur. In the summer of 1977, Gaddafi's forces carried out a tank raid on the Egyptian border town Saloum. In response, Anwar Sadat sent three Egyptian army divisions to its border with Libya, overpowering the Libyan brigades and pushing them back. The Egyptian Air Force attacked Libya's Gamal Abdul El Nasser Air Base near the border. State Department officials feared Gaddafi wanted to provoke a war with Egypt. LARG, Libyan Arab Republic government, anticipates military attack from Egypt which it hopes to exploit and cause overthrow of Sadat. Robert Carl, the U.S. Embassy Charge d'Affaires in Libya, wrote in a classified cable. The U.S. urged restraint and the border war lasted just three days. But the feud between Gaddafi and Sadat would not dissipate. The CIA had intelligence indicating that Gaddafi was plotting to have Sadat assassinated. In November 1977, the Pentagon provided Sadat with an armored helicopter, a Sikorsky CH-53E. The White House sent a U.S. Secret Service team to Cairo. They taught evasive driving techniques to Sadat's bodyguards. The CIA set up a secure communication system in the palace so that the president's moves could be anticipated. Anwar Sadat was America's best hope for an Arab partner in the Middle East, and he needed to stay alive. In November 1977, Sadat stunned the world by announcing his intention to visit Jerusalem and speak before the Knesset, Israel's national legislature. For the first time in three decades, an Arab nation was acknowledging the nation-state of Israel. Sadat's groundbreaking three-day visit to the country was a first step in what would become the Camp David Accords, but the move infuriated Arab leaders. Gaddafi called for Sadat's death. No one was more outraged than an Islamic extremist group inside Egypt called the Muslim Brotherhood. They, too, began plotting to assassinate President Anwar Sadat. It was in this extraordinarily volatile environment that Billy Waugh operated over the next two years, reporting to Gaddafi's Minister of Intelligence, Major Abdullah Hajazi, and developing a close working relationship with a Libyan Special Forces captain who went by the name Mohammed Al-Faraj bin Agabe. Taking photographs without drawing suspicion was difficult at first, but over time, Wa became a trusted presence. I discovered that the commandos loved having their picture taken, and I took advantage of this, he says. He began taking photographs of extremely sensitive military sites. Flying in a helicopter to the military facility at the Green Mountain, he photographed surface-to-air missile sites set up in a ring around Benghazi. The CIA had long suspected that Gaddafi was getting these defense missile systems from the Soviet Union. 
Waugh's photographs provided proof. As one of the favored trainers of Gaddafi's special forces, Waugh was now the highest-placed CIA paramilitary asset in Libya, with direct access to Gaddafi's most sensitive military facilities. On one occasion, he was invited to attend a small air power demonstration with Gaddafi and a guest of honor, Idi Amin. During the event, Waugh photographed Russian airplanes that the Soviets were supplying to Libya. Every action now had a dual purpose. While training Gaddafi's commandos how to halo jump out of aircraft over the desert, Waugh mapped regions previously uncharted by U.S. intelligence agencies. The information that Waugh provided to his CIA handler was sensitive as well as dangerous to his own livelihood, always marked TSSCI, Top Secret, Secret Compartimented Information, No Form, No Foreigners, No Contract, No Contractors, ORCON, Original Source Controlled, to keep Waugh as a source compartmentalized. What Billy Waugh did not know at the time was that in addition to gathering intelligence for the CIA on Gaddafi, he was also gathering intelligence for the CIA on Edwin P. Wilson, the U.S. Department of Justice, DOJ, and the CIA were building a case against Wilson, who the DOJ believed was illegally selling heavy weapons and high-powered explosives to Libya. Every few months, Waugh would travel back to Washington, D.C., file reports, turn in his film, then return to Libya with his Pentax camera and a new supply of 35-millimeter film. In the spring of 1979, he arrived in Benghazi and received unusual news. His Libyan counterpart, Mohammed Al-Faraj bin Agabe, said they were going to drive six hours into the desert to meet with Agabe's boss, Colonel Fatah. In a country where the president was a colonel, being a colonel was big time, remembers Wa. This was not an inconsequential event, and it took me by surprise. Without further explanation, Wa was driven to Tobruk, not far from the border with Egypt. There, he was brought to meet with Colonel Fatah. We notice you are good with the camera, Wa recalls Colonel Fatah telling him. The comment sent a chill up his spine. Had he been discovered? Did Libyan intelligence know he was working for the CIA? We'd like you to cross over into Egypt and take photographs of the Egyptian armed forces set up there, Colonel Fatah said. From the tone of the colonel's voice, it sounded like an offer Wa was not supposed to refuse. His mind worked quickly, thinking through a scenario. He told the colonel that he flat out couldn't do that. Why not, the colonel asked. If the U.S. found out about it, I'd be charged with spying for a foreign country, Wa said. Treason. Colonel Fatah told Wa he didn't see the logic. Wa tried explaining, but Colonel Fatah wasn't interested. After that, Wa says, he felt his relationship with the Libyan command structure cool. For a while, he was assigned to a remote military base on the northeast coast, at Darna. Then he was sent back to the facility outside Benghazi. Across the Arab world, things were getting worse for American workers. On base, Wa mostly wore his balaclava, but a lot of the time it was off. He was tan from the intense sunshine, but everyone knew he was the American with sandy blonde hair. In November, a group of students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took more than 60 American hostages. Hostilities toward Americans escalated from there. On December 2nd, Wa received a call from Mohammed El Faraj bin Agabe. Something was happening, Agabe said. Gaddafi was furious with the Americans, and Wa needed to leave the country immediately or he'd be arrested. In Saudi Arabia, local Sunni terrorists had seized the Grand Mosque in Mecca. 
they'd taken hundreds of worshippers hostage and laid siege to Islam's holiest site. As fierce gun battles raged inside the mosque, Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini took advantage of the chaos and unleashed a black propaganda campaign against Israel and America. The real culprits behind the mosque siege, Khomeini declared, were the Zionists and the great Satanists of the United States. The siege was in fact led by a group of Islamic fundamentalists called Al-Ikhwan, the Brethren, but Iran's supreme leader was pushing a fictional story that Israeli and American commandos had parachuted into the mosque, disguised as Muslims, and committed the attack against Islam. Khomeini had encouraged revolutionaries to go out and attack U.S. embassies in the Middle East and Africa as a response. His followers obeyed, and the U.S. embassy in Tripoli was now under siege. Waugh caught a taxi and headed to the airport, leaving everything behind, including the clothes in his hotel room and the money in its safe. On a television in the airport, state TV showed footage of a violent mob outside the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli chanting, Death to America. Demonstrating solidarity with the Iranian Revolution, some 2,000 Libyans had attacked the embassy and set it on fire. Twelve Americans were trapped inside, locked in a walk-in vault. Waugh caught a flight to Frankfurt. By the time he landed, the embassy siege was over, and American officials were saying that everyone had escaped without harm. It would be 32 years before Waugh returned to Libya for the CIA in October 2011, in the days immediately before Gaddafi was killed and disfigured by a violent mob. In December 1979, U.S. dealings with Gaddafi were far from over. On the 29th, the U.S. State Department created its first official state sponsors of terrorism list with four countries, including Iran and Libya. Gaddafi responded with one of the most bizarre international assassination campaigns in modern history. He publicly announced a state-sponsored targeted killing program, which he officially called Physical Liquidation of the Stray Dogs. Gaddafi said that his targeted killing program extended to any Libyan dissident who spoke out against his government. In a fiery speech broadcast on state radio, he called for the physical liquidation of the enemies of the revolution abroad. While it sounded like bluster, it was not. Over the next several months, four anti-Qaddafi Libyan emigres were assassinated, Mohammed Mustafa Ramadan and Mahmoud Abu Salim Nafa in London, and Abdul Arif Galil and Mohammed Salim Ratimi in Rome. Come spring, the U.S. State Department ordered the expulsion of four Libyan diplomats in Washington, whom President Carter described as would-be assassins. On May 1, 1980, the Financial Times reported that police departments in the United States, Britain, France, Italy, and West Germany had been alerted by Interpol to guard against a possible wave of assassinations by Gaddafi's hit teams. Gaddafi issued a final warning to anti-government Libyan exiles living abroad. This is their last hope, he said. Either they return to Libya, where they would be safe and sound, or they will be liquidated wherever they are. When a Libyan emigre living in Fort Collins, Colorado, ignored Gaddafi's threats, Gaddafi sent one of his assassins to Colorado. The assassin was a former Green Beret named Eugene Tafoya. It was 7.30 on the night of October 14, 1980, and a Fort Collins police officer named Ray Martinez answered a call on his radio. There was a woman named Farida Zagalai on the other end. She was hysterical, 
Her husband, Faisal, had been shot in the head and was lying on the floor of their apartment in a pool of blood, she cried. Officer Martinez needed to come over to 1917 South Shields Street right away. Officer Martinez recognized the name. Six months earlier, Faisal Zagali, a Libyan graduate student, had applied for and received a permit to carry a concealed weapon, a 9 millimeter semi-automatic pistol. Zagali's reason for needing the weapon was unheard of, certainly for a city like Fort Collins. He claimed to be on a hit list of people Colonel Muammar Gaddafi of Libya intended to assassinate as part of his physical liquidation of the Stray Dogs campaign. Back then, it sounded downright fictional. Officer Martinez hurried over to the apartment and rushed inside. There on the floor, he found Faisal Zagali lying in a pool of blood, two bullets in his head. The first 22 caliber bullet entered the eye socket, severed the optic nerve, and lodged in Faisal Zagali's mouth. The second bullet sheared off part of his ear before entering his head through the cheek. The furniture in the living room was knocked over. Clearly there had been a struggle. There was blood everywhere on the carpet and the walls. There were bloody handprints on the door frame. The assassin, it seemed, had vanished. Officer Martinez interviewed two witnesses from the apartment building. One helped a sketch artist draw a composite of the suspect. The second witness described a man with a pockmarked face and a clip-on necktie who was carrying a silver and blue handgun. Detectives drove to the Denver airport and circulated the suspect sketch. A shuttle bus driver said he recognized the man and gave the FBI a few more clues. After a few days, there was a remarkable lead. The FBI received news of an English-language broadcast from a Libyan revolutionary group that was taking credit for what it called a physical liquidation. This was part of the final stage in the revolutionary conflict between Libya and the imperialist United States, the group said. A member of the World Revolutionary Committee has liquidated one Faisal Zagali. It looked like Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi was behind this assassination attempt, that his reach had extended into the United States. Despite having been shot twice in the head at close range, Zagala was still alive. He'd been blinded in his right eye, but lived to tell the tale. Farida Zagala had already told the FBI everything she knew and could remember. The couple had been out of work, she said, when they received an unsolicited phone call from a woman who identified herself as a recruiter for an insurance company looking for people who spoke Arabic. Farida Zagali said the job interested her. The insurance company arranged to send someone to the house for an interview. It turned out to be the assassin. The man was strange and had alcohol on his breath. Farida Zagali told the FBI. She went into the kitchen to make drinks, and when she came out, the assassin and her husband were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He began striking me in rapid-fire karate blows, Faisal Zagali told the FBI from his hospital bed. Faisal remembered raising his arms up to protect himself when the assassin reached for his gun. Faisal reached for his own gun, which he said he kept hidden under the couch cushions. The assassin's gun went off. I felt I was shot in my head, and I felt blood, but I kept struggling with him so I could take his gun, Zagali testified. We struggled from one end of the apartment to the other. The FBI took over, but the case went cold. Then, as circumstance would have it, months later, Two local boys on bicycles happened upon a 22 caliber blue and silver handgun lying in a ditch along a country road. The FBI traced the weapon to a retired dog warden living in a trailer park in the Florida Keys. 
The man, named Tully Strong, said he'd sold the gun to an old friend from Vietnam named Eugene Tafoya, a former Green Beret who'd been decorated with the Bronze Star for heroism. The FBI learned Tafoya lived in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. With a bomb squad at the ready, they secured the perimeter, and in a ruse to lure Tafoya from the home without a struggle, they cut the power to his house. When Tafoya came out, they arrested him. Inside, the FBI located a trove of incriminating evidence, drawings of the Zagalai's apartment complex, a stack of Libyan currency, and a tape recording of a phone conversation from someone offering to pay Tafoya to take care of someone who should quit breathing permanently. The FBI arrested Eugene Tafoya. Tafoya said the man to blame was Edwin P. Wilson, an American CIA agent living in a seaside villa in Tripoli, Libya. Tafoya said his intention was to rough up Faisal Zagali, not kill him. Tafoya told the FBI he believed he was working for the CIA. After a sensational jury trial, Eugene Tafoya was convicted of third-degree assault and conspiracy to commit third-degree assault, but was acquitted on the more serious charges of attempted first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The jurors' verdict indicated that they believed that Tafoya was in fact acting on someone else's behalf, despite the fact that no evidence about the third party was introduced during the trial. Obviously, we felt there was another party, the jury foreman, Gary Thornburg, told the New York Times. But it didn't matter for our purposes who that third party was. Eugene Tafoya was sentenced to two years in prison. Depending on whom you ask, the FBI and the CIA had been building a case against Edwin P. Wilson for years. In 1982, Wilson was arrested tried, and convicted of illegally selling weapons to Libya. This included 42,000 pounds of military-grade C-4 explosives, which rivaled the U.S. military's domestic stockpile at the time. Wilson had them manufactured in Southern California. Edwin Wilson was sentenced to 52 years in federal prison. He served 22 years much of it in solitary confinement. Then, in 2004, in a bizarre twist, a Texas judge overturned Wilson's conviction and he was set free. His lawyers had gathered enough evidence to demonstrate to a judge that he'd been informally working for the CIA at the time of his arrest. The lawyers produced 80 instances of contact between Wilson and the CIA. In a legal briefing, Judge Lynn Hughes wrote that the U.S. government had deliberately deceived the court about Edwin Wilson's continuing contacts with CIA officials, thereby double-crossing a part-time informal government agent. Decades later, it came to light that Wilson had initially gone to Libya on behalf of the CIA in 1976 to locate Carlos the Jackal. He'd gone rogue, eventually working for the CIA, but also for Gaddafi. This was after Libya had been placed on the state sponsors of terrorism list. They framed a guilty man, said journalist David Korn. The Eugene Tafoya trial gave Green Berets a bad name. Reports of other special forces operators working as assassins for Muammar Gaddafi were published in newspapers around the country. No one else was ever charged. Billy Waugh knew that his classified work for the CIA against Muammar Gaddafi and military targets in Libya was to remain hidden. It was best for him to lay low. He was given an assignment on the other side of the world, 
7,000 miles from Washington, D.C., on an atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Kwajalein. His cover was as chief of security at the U.S. Kwajalein Missile Range. In the Marshall Islands, the Defense Department was testing a highly classified missile system outfitted with a 10-nuclear warhead payload called a MIRV, Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicle. The Soviets wanted one. Waugh was tasked with training and overseeing 100 military security officers who were in charge of surveillance of the 25 islands and atolls near and around Kwajalein. The missiles were launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. They were programmed to hit a target 5,000 miles away, sometimes just a buoy on the ocean near Kwajalein. Ever on the prowl, Soviet submarines would quickly surface the moment the MIRV became visible on re-entry, then dispatch a small Zodiac boat loaded with Russian amphibious special forces called Spetsnaz Delfin. If the Russians were to capture a piece of a missile or a MIRV, it would be a counterintelligence coup d'etat. Day in and day out, Floating on the open sea in his own Zodiac, Billy Waugh scanned the horizon for a sign of Soviet infiltration. When he spotted one of their Zodiacs, he'd charge toward it, ready to grab a Soviet operator and bring him in for interrogation. I never got a Russian, but the Russians never got a Merv, says Waugh. 